The Audioboy Project. A decentralized anti-authoritarian based initiative focused on creating a library of audiobooks for truth seekers and free speech advocates. All content on this channel is free to download, share, and repost. Your support is much appreciated. Truth, audiobooks, for the people. Operation Mind Control, written by Walter H. Bowart, narrated by Eric Burns. An excerpt from David's story. David, young Air Force sergeant, he was one of the victims. Ever since I got out of the service, I haven't been able to give a day-by-day -day account of what happened to me during those four years. The scary thing is that I still have a horrible fear of talking. I have a tendency to speed up my speech when I'm being pressed on something and I get very tense when anyone asks me about my service duties. Something has happened to my mind. About the author. W. H. Bowert was awarded the McMahon Scholarship in Journalism to the University of Oklahoma. In 1965, he founded the New York Weekly, The East Village Other. That same year he founded the Underground Press Syndicate, which quickly grew to include 200 papers around the world. Since that time, he has edited the Aspen Daily News, the Port Townsend Daily News, and Palm Springs Life. He has written numerous articles and several novels under a variety of noms de plume. He is on the advisory board of the Freedom of Thought Foundation and, at present, is making a documentary based on this book. Dedication This book is dedicated to the survivors of Operation Mind Control. Also, this book is dedicated to my best pal without whose support it could not have been accomplished. About this edition. This is a limited researcher's edition of Operation Mind Control. Information in this book differs from information previously made public. This book is an inquiry into the discrepancies. Opening Quotations I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society, but the people themselves, and if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. Thomas Jefferson In the technotronic society, the trend would seem to be towards the aggregation of the individual support of millions of uncoordinated citizens, easily within the reach of magnetic and attractive personalities, effectively exploiting the latest communication techniques to manipulate emotions and control reason. Zbigniew Brzezinski, National Security Advisor I don't believe the Constitution of the United States gives you the right to commit a crime if you want to. Therefore, the Constitution does not guarantee you the right to maintain inviolable the personality forced on you in the first place, if and when the personality manifests strongly antisocial behavior. The new behavioral control techniques make even the hydrogen bomb look like a child's toy, and of course, they can be used for good or evil. Dr. James V. McConnell, Professor of Psychology, University of Michigan. Only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. Marshall McLuhan and Barrington Nevitt. Note for the second edition. A warning to survivors. This book contains information that will trigger you. Give it to your deprogrammer rather than try to read it yourself unless you have a thoroughly reintegrated personality. Some of this information is wrong and can be harmful to you. Inevitably, it is impossible to weed out the triggers since programming varies from person to person, from handler to handler. Thus, know that if you have ever been programmed, you may be triggered by information in this book. At the end of the book is an information sheet about the Freedom of Thought Foundation, which, as of this writing, is an ad hoc committee of survivors, researchers, therapists, deprogrammers, counselors, lawyers, doctors, and civil rights activists. We hope that this will, in the short term, evolve into a reliable referral service so that more survivors can be directed to qualified deprogrammers and that more therapists, doctors, and counselors can learn the efficient technologies to help victims of classical trauma-based programming. In the long term, we hope that it will also become an effective political organization to curb human experimentation and attacks on the human mind on both an individual and collective basis. In order to protect us all from cross-pollination or contamination, certain specific but trivial information is deliberately false 
and has been planted as a sort of tag. Thus, if survivors start coming up with the planted information, we will know that there is a probability that they have been corrupted by this book. The author, editors, or publisher take no responsibility for any triggering that may occur. Author's Note This book is an exercise in citizens' intelligence. The editorial we is used herein literally. This book is the result of a collaboration of many. The author and the majority of those who have contributed to it are private citizens working on their own in a synergistic effort, without major funding or corporate support, without government privilege or need to know, other than that need cited by Jefferson, the need for informed discretion in a democracy. Without the help of these many people who, like the author, were motivated by shock and outrage that citizens have been so victimized by their own government, this book would not have been undertaken. Thanks, first, to the survivors of mind control who had the courage to come forward and tell their stories. Since this book first came out, I have interviewed countless more mind control survivors. Alas, while adding much to the content of my files, few have shed new light on the processes involved. The network which produced this book will continue to look for the codes, cues, and triggers by which to unlock the multi-personalities, appropriate states from the past which are moved forward to this inappropriate present, so that they can join in the life of the whole human being within whom they have been locked. A number of professional people gave valuable technical assistance and patient explanations. My thanks to Harry Ahrens, Robert Browers, David Bruce, Dr. and Mrs. Sidney M. Cohen, Drs. Gary and Gwen Dean, Robert Dunn, Dr. Remo DeCenzo, Betty Dumain, Dr. Milton E. Erickson, Morris Ernst, Bernard Fensterwald, George Griffin, Colonel Laird Gutterson, Dr. Corey Hammond, Avril Harriman, Dr. Paul Henshaw, Edward Hunter, Honorable Louis K. Lefkowitz, Honorable Louis K. Lefkowitz, John McDonald, Dr. Colin Ross, V. R. Sanchez, Alan W. Shefflin, Dr. Edgar Schein, David Wise, Mrs. E. D. Yeomans, and Colonel Joseph H. Zeglinski. I received a great deal of assistance from a number of researchers and writers around the world. Thanks to David Bearglass, Chip Burlett, Martin Cannon, Steve Bratcher, Nancy Bressler, Jeff Cohen, Lauren Coleman, Richard Crow, David Emery, Edward J. Epstein, William Grimstad, Paul Hawk, L. Ron Hubbard, Trevor Harvey, John Judge, Larry Lee, Charles Meyerson, John Marks, Jim Martin, John McGuffin, David McQueen, Sandra Meyersdorf, Janet Michaud, Beverly Ogden, George O'Toole, Ken Thomas, Wes Thomas, Richard Popkin, Jeff Kiros, Sir William Stevenson, Scoop Sweeney, Sivia Tamarkin, Harold Weisberg, David Williams, Cheryl Welsh, Peter Watson, Charles Zepps, and the many people who sent me clippings, documents, and testimonies over the years. May Brussel kept in contact with me from the time this book was originally released until her untimely death. She illuminated my understanding on Project Paperclip, the cryptocracy's illegal importation of Nazis into the U.S. intelligence systems after World War II, and called my attention to the circumstances of the probable programming of the assassin of John Lennon and the attempted assassins of Gerald Ford and Ronald Reagan. Other valuable assistance was given by the following institutions and organizations. The Rare Books and Special Collections Division of Princeton University Library, Brain Mind Bulletin, Zodiac News Service, Freedom News Service, Pacific News Service, The Fifth Estate, Network Against Psychiatric Assault, The Assassination Information Bureau, American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, Sanity Now, Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, Center for National Security Studies, Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry, Worldwide Photos, United Press, Library of Congress, and the National Technical Information Service. Anthony Robbins and the staff of Robbins Research Institute trained me in neurolinguistics programming and stuck with me through all sorts of adventures until I earned my certification, finally assimilating what Milton Erickson had been trying to get me to understand in 1976. So-called NLP was a big eureka. I saw it as, if applied for the highest purposes, a great tool of liberation, discovery, and human achievement. Even though NLP has been a valuable tool of the cryptocrats, there are always more good guys than bad guys. My understanding of the intelligence community was molded by exchanges with a number of intelligence and military people. Most of them wish to remain nameless. Special overt thanks to Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty, 
for his patient accounts and interpretations of the Cold War history, which he witnessed from within the fledgling cryptocracy. Thanks also go to Michael Kratz and Alan Bell of Dector Counterintelligence and Security, who trained me in the use of the Psychological Stress Evaluator, and Carl F. Bood of Desert Security, who made his equipment available to me to examine the stress patterns of those I interviewed. Tom Miller gave me much of his time and expertise as Citizens Counterintelligence Agent Extraordinaire. His interest in the subject never waned, and research for his own book, The Assassination Pleas Almanac, 1977 Contemporary Books, uncovered leads for this one. Kudos to Joanna Moore Grunick, Martha Sauerwein, and my mother for their patience and support. Between the first edition and this one, 17 years have passed. My thanks go to all those who kept demanding that this book be brought back into print. It was their demand which drove the price of the original paperback to a remarkable $250 per fine copy and finally created the market demand for this researcher's edition. I owe a special thanks to a number who insist on anonymity. Thank you all for providing the additional research for this expanded edition and, as always, to Richard Condon, who gave me early encouragement and offered his valued commentary in the mid-70s at the beginning of my quest for the truth. Last and foremost, I am indebted to my Enid High School journalism teacher, Miss Ruth Scott, who started me on the path of citizens' intelligence so long ago. Walter Bowart November 11th, 1994, Paradise, Arizona. This is a limited researcher's edition of Operation Mind Control. Information in this book differs from information previously made public. This book is an inquiry into the discrepancies. Note for the second edition, a warning to survivors. This book contains information that will trigger you. Give it to your deprogrammer rather than try to read it yourself, unless you have a thoroughly reintegrated personality. Some of this information is wrong and can be harmful to you. Inevitably, it is impossible to weed out the triggers, since programming varies from person to person, from handler to handler. Thus, know that if you ever have been programmed, you may be triggered by information in this book. At the end of the book is an information sheet about the Freedom of Thought Foundation, which, as of this writing, is an ad hoc committee of survivors, researchers, therapists, deprogrammers, counselors, lawyers, doctors, and civil rights activists. We hope that this will, in the short term, evolve into a reliable referral service so that more survivors can be directed to qualified deprogrammers and that more therapists, doctors, and counselors can learn the efficient technologies to help victims of classical trauma-based programming. In the long term, we hope that it will also become an effective political organization to curb human experimentation and attacks on the human mind on both an individual and collective basis. In order to protect us all from cross-pollination or contamination, certain specific but trivial information is deliberately false and has been planted as a sort of tag. Thus, if survivors start coming up with the planted information, we will know that there is a probability that they have been corrupted by this book. The author, editors, or publisher take no responsibility for any triggering that may occur. Contents Chapter 1. The Cryptorian Candidate Chapter 2. Only One Mind for My Country. Chapter 3. The Mind Laundry Myth. Chapter 4. Without Knowledge or Consent. Chapter 5. Holy Acid Wars. Chapter 6. The Guinea Pig Army. Chapter 7. The MK Ultrans. Chapter 8. The Matahari of Mind Control. Chapter 9. The Story of O. Chapter 10. Mind War. Chapter 11. Project Monarch. Chapter 12, Thanks for the Memories. Chapter 13, Monarch Corroboration. Chapter 14, Himmler's Guinea Kids. Chapter 15, Finders, Kidnappers, Nazis. Chapter 16, May the Force Be With Us. Chapter 17, The Slaves Who Buried the Pharaoh. Chapter 18, Brave New World in a Skinner Box. Chapter 19, A School for Assassins. Chapter 20, The Four Faces of a Zombie. Chapter 21, The Lone Nuts. Chapter 22, The Ignored Confessions. Chapter 23, Another Hypnopatsy. Chapter 24, Confession by Automatic Writing. Chapter 25, The Patriotic Assassin. Chapter 26, Sleeper Agent. Chapter 27, Deep Probe. Chapter 28, From Bionic Woman to Stimulated Cat. 
Chapter 29, Invisible Warfare. Chapter 30, Tuned to a Mental Radio. Chapter 31, The Warrior's Tongue. Chapter 32, Cult Control. Chapter 33, The Fire in Waco. Chapter 34, Have Buck Rogers Ray Gun? Will Travel. Chapter 35, Human EM Targets. Chapter 36, A Satanic UFO Reich? Chapter 37, The COM-12 Briefing. Chapter 38, Project Green Star? Chapter 39, False Memory Spindrome. Chapter 40, Dangerous Free Thinking. Chapter 41, A Repealing Thought. Chapter 1, The Cryptorian Candidate. It may have been the biggest story since the atom bomb. The headline, however, was small and ignored the larger issue. Drug tests by CIA held more extensive than reported in 75, said the New York Times on July 16, 1977. What it should have said is, U.S. develops invisible weapons to enslave mankind. The testing of drugs by the CIA was just a part of the United States government's top-secret mind control project a project which had spanned 35 years and had involved tens of thousands of individuals. It involved techniques of hypnosis, narco-hypnosis, electronic brain stimulation, behavioral effects of ultrasonic, microwave, and low-frequency sound, aversive and other behavior modification therapies. In fact, there was virtually no aspect of human behavioral control that was not explored in their search for the means to control the memory and will of both individuals and whole masses of people. The CIA and the Pentagon succeeded in developing a whole range of psycho-weapons to expand its already ominous psychological warfare arsenal. With these capabilities, it was now possible to wage a new kind of war, a war which would take place invisibly, upon the battlefield of the human mind. Literature always anticipates life, Oscar Wilde said. It does not copy it, but molds it to its purpose. By Wilde's definition, then Richard Condon's The Manchurian Candidate would appear to be literature. Condon published his tour de force in 1958. It was the story of an American army sergeant who was captured by the enemy during the Korean conflict and, in an improbable nine days, was hypno-programmed to murder on cue. The sergeant returned to the United States and was post-hypnotically... The sergeant returned to the United States and was post-hypnotically triggered to kill by the sight of the Queen of Diamonds in a deck of cards. The sergeant automatically killed several people, among them a candidate for President of the United States. After he killed, his memory of the event was forever sealed by amnesia. At the time the Manchurian candidate was published, few people in the world, Richard Condon included, knew that total control of the mind was possible. Condon was writing fiction. He had merely read up on popular Pavlovian conditioning manuals and imagined the rest. He had no way of knowing then that mind control had already been the subject of years of secret research within the clandestine agencies of the U.S. government. The tricks of mind control he described were employed, right down to the Queen of Diamonds' queue, by the programmers of real political assassins who developed foolproof techniques for the who developed foolproof techniques for the control of thought, memory, emotions, and behavior. The Manchurian candidate brought the idea of brainwashing to public consciousness. Brainwashing is the use of isolation, deprivation, torture, and indoctrination to break the human will. And indoctrination to break the human will. But what the book actually described was something more than brainwashing. It was mind control, a total takeover of an individual's mind by someone else. The someone in Condon's version was a mad Chinese psychoscientist. Always the satirist, Condon brought the Fu Manchu myth up to date. But ironically, the techniques he described were first perfected and used not by the Chinese or the communists, but by the United States. Condon's portrait of POWs during the Korean conflict went against the accepted scientific and medical opinion of the time which held that a man could not be made to commit a criminal act against his own will or inner moral code by any known means. Although Condon's book was not completely on target about the details of GI mind control, he did accurately describe some of the motives, coercive methodology, and psychological results of real-life mind control. 
The psychological techniques described in The Manchurian Candidate had secretly become a reality a decade before Condon saw his story set in type. A decade later, it appeared as if Condon's fiction had been used as the blueprint for the creation of an army of hypno-programmed zombies. Some were assassins prepared to kill on cue. Others were informers made to remember minute details under hypnosis. Couriers carried illegal messages outside the chain of command, their secrets secured behind post-hypnotic blocks. Knowledge of secret information was removed from the minds of those who no longer had the need to know. They were given post-hypnotic amnesia. The fact is, induced amnesia had been used since at least World War II. In the Journal of Traumatic Stress, we find the story of a World War II veteran who had been discharged from the service in 1947. According to Karen L. Cassidy and Judith A. Lyons, the veteran had been treated at a VA hospital for post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, since the war, and had enjoyed good health and a lasting relationship until he had his first cardiovascular accident, or CVA, known in layman's terms as a stroke. Then he began to recall all the memories of his intelligence service in the Pacific Theater during the Second World War. In 1988, he suffered two CVAs that resulted in right-side weakness, speech difficulties, loss of motor control, and disorientation to situation, time, and place. These symptoms gradually resolved, and he was able to resume psychotherapy in 1989. During therapy, he began to recall combat memories and details of his service as an intelligence officer, for which he had previously been amnestic. According to the journal, he particularly recalled being captured and tortured by administration of intravenous hallucinogens. He also recalled being bayoneted in the right side during hand-to-hand -hand combat, thus explaining, the car thus explaining the scar previously noted. Newly recalled memories depicted the content of many of his nightmares and dissociative episodes. He recalled his escape and military debriefing in which he underwent hypnotic procedures to help him forget his combat experiences. Although his recall of these procedures is sketchy, he remembers that these hypnotic sessions occurred almost daily for several weeks, during which time he was also given medications. These procedures focused upon helping him develop an identity and personal history that excluded intelligence service and traumatic events. Additionally, while hospitalized, he had a flashback in which he mistook an intravenous apparatus for being bayoneted. An Asian physician observed him speaking in an Asian dialect during this flashback. Collectively, these data led us to conclude that military events occurred as reported and cannot be dismissed as delusions or fabrications. The authors noted that in this man's case, it appears that amnesia for traumatic memories was disinhibited. His case indicates that cognitive impairment, such as that due to declining health and aging, may also impair previously successful defenses and lead to delayed post-traumatic stress disorder. Those who led us to believe that the intelligence agencies were searching for a Manchurian candidate have to go back and rewrite their false assumptions. The fact came well before the fiction. Most of the ordinary foot soldiers who fought in the dirty, televised Vietnam conflict were released to civilian life without debriefing. For them, there was no decompression from the rage of war. They were released with all the reflexes of trained assassins intact. Those who had been conditioned in the black science of the war of torture, terror, and technology were debriefed with special attention. Their memories, like those of the World War II veteran mentioned in the Journal of Traumatic Stress, were completely erased before they were turned out of the military, that they returned to civilian life with only the minimum fragmented knowledge of who they were or what they had done. Their memories had been smudged or removed by drugs, hypnosis, behavior modification, conditioned reflex therapy, or some other evil wonder of mind control. During my 1978 tour promoting this book, a call came to the KPIX-TV Good Morning San Francisco show while we were on the air. It was a retired Navy commander who spoke of losing his memory after being admitted to a Navy hospital after a lengthy tour of duty in which he and his black pajama team had assassinated a charismatic local political leaders behind a fixed border in Southeast Asia. In a private phone conversation later, the commander told me that the fixed border was indeed that of China. I got the flu. Almost everybody on the returning team got this heavy flu. 
We went to the hospital and came out with cardboard memories, he said. It's taken me 13 years to remember what we had been doing. I'm not proud of it, and I'm afraid to talk. I had encountered my first case of mind control in the midst of the Watergate scandal. A young man I'd known since childhood had returned from a tour of duty in the U.S. Air Force, with amnesia, remembering nothing of his service except having a good time. He subsequently learned, through intensive private psychotherapy, that he'd been hypnotized and conditioned. His mind had been unmade, then remade. His mind had been controlled. I was completely fascinated by his story, but naturally, in 1973, I thought it was an isolated, single event. Then, quite by accident, a few months later, I overheard another man in my hometown telling what was essentially the same story, how he figured he'd been hypnotized and had his memory erased at a debriefing prior to his separation from military service. After hearing the second story, I began to wonder how many more men had their memories erased. I decided to run the following classified ad. Researcher writer interested in contacting anyone with knowledge of the use of hypnosis by the military, including ex-servicemen who have reason to believe they were hypnotized or drugged while in the service and subsequently exhibited signs of amnesia or hypernesia, improved memory. All info held in the strictest confidence. I placed the ad in Soldier of Fortune, a magazine which reports on the activities of mercenaries. A number of small publications aimed at hypnotists, behaviorists, neurologists, and other professionals, and popular magazines such as Rolling Stone. To my amazement, I received more than a hundred replies to the ad. Many stated that they had amnesia. Ignoring the obvious crank letters, I followed up on the others and discovered that too many were unable to say just what had caused their loss of memory. In some cases, it was obviously a result of the trauma of war what came to be called the post-Vietnam syndrome. So I concentrated on those who had not seen combat, but who either had high security clearances or were employed at the periphery of the intelligence services. Letter and telephone exchanges narrowed the field down to 18 persons who fit the pattern of the first two men who had reported their amnesia to me. All 18 had security clearances and could only recall isolated events from their GI experience. I narrowed the field still further to those who remembered enough to have at least some idea, however fragmentary and incomplete, of what had happened to them. Their stories were believable, but they shed little light on how amnesia had been induced and what behavior had been controlled. To answer those deeper questions, I went to the libraries, and after two years of research, I was able to find enough scientific reports and government documents to tell the whole story of what I call Operation Mind Control. Though the documented trail of mind control extends back many decades, it was not always called by that name. The church and the state have always engaged in psychotheology and psychopolitics, the psychological manipulation of belief, opinion, and actions for political and or religious ends. But the complete control of the human mind was only managed in the late 1940s by the U.S. government. It had to have existed in a variety of subcultures throughout human history. My research concentrated on the period from 1938 to the late 60s, the period during which I found there was an effort made by the agencies of the U.S. government to develop sophisticated techniques of psychopolitics and mind control in the modern sense, I thought. The objective of Operation Mind Control during this period has been to take human beings, both citizens of the United States and citizens of friendly and unfriendly nations, and transform them into unthinking, subconsciously programmed zombies, motivated without their knowledge and against their wills to perform in a variety of ways in which they would not otherwise willingly perform. I learned that this is accomplished through the use of a number of various techniques, most of which amount to pain and trauma-based classical conditioning. Mind control is the most terrible imaginable crime because it is committed not against the body, but against the mind and the soul. Dr. Juist A. M. Mirlu expresses the attitude of the majority of psychologists in calling it mind rape and warns that it poses a great danger of total physical destruction. Development of mind control was accomplished largely through the efforts of individual psychologists, psychiatrists, and chemists working in isolated conditions under government contract. Each researcher or research team was allowed to know only what he or she needed to know to accomplish his or her fragment of the research or testing. 
The contracts were let through a number of government and private agencies and foundations, so that the researchers were, by and large, ignorant as to the intended use of their research. While the CIA was a major funder of the mind control research, virtually every major government agency became in some way knowingly or unwittingly involved. While I began my research believing that a cult of intelligence was behind the mind control program, I found that there is, in fact, no single originating force, but several. The operation is too widespread and complex for it to be created by a cult. If a cult there must be, then it is a cult within a cult, in an interlocking chain of invisible mini-governments with unwritten rules, unwritten plans, and unwritten loyalties. It is the plan of a secret bureaucracy, what I call a cryptocracy, which conspires against our laws and our freedoms. Cryptocracy is a compound of crypto, meaning secret, and crassy, meaning rule, government, government body. The cryptocracy, then, is the secret government whose identity and whereabouts have slowly and reluctantly been hinted at by the Congress through its investigations into Watergate, the CIA, and the rest of the intelligence community. The word cryptocracy is conspicuously absent from all dictionaries, even to this day. I was told by one source within the cryptocracy that this word alone was reason enough to keep this book off the market. For if, whenever the word democracy is used, the word cryptocracy is placed against it, a powerful propaganda effect takes place. As if one word alone could awaken the U.S. citizenry to the fact that their democracy was overthrown by the National Security Act of 1947. While the CIA, near the top of the intelligence pyramid, has been drawing most of the fire, the evidence of a cryptocracy clearly implicates the National Security Agency, the National Programs Office, the Defense Intelligence Agency and its subsidiaries in military intelligence, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, as well as the Civil Service. The Crypto Alliance has extended in an ever-expanding network among private contractors and institutions and religious organizations. With the Central Intelligence in the vanguard, the cryptocracy is composed of persons operating within the Office of Naval Intelligence, Army Intelligence, Air Force Intelligence, Department of Justice, Department of Health, Education and Welfare, Bureau of Prisons, Bureau of Narcotics, Atomic Energy Commission, Department of Energy, Veterans Administration, General Services Administration, National Science Foundation, and even major American corporations, especially certain airlines, oil companies, and aerospace contractors. The cryptocracy invades the privacy of citizens and corporations. It meddles, often violently, in the internal politics of foreign nations, and has hired, trained, and equipped mind-controlled assassins for the murder of heads of state. The cryptocracy may have been involved in attempts to control U.S. elections. It controls key figures in the U.S. and world press. When CIA Director Robert M. Gates publicly promised a greater openness and sense of public responsibility at the intelligence agency in April of 1992, he was acting on the recommendations of a special task force that had studied ways to make the agency more visible, credible, and responsive to the outside world. But when Task Force Report on Greater CIA Openness was submitted to Gates, it was stamped secret. CIA officials refused to disclose any of the report. After receiving a public scolding at a House hearing, Gates approved the declassification of almost the entire report. Significantly, the report touted the accomplishments of the agency's existing media program. PAO, the Public Affairs Office of the CIA, now has relationships with reporters from every major wire service, newspaper, newsweekly, and television network in the nation. This has helped us turn some intelligence failure stories into intelligence success stories, and it has contributed to the accuracy of countless others. In many instances, we have persuaded reporters to postpone, change, hold, or even scrap stories that could have adversely affected national security interests or jeopardized sources and methods. The story within the story, I discovered, is an astonishing one of a psychological war waged by this U.S. cryptocracy against the American people. The scientific reports and histories place the story in time and at the government's door. 
However, the literature of the cryptocracy ignores the very real human factor. There is no written record of the mental anguish, the torture to the soul that comes from the loss of memory, and the resulting identity crisis. That mental anguish is the story of mind control. The stories that follow are told by the failures of Operation Mind Control. Failures because the victims remember something. For where mind control is successful, there is no memory left. Due to editorial considerations, many of the stories I uncovered have been left on the editing room floor. Each individual in this book stands for and tells the story of many victims of mind control. In many cases, the individuals I interviewed believed their lives or sanity would be in danger if their names were made public. Others wanted their names mentioned. I have, for a variety of reasons, chosen to withhold real names and places whether requested or not. Except in these details, the first-person stories in this book are completely true, and in this edition, I have risked committing the literary crime of redundancy so that the researcher can get a more well-rounded sense of the varieties of the mind control experience as described by several individuals. A video documentary is now in progress which shows many heartbreaking moments of abreaction from victims of mind control which could not be included in this book. One of the characters in The Manchurian Candidate described his recurring dream that resulted from the suppression of memory. It's not so much that I can't sleep. It's more that I'd rather not sleep. I'm walking around punchy because I'm scared. I keep having the same nightmare. The nightmare Condon's hero described was actually the memory of having killed on cue. On stage, before an audience of communist mind controllers, he strangled one of his fellow soldiers with a scarf and blew out another's brains with a high-powered pistol at point-blank range. Several of the men I interviewed had dreams which could have been written by Condon. Tex was an army sergeant stationed in the Mediterranean area. He came back from service with amnesia. But in his dreams, a vivid scene was replayed again and again. In the dream, my buddy, I know him real well, we've shared things together, my buddy is taken with his hands behind his back. I'm standing in rank in a line of other soldiers, and we are like a firing squad. I keep thinking, I won't shoot my friend, I'll turn the rifle on the commander. But we don't have rifles. My buddy is marched into an open area in front of us, with his hands tied behind his back. He is blindfolded and some Arab is talking to him or reading to him. Another Arab comes up and hits him behind the knees with a rifle butt and he falls to a kneeling position. Then, while he's on his knees, one of the Arabs takes a big sword and cuts his head off. His neck squirts blood, but surprisingly little. His head rolls on the ground. His face has a peaceful expression. His body twitches and squirms like a chicken. That's when I always wake up. In their sleep, the memories of atrocities surface to vivid awareness among the victims of mind control. Night after night, the terrible images, suppressed by deeply conditioned responses, emerge as terrifying nightmares. Are they mythological, the stuff of dreams, or are they recovered memories? Tex's dream is a mere fragment of many thousands of pages of such testimony. Chapter 2. Only One Mind for My Country Through the gray waters of amnesia he drifted, coming back from blind coma. First the echoes, like electronically amplified voices speaking from a deep, deep well. Then, far off, the dim pink molecules of light. David's body lay still in the military hospital bed. Only his eyes rolled beneath the lids. For several hours he lay that way, perfectly still, just eyes fluttering. The fluttering became more intense. Then his eyes opened. When I woke up, David said, I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't remember how I'd gotten there or why I was in the hospital. He asked nurses and aides why he was there. They told him he'd have to ask his doctor. When David finally saw him, the doctor said, you tried to commit suicide. That came as a great surprise to David. He didn't think he was the suicidal type. He asked the doctor how he'd tried to commit suicide. You took an overdose of sleep ease, the doctor told him. David knew that sleep ease was a patent medicine, that it was related chemically to an antihistamine, and that it could produce drowsiness. 
but David also knew it was not nearly as dangerous as a prescription sleeping pill. Although he began to sense that something was fishy, he did not challenge the doctor, nor did he let on that he suspected the story to be untrue. For the next several days, he simply lay in the hospital bed, puzzling over the odd chain of events that had landed him there. I interviewed David several times over a period of two years. Each interview produced additional information as David's memory returned in fragmented, isolated bursts. The following is taken from thousands of pages of transcript and has been edited so that the tedious process which uncovered David's memories is absent. It is slightly misleading only in that David did not remember his story in one continuous sequence, nor did the other victims quoted in this book. David had joined the U.S. Air Force in 1969. During his high school years, the draft had still been in effect, and after graduating on the honor roll, David decided to attend a small community college to get as much education as he could before his name was inevitably called by selective service. As his induction date approached, David realized he could obtain a deferral from the draft because of his high scholastic standing, but he decided instead to take a break from education and fulfill his military obligation as profitably as he could. Although he questioned America's reasons for fighting, he did feel that military service was his duty. David had not been a part of the 60s revolution. He had never smoked marijuana nor taken LSD, nor had he demonstrated against the war in Vietnam like so many of his friends. He was a studious, intelligent young man who was not inclined to rebellion. He was described by friends and family as one possessed of unusual common sense. In keeping with his cautious and practical nature, he negotiated a contract for medical corps service with his local Air Force recruiter and enlisted for a four-year tour of duty, thinking this would help him fulfill his ambition to become a doctor. After an uneventful in-processing, David was sent to Lackland Air Force Base for the usual six weeks basic training, and then on to a technical school for another six weeks of special training. But when the time came for his job assignment, to his great disappointment, he was assigned to the Supply Corps rather than the Medical Corps. He felt betrayed by the Air Force, and immediately after receiving his AFSC job assignment number, he retired to his barracks to rehearse a protest to his commanding officer. Moments later, a non-uniformed man entered the empty barracks and asked him to step outside and take a walk. David was puzzled, but went along without comment. When the two had reached a quiet spot on the base, the man told David that he guessed he was disappointed about receiving the AFSC of a box pusher in a supply warehouse. David was surprised by the man's knowledge of his situation. Before he could reply, the man told David that the AFSC was just a cover, that he had actually been chosen to work in a sensitive area of intelligence. The assignment sounded glamorous to David and lifted his sagging spirits. He immediately decided to go along with the change of plans and accept the special assignment without protest. The unidentified man told David to be patient and to learn well the special techniques of computer programming he would be trained in while waiting for his security investigation to be completed. Within a few weeks, David was issued a top-secret crypto security clearance and assigned to the air base at Minot, North Dakota. At Minot, he continued to feed supply numbers into a computer, developing his already excellent memory. He did his job well, and soon he received a letter of commendation and was promoted to sergeant. But for all his accomplishments, he had begun to grow restless. Although he knew his computer programming was just a cover for intelligence work, he was still not satisfied with Air Force life. I was beginning to not like the extreme regimentation and, I suppose, inside myself, I was beginning to build up a resentment about being there. But after I woke up in the hospital, I was not resentful. I was passive. I lay there thinking, trying to recall the last memories I had before I woke up in that bed. I didn't remember anything. It was like I'd been asleep for my entire life up to that point. Like I was Rip Van Winkle. The memories of what had happened I did recover over a period of time but they were fuzzy at first. It seemed like somebody was violating me, raping my mind. I was strapped down in the bed. I was yelling and screaming about something. I'm not the type of person that cusses that much. I hardly ever use foul language, but I know that I said some pretty foul things to those men who were with me. They were officers, and in the service you can't call a superior officer an obscene name without getting punished. Yet I don't think I was ever reprimanded. One guy would ask me questions in an accusatory manner, 
Another guy would come over and say comforting things. The first guy would come back and accuse me again. Then the second guy would come and pat my arm and be friendly. I could remember their faces and the tone of their voice, but I couldn't remember the content of what they were talking about. David thought about his situation. Suppose he had tried to commit suicide. He probably would be kicked out of the service. At best, he might be given a medical discharge, so he began to prepare himself for that eventuality. He thought he wouldn't mind getting out of the service under any circumstances, even with a psychological discharge. It didn't happen. Instead, David was visited by men in civilian clothes who told him that he'd been chosen for a special intelligence assignment. They said the details of his assignment could not be revealed until the proper time, and then he would not be allowed to talk to anyone about it. They said he would be receiving his orders soon. I had expected at least to have some stripes taken away for the suicide attempt, David said. Instead, five different sets of orders came down. They were all typed military orders, regular orders, but they had me going to five different places at once. It was impossible. I took the orders to headquarters and told them that somebody had goofed. It was plain to see that somebody had screwed up. The way the military runs, it was not unusual. No one got excited about it. The guys in the office said that they would straighten it out. Then I was told that I had two weeks' leave coming. They ordered me home to wait while they got my orders straightened out. Happy to get a break after 18 continuous months of military life without leave, David went home. I was hoping they'd forget all about me. I was praying that this time the computer would completely lose me. The first evening at home, something compelled David to break security. Alone with his mother, he told her that he knew he had not really attempted suicide. I suppose that my first duty was to my family, and my second duty was to my country. After I discharged my moral duty to my mother, I was free to obey my government's wish and not remember anything about it. That's probably how it worked, in spite of their programming. After David had been at home for the full two weeks, and was just beginning to think that maybe the computer had lost him after all, a telegram came. There were no written orders, no official seals, just a Western Union telegram ordering him to report to a base in Northern California and from there to embark to the Far East on overseas duty. There were numbers on the face of the telegram, but at the time David gave them no special notice. These numbers may have been an assignment authorization, for seldom are servicemen sent overseas on the strength of a telegram alone. When I got to the base in California, I showed them the telegram, and the air police hustled me to another airplane and flew me to Guam. On the plane to Guam, David ran into an airman he'd known at Minot. The airman's name was Max. Like David, Max had been attached to the supply wing at Minot, but he had been in a different type of supply operation. In all the time they were together on Guam, David never learned the details of Max's assignment. Both of them were supposed to be supply men, but David thought Max had some pretty unusual qualifications for a supply man. For instance, he held a fifth-degree black belt in karate. Max and I had checked into the barracks when we got there, but after preliminaries, we were put on a bus and taken to an isolated place eight miles outside the base. There were six L-shaped barracks set up inside a high electrified fence with barbed wire at the top. Inside the compound, there was a movie theater, a store, a barber shop, a chow hall, and a recreation center. There were several hundred guys living in that compound. We could leave any time we wanted. All we had to do was show the proper credentials to the air police at the gate. The compound seemed to be regular air force. The place was called Marbo, and as far as I could tell, there were guys there who had all sorts of different functions in the air force, but nobody really discussed their jobs. Several of the guys at Marbo had been in the supply wing in North Dakota, but at Marbo they were working in other areas. In other words, guys who'd been in the supply wing in North Dakota were in the civil engineers or the air police. One air policeman on Guam, I remember, had been shoving around boxes just like other supply men when he was at Minot. Suddenly, now he was an air policeman. I couldn't figure it out, and I wasn't about to ask questions. I guess we all assumed that we were all on special assignment, and I'm pretty sure that if I'd asked anyone about it, they would have avoided an answer. I certainly would have if somebody had asked me. David made rank fast in the Air Force. He was a good airman, a good supply man. Yet anybody he talked to about supply duties didn't know what he was talking about. His duties weren't like the others. My Air Force file shows that the first three digits of my AFSC are 647, 
A 647 is some kind of a box pusher. Yet I never pushed a box all the time I was in the Air Force. After their tour of duty, Max and David returned home together on the same plane. At the airport, Max was called over the intercom and went off to answer the page. Two air police returned for his luggage and David did not see Max until after he was separated from the service for some months. Then it was a strange meeting. David was walking down the streets of Disneyland and his eye fell on Max walking toward him in the crowd. David was delighted to see his old buddy again, but Max was strangely distant. He didn't seem very interested in our reunion, David said. He shook hands with me, and I began to talk, but he seemed kind of passive. I wanted to sit down and tell all the things that had happened to me since we last saw each other, but Max didn't want to talk. He cut me short, said goodbye, and left. That's something that's always puzzled me. How can a guy who was your constant companion for so many months... A guy who has fought for you and gotten to know you inside and out, not want to talk to you. How could he have just brushed me off like that? When I first got out of the service, all I could remember about my four years was that I'd had a lot of fun. I mean, all the pictures I have and all the recollections I had were of Max and Pat and I having fun. Skin diving, laying on the beach, collecting shells, walking in the jungle. It never dawned on me until later that I must have done something while I was in the service. Pat was a young woman from the Midwest who was assigned to serve as David's secretary. Almost instantly, when they met on Guam, they fell in love. Pat was something special. She was everything I would have ever dreamed of in a woman. I suppose she felt that I was everything that she wanted in a man. It didn't take long for us to go to bed after we met, and from then on, throughout my tour of duty, Max, Pat, and I were inseparable. David was not talking about a menage a trois. Max was not attracted to Pat nor she to him. They all held each other to be good friends, but David and Pat's feelings for each other were the strongest. David now thinks it odd that the three of them got along so perfectly from the first moment they met. Max was David's kind of man, and Pat was David's kind of woman. In the years that have passed since he got out of the Air Force, David has come to believe that Max and Pat and he were matched up by a computer. We hit it off from the start. We had the same interests. We were nervous about the same things. And we would laugh at the same kind of jokes. We were three individuals who were very close. And where one lacked a quality, another had something that filled that lack. The Air Force takes your psychological tests, your CUMES, the cumulative progress reports which have been kept on just about every individual in the United States from the first grade through high school. These records have your IQ, your aptitude tests, and all the things they accumulate on you through your school years. They give them a complete examination to determine your psychological profile and everything about your likes and dislikes. They feed selected information, any information they are looking to match up, into a computer and run yours with other people's until they have a psychological match. In spy books I've read, undercover agents sent to foreign countries are usually teamed with a spy of the opposite sex. Even if two people are both married and have left families at home, the directors of intelligence usually send along someone who can take care of the natural human sexual needs of the other without risking a breach of security. That way, no horny agent is going to have to associate with a prostitute or someone who might turn out to be a double agent or counter-spy. I'd talk with the other guys in the service, and they'd talk about getting laid in Hong Kong or Japan or Korea. I didn't have to talk about anything. I didn't have to brag, I'd just smile at them, secure in my love for Pat. David said that there were several other women in the barracks who, like Pat, were secretaries but had security clearance. And, as was the case with Pat, many of them also had close relationships with the men to whom they had been assigned. Two months before their tour of duty was to expire, David and Max were sent home. Pat stayed behind on Guam, but David and Pat arranged to meet once they were both out of the service. They exchanged home addresses, but somehow David lost hers, and he is strangely unable to remember her last name or even the town from which she'd come. David never saw Pat again. Looking back on it, it looks like it was awfully convenient. Pat was a liberated woman. She knew exactly who she was. That's just the kind of woman I like to have around. She fulfilled every need that I ever had to such a degree that it's a problem now. I can't meet a girl that's as good as she was. When you've been in paradise, it's hard to find paradise again. You always want to go back. 
I think of her all the time, but I just can't remember her last name. It's a total blank. I just can't remember. During the entire 13-hour flight home, David had to debrief himself into a tape recorder while sitting between two air policemen. He doesn't remember what he talked about. No one was questioning him. He just talked. Upon his return, he was assigned to a base in California. Immediately upon reporting for duty, he found that he no longer had a security clearance. His job was to answer telephones on the base and to listen to complaints. He'd take calls from the wives of Air Force personnel and relay their complaints to the proper channels. That's all he did during his entire last year of service. When it came time to get processed out, I wanted to get the medals I earned when I was stationed in Guam. They were actually theater ribbons. I had so many ribbons when I left Guam that the officer I reported to told me not to wear them because I would attract attention to myself. During the out-processing, they brought out my file. They do that regularly every year anyway. They show you your records, and then you have to go over them and make sure that they're correct. Then you sign a paper that states the records have been approved by you. The last time I was shown my records, they'd been changed. Instead of all the typed, dog-eared reports that were in my file before, there was this clean computer printout. I asked the officer in charge what had happened to the notices of my being awarded those theater ribbons. He told me that since I had such a high security clearance, some of the things that were in my files made it necessary to expunge a lot of the information from the record. He said that there was a top-secret file on me which was available to people who had the right clearances. The file he had me approve was the one which would be shown to anyone who did not have the highest clearances. He said that because this was more or less a public record, it could not have anything on it of a sensitive nature. It looked like I had been a supply man, a box pusher, and I'd done nothing else except try to attempt suicide. The phony hospital story was in the report, so deniability was built in. Then I went through the normal out-processing and went home. All I can say is that everybody, my folks, my friends, everyone who'd known me before, noticed how changed I was. I was fearful and under tight control. David decided that he would first reorient himself to the civilian pace of life and then look for a job. But when he began to look for employment, he suddenly realized that he had some deep psychological problems. At his first job interview, he was routinely asked to fill out the company's job application form. He sat down at a desk and started writing. He wrote his name and noticed that his hands were sweating. As he began to enter his address, his heart began pounding so loudly it was audible. He became short of breath and felt like the walls were closing in. He fought to remain calm, but within a few moments, he snatched up the form and bolted out the door. That evening, he discussed the strange physical effects that had come over him with his parents. They assured him he was probably just very anxious about getting the job. The next day, he went on another interview. Again, he was asked to fill out a job application. This time, he got further in filling out the form. He put down his name, address, date of birth, social security number, health information. But when he came to the place in the form which required work information about the past four years, the pounding in his ears, the shortness of breath, and the terrifying feeling of being confined in a small space came over him again, and he left the building with the form wadded up in his hand. Over the next few months, David applied for many jobs. The results were always the same. He could not overcome the terror that gripped him whenever anyone asked him for information about how he had spent the last four years. David's parents suggested that he try to get a job working with computers and take advantage of the training that the Air Force had given him. The mere mention of computers made him fly into a rage. I still couldn't face it, whatever it was that was blocking me. To this day, I can't stand the thought of a computer. I'd like to smash them all up. I realize, of course... That is irrational. David remained hopeful that whatever was causing his anxiety would pass with time. Meanwhile, he decided to go back to college. He had no trouble getting into a major university since his high school and community college grades were high, and no one asked him for details of his service years. But during his first semester, he encountered the same blocks that had kept him from getting a job. In my psychology course, you had to get up in front of a circle of people and talk. You had to bare your soul. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't stand up and be calm and let people question me. They were all harmless questions, but I'd get the pounding heart, the sweaty palms, the shortness of breath, and the feeling of claustrophobia again. I'd just clam up and leave the room. 
It was then that David understood that he could no longer face the problem by himself. He sought out a psychiatrist who'd been recommended by a friend. The first psychiatrist I went to was male. He had used hypnotherapy with me, and he found me to be a very easy subject. I'd go into a trance at the drop of a hat. But whenever he tried to regress me, saying, I want you to go back, I'd just bring myself out of the trance, even if it was a deep trance. My heart would be pounding, my palms would be sweating, and I'd feel the same claustrophobia I'd felt whenever I'd confronted those application forms. David found that he was much more relaxed with his second psychiatrist, a woman named Alice. Alice was also more successful with hypnotherapy. David would go into a trance quickly and deeply, yet whenever Alice tried to regress him to his Air Force period, he would bring himself out of the trance as he had done previously. But she found that by regressing David to his childhood and approaching the Air Force period from earlier years, remembering was less difficult for him. At first she tried to have me relax. She talked in a very soothing voice, telling me to close my eyes. I felt like I was surrendering to her. It was easy to get me into a light trance. I laid down my defenses and was going deeper and deeper. But as soon as she said, now we're going to go back, I sat straight up and was wide awake. Alice couldn't get over how fast I went under. One time she said she was just talking to me, and her voice put me completely under when she wasn't even trying. I was highly suggestible. But whenever she'd say, let's go back, all the muscles in my neck would strain, and I would grip the arms of the chair until my knuckles turned white. Once I was holding a piece of paper in my hand, and when I came out of hypnosis, the paper was completely soaked with sweat. Only a minute after she'd said, we're going to go back, I was wide awake. Alice never did succeed completely with hypnosis, but something must have been released because of her attempts. As soon as we were able to go back to the usual talking technique of psychotherapy, I started talking about my childhood. I'd never thought that much about it, I guess, but I couldn't remember much of my childhood. For instance, my grandfather had died when I was 14 and he had lived with us. Everyone says he and I were very close, but I had no mental picture of him at all. That's when Alice started trying to get me to remember my childhood. I don't know if I remembered my childhood before I went into the service or not. It seems like I did, because it wasn't a problem. But to this day, still, I can't remember much, and everything before the age of ten is completely blank. Alice and I kept working. At first, the memories we recovered were all painful memories. Alice thought that this was most unusual. Usually people remember the pleasurable things first. Then she tried to get me to remember only painful experiences, and once I'd remembered a lot, she started trying to get me to remember the pleasurable ones. David and Alice continued to work with standard psychiatric techniques and with hypnosis. Finally, after 16 months of three sessions a week, Alice asked David to make a choice. We probably can penetrate the blocks around your Air Force years and find out how they were planted and why, but it may take a long time. On the other hand, we can work on every other area and get you to function normally without anxiety reactions whenever anyone asks you about those years, Alice said. Now you have to decide if you just want to function normally or if you want to unravel the whole mystery and find out who did it, why it was done, and what they have hidden from your own mind. Since the therapy had nearly depleted his family's savings, David knew what the answer must be. He told Alice he would be content to just function normally. After two more months of treatment, Alice and David had their last session. After 206 therapy sessions, Alice and I had one eight-hour session which more or less recapped all the information we had collected. She told me that when I first came in, I'd talked in a monotone. I was very, very controlled. I showed no emotions and had no inflection in my speech. I'd talked to her for the first three months that way. She said there was a wall that she couldn't break down. Alice recommended that I continue working on my own by going to group therapy. I went to a couple of sessions, but when I got in front of a group, I became fearful again. It was more than just stage fright. It was a horrible feeling. I still have it when I get up in front of a group to be asked questions. Alice did not figure out what this was about. I am now beginning to, but figuring something out is one thing, and actually overcoming it is another. Alice's expert guidance and her deft use of hypnotherapy were helpful. While he did not recover his memory at once, in time David began to remember isolated events. 
he is now able to reconstruct a picture of at least some of the things he did while in hypno-service to his country. One day I had a vivid dream. Then it was like, little by little, memory cells exploding in my brain. I began to remember certain incidents. At first, I didn't know if these were real memories or just dreams. Today, I still don't know if they are accurate or not, but they are so real in all their details that I believe they are the truth. Naturally, when you've had amnesia, you're not really going to trust your memories at first. But if the memories settle in, if you can recall more and more detail about an event, you know that you are recalling a true event. The most vivid memory I have is about Vietnam. I was standing at a long table on a beach. There were North Vietnamese soldiers sitting on one side and American officers sitting on the other. Everyone was in uniform. Our men were from the Air Force, Navy, and Marines. The Marines had sidearms and no one else had a weapon. What horrified me was that out in the harbor, offshore at some distance from the beach, was one of our battleships and another battleship or gunboat. I guessed that it was Vietnamese or Russian, but I'm not expert at naval craft identification. All I know is I was terrified because the big guns on the ships were trained not on each other, but on us. I guess they were prepared to blow us all up should anything go wrong on the beach, or should there be a double cross. We had our interpreters, who were Air Force men. They did the translating and our officers waited for the translations. The discussion was very heated, but for some reason I remember vividly, nothing was being written down. That may have been the reason that I was standing there at one end of the table. I remember that they had been trying somewhere along the line to get me to have total recall. I can't remember the details or the progression of events. I know that I had memory training. At Marbo, for some reason, I'd get up three hours earlier than anyone else and report to somewhere I can't remember and then go to work at 8.30. I remember riding the bus from Marbo to the base on Guam, and I was the only one on the bus. But I can't remember where I went before I reported for regular duty. I suspect that the computer work was part of the memory training, but I can't say that's exactly what it was. There must have been more to it. I just don't remember the details, but I have the impression that I was used as a human tape recorder. I do know one thing about that beach scene. When I came back from overseas... Only three days after I came back, it was announced that the North Vietnamese were going to give our prisoners of war back in an exchange. The meeting on the beach might have been an early parlay about ending the war and exchanging prisoners. At least, that's what strikes me as the best answer to the question of what that meeting was about. I might have been a witness. I really don't understand why, or why the gunboats were pointing at us. I can't remember the date or anything that places that memory in time. The thing that really bothers me about this whole thing is that I can sit here and talk to you, but I still can't sit down and say, okay, I joined the service on such and such a day, and this is what happened to me during a four-year period in chronological order. Ever since I got out of the service, I haven't been able to give a day-by-day -day account of what happened to me during those four years. Some people might call what happened to me brainwashing. I've called it that, but it's not really brainwashing. I think of brainwashing as something brutal. I don't think I was treated brutally. Also, what happened to me was something that was much more sophisticated than what I have read about brainwashing. I believe I'm telling the truth, and I'd like to see someone disprove it. I only have these fragments of memory. So if I went to the Air Force, they'd pull out my folder and throw it on the desk and say, See, there it is in black and white. He's a nut. He tried to commit suicide by taking a patent medicine. I feel I was used. Why would they use an enlisted man who is supposed to be a supply man? Every squadron has supply personnel, so I guess it's a perfect cover. A supply man is so common, he wouldn't be noticed. How well it worked out, from their point of view, I just don't know. But for mine, well, it didn't work out too well. All the doubts and fears I have now, years later, and after a lot of psychiatric help, which I paid for myself, made the experiment, if it was one, a failure to me. I never thought about laying down my life, but maybe I laid down a lot more than my life in my service to my country. My soul? Sixteen years later, David is still sleeping only two hours a night. He is still having nightmares, hearing voices and seeing shadows. Otherwise, he functions normally. Yet many of his symptoms are identical with the symptoms of those psychiatrists call people with dissociative identity disorder. 
I hadn't talked to David in, what, ten years. And now that I'd learned so much more about the survivors of Operation Mind Control, I thought I'd check in to see how he was doing. I found him fascinated with tattoos. Every time I see a tattoo anywhere, on anyone, I'm drawn to it, David said. I've got to look at it. I want to find out if it's a butterfly, a rose, or a... And in 1994, we said the word together. Bluebird. Chapter 3. The Mind Laundry Myth David's own assessment of his mental confusion after his Air Force experience was that he had not been brainwashed. By the time David had his mind controlled, brainwashing had become a catch-all phrase. But what David had suffered was a much more subtle and hideous form of tyranny. George E. Smith was a POW during the early days of the Vietnam War. Unlike David, George did not have a good education. It can even be said that he was a little naive, and therefore a good candidate for brainwashing of both the American and the NLF, Viet Cong, varieties. He was one of the first of the Green Berets captured in the Vietnam conflict in 1963. It was the practice of the U.S. Army in those days to indoctrinate its men with poorly constructed lies, which, it was hoped, motivated them to fight a war in which the U.S. had only dubious legal business and little moral argument. The credibility gap existed not only within the confines of the U.S. borders, but also in the far-flung fields of battle all the way to Southeast Asia. If brainwashing is making a person believe in lies, then our troops were already brainwashed by their own government. It was a simple job for the Viet Cong to gain the POW's cooperation by telling them the truth, truth which was easily documented. Smith described the attitude which was instilled in the American soldiers by their military indoctrination. We were arrogant. The army is a separate society. It has its own hierarchy, and I could rise to a stratum in the army that I couldn't attain in the outside world. They'd driven arrogance into us in the airborne, which is a high level in the army, but special forces was the highest level you could reach. The elite of the elite. Elitism was the philosophy they taught at Bragg. You are professors of warfare. You shouldn't fight unless attacked. It costs thousands of dollars to train one of you, and you're too valuable to send into battle. I believed it. I believed everything the army said. I never questioned anything they told me until I got to Vietnam. And then things didn't quite fit anymore. Smith and three other men were captured in a midnight raid which followed a heavy mortar bombardment of their location. The Viet Cong took them deep into the jungles. When they reached the VC compound, they were forced to build their own prison out of bamboo. Then, after the primitive compound was completed and the POWs had settled in, the interrogations began. They were nothing like Smith had been led to expect. They were friendly chats with an interpreter Smith called the Man with Glasses. Every day he would tell his prisoners about the story of Vietnam and the U.S. role in that country. It was right out of the movies, Smith said. The prisoner was confronted by his interrogators, who were sitting on a higher level and making him look up to them. Look at you, Man with Glasses began. You are pitiful. It was a typical brainwashing tactic designed to make the prisoner think poorly of himself, to undermine his self-image. Sergeant Smith, like many others, already had a poor self-image long before he was captured, even before he enlisted in the army. That image wasn't enhanced by any finding that the authorities to whom he had been so obedient had misinformed him. That image wasn't enhanced any by finding that the authorities to whom he had been so obedient had misinformed him. We had known interrogation was inevitable and had feared it for so long, but it didn't go the way it was supposed to, Smith said. The guards were off somewhere out of sight. No one shone lights in our eyes. In fact, I sat in the shade while Prevaricator, one of the interrogators, served me tea and candy and cigarettes. Man with glasses did most of the talking, though he encouraged me to say anything I wanted to. He insisted on giving me their side of the story and why we were there in the jungle, and why the NLF had gotten together and was fighting the U.S. and the Saigon regime. We are fighting for Vietnam. We do not try to take over your country. This is not in our plans. We are worried about our country. We love it very much. We are proud people, and we want to keep our country. Didn't I know I was wrong to be part of the United States effort in Vietnam? And if I did, would I write a statement saying so? He talked to me for about an hour, and at the end of the session he gave me a pack of the Cambodian cigarettes. For your enjoyment, take them with you. When you are resting and smoking, I would like you to think deeply of what we have discussed. 
If sitting in the shade drinking tea while I listened to this old guy talk was brainwashing, then it didn't fit any description I had ever heard. I recalled the stories I'd heard about Korea, the scene where they hypnotize you or drop water on your head or put you in complete stillness, something that will drive you out of your mind. Then once they've taken everything from your mind, they start over again. When somebody says brainwashing, this is what I consider they're talking about, the classic Korean example, or the stories that came out of there anyway. The word brainwashing summoned a terrifying image, but like so many other words, it became corrupt in usage. It was applied to describe situations in which mere propaganda or influence were used. Indeed, the word may have been corrupt from the very beginning when it was coined by a CIA propaganda specialist, Edward Hunter. In his book, Brainwashing in Red China, he claimed that brainwashing, with the even more sinister brain changing in reverse, is the terrifying new communist strategy to conquer the free world by destroying its mind. In the words of the noted Yale psychiatry professor Robert J. Lifton, brainwashing was popularly held to be an all-powerful, irresistible, unfathomable, and magical method of achieving total control over the human mind. It was, in fact, none of these things. Techniques which seemed to change the belief of American POWs and others behind the Iron Curtain employed no hypnosis, no drugs, no new methods for the control of the mind, and certainly nothing magical. Hunter revised Brainwashing in Red China and reissued it in 1971. In the introduction of the updated edition, he continued his attack on the communists, much as he did in his psychological warfare journal, Tactics. Change the word China to Cuba, and this book is a description of communist warfare against the mind. Brainwashing, in Cuba as well as in China. This is the world pattern the communists employ. What might, in military parlance, be called mind attack. It is the new dimension in warfare, added to artillery attack, naval attack, rear and frontal attack, air attack. Brainwashing's dual processes of softening up and indoctrination have been added to the arsenal of warfare, girding the Trojan horse in 20th century accoutrements. Though Hunter may have been correct about the communist use of coercive psychological techniques on its own populations, he never once hinted that the U.S. government might just be establishing practices employing similar techniques of its own. In 1958, in his testimony before the House Committee on Un-American Activities, he continued to present brainwashing as a communist weapon. Since man began, he has tried to influence other men or women to his way of thinking. There have always been these forms of pressure to change attitudes. We discovered in the past 30 years a technique to influence by clinical hospital procedures, the thinking processes of human beings. Brainwashing is formed out of a set of different elements, hunger, fatigue, tenseness, threats, violence, and in more intense cases where the Reds have specialists available on their brainwashing panels, drugs and hypnotism. No one of these elements alone can be regarded as brainwashing any more than an apple can be called apple pie. Other ingredients have to be added, and the cooking process gone through. So it is in brainwashing with indoctrination or atrocities or any other single ingredient. Given the anti-communist climate of the Cold War years, Hunter's zeal did not seem excessive, even though few of his conclusions were supported by the eyewitness accounts given by the repatriated POWs. According to them, no drugs or hypnosis were used overseas. They told only of persuasion techniques. Hunter's brainwashing in Red China was widely quoted. Through front-page news stories, the American public became aware, for the first time, that governments, though only communist ones were mentioned, could control people's thoughts and motivate them against their will and without their knowledge. Two years later, in May of 1960, Francis Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union, and cries of brainwashing again made U.S. headlines. At his public trial in Moscow, Powers apologized to the Russian people for doing them wrong, even though the CIA had told him that if caught, he could admit everything. The voices of the soldiers within the U.S. were quick to brand him a traitor, and those who were inclined to be more sympathetic said he had simply been brainwashed. One psychiatrist, William Jennings Bryan, who had been the head of an Air Force medical survival training program which employed hypnosis to prepare pilots for resistance to brainwashing, went so far as to coin a term for the subtle new technique which he thought the Soviets had developed since the Korean conflict and had used on powers. The U-2 pilot, Bryan said, had been powerized. Bryan said that Powers' apologetic manner during the Moscow trial, his submissive, almost 
crippled words of testimony, his trance-like acceptance, all showed an amazing personality change since his capture. The pilot's apparent lack of real emotion during the Moscow trial was the most startling evidence that the Russian brainwashing through hypnosis has destroyed the normal, aggressive confidence and the cockiness characteristic of the Air Force flyers. The big tip-off came, Dr. Bryan said, when Powers apologized for his American assignment, testified he knew he was wrong and said he felt no ill will towards his country's Cold War enemy. It is no longer a secret that Russia uses hypnosis as a powerful instrument to destroy the resistance of individuals she wishes to conquer, he said. Brainwashing hypnosis, as apparently used on powers, is vastly different from the permissive type of medical hypnosis and the self-hypnosis used by Air Force flyers in caring for themselves after a crash. Powers exhibited no telltale marks of physical abuse or torture during the Moscow trial, and indeed, he may have even thought himself that he was being treated rather well, but his manner and personality were obviously so unlike the typical American pilot that only a brand new type of other powerful technique could have changed his personality in so short a time. Francis Gary Powers was returned to the U.S. in 1962 in a trade for Russian spy Rudolf Abel. He wrote in his book Operation Overflight, which was withheld from publication by the CIA until 1970, that the tactic he decided upon when captured was in accordance with his CIA instructions. He said, When questioned, I would tell the truth. Powers insisted that he did not tell the Russians anything which he thought they did not already know. In fact, he often agreed to things they suggested simply to mislead them. As for sophisticated powerizing techniques, Powers denied their existence. He even went so far as to suggest that the Russians were actually highly overrated in their intelligence-gathering methods. From what I had been taught about brainwashing, I had anticipated certain things. I would be lectured about communism, given only propaganda to read. Food would be doled out on a reward-punishment basis. If I cooperated, I would be fed. If I didn't, I wouldn't. Interrogation would be at odd hours under bright lights. No sooner would I fall asleep than I would be awakened, and it would start all over again, until eventually I lost all track of time, place, identity. And I would be tortured and beaten until finally I would beg for the privilege of being allowed to confess to any crime they desired. None of this happened. Immediately after Powers crossed the bridge from East Berlin, he was examined by a West German flight surgeon under orders from the CIA. The surgeon took blood from his arm. Powers, as the doctor told him, the blood samples were necessary to determine whether I had been drugged. This seemed to be the first question of almost everyone to whom I talked. Had I been drugged? They seemed almost disappointed when I told them I hadn't. Powers was then flown to the U.S., I still couldn't comprehend that after 21 months of captivity, I was once again a free man, he said, which was perhaps best, for though I was yet to realize it, I wasn't quite free. Not yet. In a sense, I had been released by the Russians to become a de facto prisoner of the CIA. The CIA men told Powers they would like to talk to him for a couple of days. The couple of days turned out to be over three weeks in which Powers was thoroughly debriefed by a team of intelligence analysts and psychiatrists. The first question the psychiatrists asked was, again, had he been drugged by the Soviets? The second question they asked was, had he been brainwashed? When Powers answered no to both questions, he was given tranquilizers, which were the first drugs he had received since his U-2 left Turkey for the overflight of the USSR. Powers noted with some irony that, Americans are much more disposed to the use of drugs than are the Soviets. Perhaps even more ironic was the public disclaimer issued by CIA director Alan Dulles, which said that the U.S. had no use for brainwashing, what had popularly become known as brainwashing, while of great psychological interest to the West. As it is important to study defensive techniques, is never practiced by us, for the simple reason that we are not interested in converting people to our way of thinking, either forcibly or by trickery which is its main intent. We have never felt, as obviously the Soviets and the Red Chinese and the North Koreans have, that there is much to gain in putting a brainwashed person on the air to denounce his own countrymen. We have enough people who come over to us voluntarily from communism and who need no prompting. Dulles, it seemed, was either a reader of Hunter's or they both had been briefed by the same propaganda section of the CIA. 
Brainwashing was the term the psychological warfare unit of the CIA thought up to explain why American POWs cooperated with the enemy in Korea. Brainwashing was explained as severe deprivation of food, clothing, and shelter, during which time a series of punishments and rewards were applied so effectively that a person's fundamental beliefs could be made to change 180 degrees from their original position. This brutal technique was not called torture. There was no propaganda value in something as old as torture. The CIA thought up the term brainwashing to lead people in the Western world to believe that the inscrutable Orientals had again, like Fu Manchu, invented a revolutionary technique controlling the human mind. The word brainwashing was the official government explanation of what happened to the Korean POWs. The word brainwashing and the official government explanation of what happened to the Korean POWs was propaganda. It was aimed at fueling a homegrown fear of the communists upon which the Cold War so greatly depended. Propaganda, of course, was nothing more than artful deception, the careful planting of misinformation and disinformation, Cold War euphemisms for what had been called the big lie in World War II. Modern propaganda began when Nazi Germany perfected the art of the big lie. The Soviet Union and other communist countries took the methods of the Nazis and improved upon them. The United States did not actively engage in wide-scale propaganda until World War II, when the OSS and the Office of War Information started. But then it was well understood that the guiding principles of propaganda were, when there is no compelling reason to suppress a fact, tell it. Aside from considerations of military security, the only reason to suppress a piece of news is if it is unbelievable. When the listener catches you in a lie, your power diminishes. For this reason, never tell a lie which can be discovered. As far back as 1940, American propaganda services had orders to tell the truth. It was a sound premise for effective propaganda, but it was a premise which was ignored by the succeeding generations of cold warriors. Somewhere along the line, the CIA's covert action staff lost sight of the value of using the truth as the main weapon. Taking over from OSS, they soon became experts in the big lie. This policy surfaced to the attention of the American people during isolated events such as the U-2 incident and the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba when Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy took the blame for what were obviously CIA lies. In the light of recent history, it would appear that these chiefs of state were somehow convinced that it was better to issue a false confession that they had lied to the nation than to admit that they had been lied to by their own intelligence agency. In the years since the founding of the National Security Act in 1947, there were hundreds of such lies and false denials and domestic propaganda campaigns which did not immediately gain public attention. Since the administration of Lyndon Johnson, the executive branch of government seemed to be following Machiavelli's advice, if you don't get caught, it can't be wrong. The executive privilege, the legacy of the National Security Act, the art of falsehood, lies have left our history strewn with the rubble of uncovered cover-ups and stone walls. The administrations of Nixon, Reagan, and Bush lied, not because they were misled by the cryptocracy, but because they were part of it. If they hadn't been, they probably wouldn't have been elected. Few seemed to notice that George Bush was an intelligence agent before he was appointed director of the CIA, that before he was elected vice president of the United States, during which time his hand articulated a mentally impaired puppet, a movie actor playing president, to succeed him after eight years. Through Bush, the cryptocracy had its hands directly on the helm of state for 12 highly visible years. Brainwashing, as planted in the press, was one little propaganda weapon in a vast arsenal. But it was a weapon that was supposed to be effective against communism, cropping up in news accounts whenever it was needed. Whenever the Cold Warrior's domestic covert action arm thought the public was going soft on communism. Albert K. Bitterman a senior research associate of the RAND Corporation's subcontractor, the Bureau of Social Science Research, conducted a study of the news items published about our POWs in Korea. Bitterman's analysis confirmed that this kind of propaganda was successively dominant in the press during and after the Korean War. During the war, propaganda focused on prisoner atrocities. When the war had ended, the focus shifted to the stories involving the brainwashing of POWs. Beginning with exchanges of prisoners, he wrote, 
prisoner misconduct received gradually increased attention until, several months after the war, it came to overshadow the other themes. Throughout the Korean conflict, propaganda and counter-propaganda campaigns on both sides grew in intensity until eventually POWs became the most critical issue of the war, the stumbling block in the drawn-out truce talks that delayed the war's termination. In 1953, some 4,000 surviving American POWs became the subjects of another type of propaganda. Propaganda by Americans, about Americans, directed at Americans. According to Bitterman, the theme of this propaganda was that there had been wholesale collaboration by the American prisoners with their communist captors, and that this unprecedented misbehavior revealed alarming new weaknesses in our national character. This post-truce propaganda was an outgrowth of propaganda activities during the war. Desperately trying to believe that U.S. propaganda was motivated by good intentions, Bitterman suggested that the brainwashing theme was pushed at home because the Cold Warriors were apparently worried that a number of American prisoners would return espousing the communist view. Bitterman noted that the Defense and State Departments and the Central Intelligence Agency issued a stream of press releases during the days prior to the first prisoner exchanges in Korea to prepare the public for the shock of finding that many of the POWs had been brainwashed. The theme of these releases was that evidence of communist indoctrination or pro-communist statements by Americans when they were released would be discounted because the prisoners would have been subjected to the well-known tortures that communists used to brainwash their opponents. And just what were these well-known tortures? The general principles of the Chinese brainwashing techniques were repetition, pacing of demands, the forced participation in classes of prisoners, propaganda which would insert communist ideas into familiar and meaningful contexts, punishment, threats, rewards, suggestion, pleas for peace, manipulative tricks, and deprivation of all but the minimum necessities of life. There was little that was new or innovative about the techniques used by the Chinese. They did not use drugs or hypnosis, nor did they invent any mysterious new devices for breaking the mind and will of a man. Actually, the Chinese controlled information in their POW camps just as they controlled the mass media in their own country. The system they used in the camps, propagandizing through lectures, movies, reading and testimonials, was based on the same system used on the Chinese population and is not without parallel in Western education and advertising practices. Nor are the punishment and reward techniques used by the Chinese in their interrogations exclusively oriental. These same practices are employed by Western intelligence agents, police, and more subtly by reporters trying to elicit information from a hostile subject. Confession and self-criticism have been used in religious movements as a basis of conversion or as a way of perpetuating the faith from time immemorial. Dr. Edgar H. Schein of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology was one of the many persons who contributed to the Army study of the returned POWs. Of the central reason behind the brainwashing propaganda, which the Army study disclosed, he wrote, When things go wrong, it is far less ego-deflating to say that we have been brainwashed than to recognize our own inadequacy in coping with our problems. A crucial question, however, is whether such changes in our society and such preoccupations represent weaknesses and signal the deterioration of some of our highly valued institutions, or whether they are merely the symptoms of the changing world. Is this then to be a continuing trend in the so-called free world? Are we becoming mentally apathetic and hence more prone to totalitarian solutions? Shine continues. Or are we finding new ways in which to relate ourselves to our international and internal problems? Many observers of the contemporary scene, among them the novelist and philosopher Aldous Huxley and Juiced Mirlu, a psychoanalyst, feel strongly that we are headed squarely in the wrong direction, that the combination of certain social forces and the weapons against the mind now available will inevitably lead to the destruction of the democratic way of life and the freedom of mind which goes with it, unless we recognize clearly what is happening and put counter-forces into operation. In the succeeding years, talk of brainwashing continued. Usually it was heard that the communists had brainwashed somebody, Usually it was heard that the communists had brainwashed somebody. But on April 7, 1967, presidential hopeful Governor George Romney turned that around. 
Romney, who had gone to Vietnam believing in the rightness of the U.S. involvement there, came home saying that he had suffered the greatest brainwashing that anyone can get when you go over to Vietnam, not only by the generals, but also by the diplomatic corps over there, and they do a very thorough job. Nine governors who had accompanied Romney on the tour disagreed with him. Governor Philip H. Hoff said that Romney's brainwashing statement tends to be almost incredible. Finding he had no support among his colleagues, Romney quickly told reporters that he had not been talking about Russian-type brainwashing, but LBJ-type brainwashing. He said he meant the same thing the press meant when you write about the credibility gap, snow job, and manipulation of the news. Webster's third new international dictionary gives the second meaning of brainwashing as persuasion by propaganda or salesmanship. But the press and public thought that Romney had meant the word in its first sense, a forcible indoctrination to induce someone to give up basic political, social, or religious beliefs and attitudes, and to accept contrasting regimented ideas. And the public let it be known that it would not vote for a brainwashed presidential candidate. Romney's popularity fell so dramatically in the polls that he eventually dropped out of the race for the presidency. The word brainwashing proved to be more charged with emotions than anyone had supposed. In one of the first mass market books published on the subject following the Army's release of the study of the Korean POWs, Eugene Kincaid wrote, Unfortunately, the distinction between brainwashing and indoctrination is far from clear to the average American. The Army defines indoctrination as an effort to change a man's viewpoint while he is still a thinking individual by regulating his thoughts and actions. This falls far short of the effect produced upon some defendants seen in communist courts, defendants who had obviously been completely broken and had ceased to be thinking individuals. I am afraid that the general conception has been that communist techniques of manipulating human beings are so persuasive, so completely irresistible, that no prisoner can keep his integrity in the face of them, and, by analogy, that no people, including ours, can stand against such an enemy. This is what distresses me so much about the popular and improper use of a word like brainwashing. Perhaps. But by 1967, when George Romney claimed he had been brainwashed, our own government was already far beyond what Kincaid referred to as brainwashing. The United States government did not have to stoop to the slow and exhausting process the Chinese and Russians used. In the age of electronic brain stimulation, neuropsychopharmacology, and advanced methods of behavior modification and hypnosis, the government certainly didn't have to resort to methods as unsophisticated as brainwashing. The techniques of mind control developed, even by 1967, were making brainwashing seem like the metaphor it was, a washboard and scrub bucket technique which had little use in a world where the sonic cleaner, with high-frequency sound, higher than the human ear can hear, vibrates the dirt from the very molecules of matter, or the mind. Brainwashing was largely a campaign waged in the United States' home press. It served as a sharp-edged propaganda weapon and was aimed at the American people to add to the already considerable fear of the communists. It also covered official United States embarrassment over a seeming rash of defections and collaborations with the enemy, and perhaps most important, offered moral justification for immoral and illegal experiments to scientists working under government contract. They were urged as a matter of patriotism to beat the communists in the mind control race. It is doubtful that all of the collaborators in the Korean conflict succumbed to brainwashing. The eyewitness testimony of Air Force Colonel Laird Gutterson, one of the few heroes of the Vietnam conflict and a real hero of the mind control war, would suggest that they didn't. Gutterson had been in charge of the Air Force seminar on Korean brainwashing at Maxwell Air Force Base. An expert hypnotist, he later used self-hypnosis to block pain and keep himself alive in a North Vietnamese POW camp where he spent more than 27 months in solitary confinement. He took the time during his campaign for the U.S. Congress to offer me his views on brainwashing and mind control. As early as 1956, Colonel Gutterson realized that what was called brainwashing was nothing more than psychological indoctrination. Controlling the mind is one thing, he told me. But remember, this does not occur with psychological indoctrination, nor does it occur, normally, with hypnosis. The concept of complete and total mind control was projected by the brainwashing myth, 
and it was the theme of the book The Manchurian Candidate. But mind control is not what happened to the Korean or Vietnamese POWs. What the Chinese, the Russians, the Vietnamese did was mind influence, not mind control. Gutterson said that while it was generally believed that brainwashing was the result of drugs and hypnosis, to his first-hand knowledge, from the Korean conflict to Vietnam, there are no documented cases of drug or hypnosis-induced mind control. Reading the examples of what the POW stated in both Korea and Vietnam, and what I saw in Hanoi, there are only men saying, I couldn't have done those things unless I had been drugged. There are no specific reports of anyone saying, they stuck a needle into me and I did so-and-so, or they gave me something to eat and then I did so-and-so. There were men who said, I acted in a very strange way, just like I was in a dream or something. I must have been drugged. There was a cover-up for a snafu in some of the original Korean briefings of our combatants who, Gutterson said, were told to cooperate if captured. I remember a specific briefing, though later it was denied, where a group of us were told that we would be well advised, if we got shot down, to whip out a bottle of vodka and a red flag and start waving it. We were advised to cooperate in any possible way with the enemy because anybody back home would know that we were cooperating under duress. We were told that if we cooperated with our captors, it would not give them an excuse to torture us. That was a specific briefing given to us. Of course, now we know that a good number of our captive men followed that advice and did collaborate on the basis that, what the hell, nobody would ever be told to collaborate with the enemy again. The word brainwashing became commonplace after the Soviet Union presented evidence before the United Nations that charged the United States with the use of germ warfare in Korea, a major violation of the Geneva Convention. The Soviet evidence contained the confessions of several captured United States pilots, stating both in documents and on film that they had dropped germ bombs on North Korea. By the time these men were repatriated, their stories had changed. Marine Corps Colonel Frank H. Schwabel was the first American to sign a germ warfare confession. His confession named names, cited missions, described meetings, and strategy conferences. Before a military court of inquiry, Schwabel said, I was never convinced in my own mind that we in the 1st Marine Air Wing had used bug warfare. I knew we hadn't, but the rest of it was so real to me. The conferences, the planes, and how they would go about their missions. The words were mine, the colonel continued, but the thoughts were theirs. That is the hardest thing I have to explain. How a man can sit down and write something he knows is false, and yet to sense it, to feel it, to make it seem real. A CIA memo dated April 11, 1953, addressed to the chief of CIA's plans and preparations, contained a report of an exchange that took place between then United Nations Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge and an unidentified CIA agent. The CIA agent began to brief Lodge on the germ warfare confessions of Schwabel and others when, according to the memo, Lodge interrupted expressing a profound distaste for the entire matter adding that he hoped he would never hear of it again. It had been a nasty and difficult issue, principally because of the difficulty of explaining away the film and the statements of the American flyers. The CIA memo continued with the agent reporting, I said that we fully shared his view that the issue was finished in the United Nations, but that it had been our experience that the bug comes from a very hardy strain and had exhibited appalling vitality. For this reason, I said that I thought it would be a mistake to be too complacent about the matter. To the last statement, Senator Lodge replied with a question as to just what explanation we could give of the statements of the American flyers. How did we account for this and what could be done about it? I said that our best guess was that the statements had been in one way or another forced out of the captive airmen and that one of the techniques which we thought had possibly been used was the Soviet, and now Chinese, techniques of brainwashing. Senator Lodge said that he thought the public was very inadequately informed about brainwashing, and that in the absence of a much larger quantity of public information than now exists on the subject, the impact of the flyer's statements is terrific. I replied by stating that we shared his view, and pointed out that the Department of Defense is expected to issue a lengthy statement. Shortly thereafter, the word brainwashing was on the front page of every paper in America. We had not used germ warfare, CIA propaganda claimed. 
the communists had used brainwashing. Chapter 4. Without Knowledge or Consent I can hypnotize a man without his knowledge or consent in committing treason against the United States, boasted Dr. George Estabrooks in the early 1940s. Estabrooks, chairman of the Department of Psychology at Colgate University, was called to Washington by the War Department shortly after Pearl Harbor. Since he was the ranking authority on hypnosis at the time, they wanted his opinion on how the enemy might be planning to use hypnotism. 200 trained foreign operators working in the United States, Estabrooks told the military leaders, could develop a uniquely dangerous army of hypnotically controlled sixth columnists. At that time, only a handful of men knew of the government's experiments with hypnosis for the purpose of controlling minds in the interest of national security. In that decade, there had been no concentrated assassinations of presidents, candidates, or civil rights leaders. There had not yet been Watergate, nor any disclosures of government agencies invading the privacy of the United States citizens. The CIA had not yet been conceived, and even its parent, the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, did not exist. It was unthinkable at the time that an agency of the U.S. government would employ mind control techniques on its own people. Therefore, it was natural for George Estabrooks to believe that if Americans were threatened by hypnotic mind control, the threat would be posed by a foreign enemy working within the United States. So, in 1943, Estabrooks sounded his public alarm and planted the seed for what would become priority top-secret research for the next 25 years. Couching his disclosure in hypothetical terms and saying that the hypnotized mind could be put to military use, he then portrayed a scene which he said could very easily take place. It would be possible, he said, for the enemy to plant a foreign agent as a doctor in a hospital or his own office. This doctor could, by means of fake physical examinations, place thousands of people under his power over a period of time. Estabrooks projected how, by hypnotizing key officers and programming them to follow suggestions, this masked maneuver could enable a lowly first lieutenant to take over the reins of the entire U.S. Army. His alternate scenario depicted the general staff summoning a colonel from intelligence to an emergency meeting in the Pentagon two days after an outbreak of war. Shortly after entering the room where Pentagon brain trusters were gathered, the colonel is put into hypnotic trance by an army psychologist and told that there has been a change of plans for the defense of major territory. The details of the plan have to be conveyed in absolute secrecy to the Pacific Command. Since the enemy has been very successful in monitoring U.S. communications, a new, highly reliable procedure is needed to slip the message past the enemy. The colonel, under the influence of hypnosis, will carry the top-secret message. When you wake up, the hypnotized colonel is told, you will no longer have the slightest knowledge of the secret information carried in the lower layers of your mind. The colonel is then given instructions to proceed by airplane to Honolulu. He is told that in his normal waking state, he will hold the impression that he is on a routine mission and must report after his arrival to General Y. He is the only man in the world who can hypnotize you again. Put to sleep by General Y, and only him, you will correctly recall all the details of this conversation and disclose the secret instructions we have just given you. Estabrooks said later he had given the Pentagon episode only as a practical example of how the new science of hypnotism could be used for military purposes. Going even further with his alarming predictions, Estabrooks told how disguised techniques of hypnosis could be employed to create an entire army of saboteurs within our own country. Let us suppose that in a certain city there lives a group of a given foreign extraction. They are loyal Americans, but still have cultural and sentimental ties to the old country. A neighborhood doctor, working secretly for a foreign power, hypnotizes those of his patients who have ties favorable to his plans. Having done this, he would, of course, remove from them all knowledge of their ever having been hypnotized. Next comes a one-month period of indoctrination under hypnosis, by various means, including the offer of substantial rewards and educational processes designed to strengthen their ancestral loyalties, their cooperation is obtained. Estabrooks explained how individuals so controlled would have no conscious aversion to Americans and would continue to behave as good citizens. Subconsciously, however, they would be saboteurs and agents of the enemy. 
All right, you say, this sounds beautiful on paper, but what about the well-known psychological principle that no one will do anything under hypnosis that he wouldn't do when he's awake, Estabrooks asked. My experiments have shown this assumption is poppycock. It depends not so much on the attitude of the subject as on that of the operator himself. In wartime, the motivation for murder under hypnosis doesn't have to be very strong, Estabrooks warned. During World War I, a leading psychologist made a startling proposal to the Navy. He offered to take a submarine steered by a captured U-boat captain, placed under his hypnotic control, through enemy minefields to attack the German fleet. Washington nixed the stratagem as too risky, first because there was no disguised method by which the captain's mind could be outflanked, second because today's technique of day-to-day -day breaking down of ethical conflicts, brainwashing, was still unknown. The indirect approach to hypnotism would, I believe, change the Navy's answer today. Personally, Estabrooks concluded, I am convinced that hypnosis is a bristling, dangerous armament which makes it doubly imperative to avoid the war of tomorrow. George Estabrooks may have greatly contributed to the U.S. government's interest in hypnosis, for during the years that followed, seeking ways both to improve the mind and to control it, various government agencies, many of them with intelligence functions, secretly pursued research in hypnotic techniques. A number of related events during the 1940s demonstrated the extent of the government's interest in hypnosis. Beyond changing beliefs, they sought ways to motivate people to commit acts which they would not commit in a normal state. Dr. Bernard C. Gindis wrote of an amnesia experiment he undertook for the U.S. Army in the late 40s. A soldier with only a grade school education was able to memorize an entire page of Shakespeare's Hamlet after listening to the passages seven times. Upon awakening, he could not recall any of the lines, and even more startling was the fact that he had no remembrance of the hypnotic experience. A week later, he was hypnotized again. In this state, he was able to repeat the entire page without a single error. In another experiment to test the validity of increased memory retention, five soldiers were hypnotized en masse and given a jumbled code consisting of 25 words without phonetic consistency. They were allowed 60 seconds to commit the list to memory. In the waking state, each man was asked to repeat the code. None of them could. One man hazily remembered having had some association with a code, but could not remember more than that. The other four soldiers were allowed to study the code consciously for another 60 seconds, but all denied previous acquaintance with it. During rehypnotization, they were individually able to recall the exact content of the coded message. In 1947, J.G. Watkins induced criminal behavior in deeply hypnotized subjects during another army experiment. Watkins suggested a distorted view of reality to his subjects by inducing hallucinations, which allowed them to avoid direct conflict with their own moral concepts. He carefully chose his suggestions to be in line with his subjects' pre-existing motivational structures, and so was able to induce so-called antisocial behavior. Watkins took a normal, healthy army private, a young man whose tests indicated a most stable personality, and put him in a deep trance. Though merely striking a superior officer is a court-martial offense in the army, Watkins wanted to see if he could get his subject to strangle a high-ranking officer. After the subject was deep into trance, Watkins told him that the officer sitting across from him was a Japanese soldier who was trying to kill him. He must kill or be killed, Watkins suggested, and immediately the private leapt ferociously at the officer and grabbed him by the throat. In his waking state, the private would have been aghast at the thought of trying to strangle a superior officer. But under hypnosis, believing the officer was a dangerous Japanese soldier, the young private had to be pulled off his superior by three husky assistants. The officer came within a hair's breadth of being strangled, as the young man was most persistent in his attempt to kill what he regarded as the enemy. Watkins repeated this experiment with other subjects. The second time he used two officers who were good friends. One of them was given the hypnotic suggestion that the other was a Japanese soldier and that he must kill or be killed. The man who had received the command not only made a powerful lunge at his friend, but as he did he whipped out and opened a concealed jackknife, which neither the doctor, his assistants, nor his friend knew he had. Only the quick action of one of the assistants, who was a judo expert, prevented a potentially fatal stabbing. 
In both cases, reality was so distorted that the subjects took murderous and antisocial action. If they had accomplished their defensive acts, both men could have been convicted of murder, since the law did not recognize motivation through hypnosis as a fact. The courts, in all but a few cases, had adopted the traditional scientific view that criminal behavior cannot be induced under hypnosis. That view still stands today. To test the premise, which was then widely held, that a normal person under hypnotic trance could not be made to divulge information which would be self-incriminating, Watkins conducted a number of experiments where a monetary bribe was offered to withhold information. Watkins discovered that when placed in a trance, they spilled every time, either verbally or in writing. The subject of one of these experiments was an enlisted women's air corps in military intelligence. Her commanding officer ordered her not to reveal a list of what were made to appear to be real military secrets. Under hypnosis, she spilled everything. Another experiment was discontinued when it was discovered that a research worker in the government arsenal was spilling vital and top-secret war information to the friendly army hypnotist, who did not have a need to know. He did this loud and clear while in a trance before an audience of 200 military professionals. If the subject had been allowed to continue, the disclosures of information would have resulted in a general court-martial, no matter how the doctor might have tried to persuade intelligence headquarters that this was just a test. Much of the Army's experimentation with manipulation by hypnosis was inspired by the reports of Wesley Raymond Wells, a doctor at Syracuse University. Wells's research, in turn, had been inspired by the fiction of the 1880s and 1890s, which described criminal acts as being induced by hypnosis. Wells was taken by the idea that the most striking feature in a hypnotized subject is his automatism. Although earlier experiments had elicited no immoral or criminal behavior from subjects under hypnosis, the results of experiments which asked subjects to resist various suggestions indicated to Wells that people might be more suggestible than was generally believed. In the late 1930s, Wells conducted a simple experiment with a student volunteer. He chose a subject who had stated that he expected he would be below average in hypnotizability and claimed he could not be put into a trance. Before inducing trance, Wells urged him to do his utmost to resist in every possible way, first going into the trance and then doing anything against his own moral code. When the student told Wells that he was ready to begin the contest, the doctor put his hand on the subject's chest, counted to seven, and found that the subject had already fallen into a deep trance. After testing the subject's muscle control and ability to obtain amnesia and hallucinations, Wells proceeded to suggest that the subject get up from his chair, go over to Wells's overcoat, which was on a coat rack across the room, and take a dollar from the right-hand pocket. Wells suggested that the subject see the coat as his own and take the dollar thinking that he had left it in the pocket. When the subject followed all of Wells' suggestions, he then told him to put the dollar in his own breast pocket and return to his chair. As he was about to sit, Wells said to him that when he sat in the chair, he would spend the dollar just as if it were his own. Afterwards, during the student's recall of his experiences, Wells found that everything had worked according to the hypnotic program he had implanted. This was, of course, a clinical sort of test for amnesia. Whether his amnesia would have withstood third-degree methods of the police or the lie detector methods of the psychological laboratory is another question, Wells said. On the basis of my previous experimental study of post-hypnotic amnesia, I would state it as my opinion that hypnotically induced amnesia in the case of so good a subject would have withstood any possible tests if added precautions had been taken in the hypnotic production of the amnesia. Wells's report of this experiment, published in a psychology journal in 1941, brought a negative reaction from the scientific community. Milton Erickson was among the first to say that Wells's experiments were at best inconclusive. Erickson reported that after attempting to duplicate similar hypnotic inducements of crime with 50 subjects, he had failed. He concluded from his own investigations that hypnosis cannot be misused to induce hypnotized persons to commit actual wrongful acts, either against themselves or others. The so-called antisocial acts induced by Wells and others, Erickson maintained, were most likely motivated by factors other than hypnosis or suggestion. 
We know that it is possible, without recourse to hypnosis, for one person to induce another to commit a wrong, a fact we may explain loosely as the influence of one personality upon another, Erickson explained. To settle this question is difficult, since it involves three inseparable factors of unknown potentialities. Specifically, the hypnotist as a person, the subject as a person, and hypnosis as such to say nothing of the significant influence upon these three, both individually and collectively, of the suggestion and the performance of a questionable act. But even Erickson conceded that the primitive being, the libido, which dwells in everyone, makes almost any crime possible. But even Erickson conceded that the primitive being, when a hallucinatory state has been induced and the subject thinks he or she is acting out of self-preservation, the primitive mind takes over and the killer instinct is unleashed. Milton W. Erickson's insights into human behavior were used to develop, with the CIA watching over the scientists' shoulders, what is perhaps the 20th century's most important technology of empowerment or enslavement a science known as Neuro-Linguistics Programming, or NLP. In the late 1930s, psychologists began grappling with the problem of human will, as the theologians before them had done for centuries. Some maintained that will meant conscious volition, others that it meant nothing but the manifestation of the belief system, that is to say, the result of the earliest conditioned responses. The area of will still lies outside the limits of modern psychology, Many experts are loath even to use the word will, since it represents a most ill-defined dimension of human nature. Summing up a carefully constructed semantic argument, psychologists often say, a person cannot be made to do anything against his will or basic moral precepts. That statement, taken at face value, is certainly true. A normal person would not wittingly kill a friend. But if he was made to hallucinate that his friend was an enemy and that it was a kill-or-be-killed situation, he would initiate a natural response to preserve his own life. In the process, he might even take the imagined enemy's life. After the hallucination passed, he would realize he had killed his friend. This criminal act would be considered in one sense an act of will, but the real cause of the action would not be understood outside the hallucinated state. Only the killer's grief would remain to attest to his knowledge of what he did, and that he really did not want to do it. Whether or not hypnosis can be used to deeply motivate people to commit antisocial acts, despite the call of their own conscience, is still an open question in academic circles. George Estabrooks had evidence which made him conclude that one in every five of the human race are highly suggestible, at least half are suggestible to a very considerable degree. And, he warned, mere figures do not tell the story that one-fifth has a power far beyond its numbers, for this type of man, acting under direct suggestion, is no mere average person. He is a fanatic, with all that fanaticism may imply for good or evil. Can this prospective subject, this one in five individual, be hypnotized against his will? The answer to this very vital question, Estabrooks concluded, is yes, though we prefer to say without his consent instead of against his will. We do not need the subject's consent when we wish to hypnotize him, for we use disguised technique. Believing in Estabrook's logic, pragmatists in the government began to explore the possibilities of ways to change belief and motivate behavior. They let scores of contracts for research into hypnosis, behavior modification, conditioning, and virtually anything that held even a slim chance of being able to give them control over the individual human mind and will. Meanwhile, foreign governments unfriendly to the United States were involved in similar psychological research. But the U.S. government's fear of losing superiority in this new and untested field ran away with it. Intelligence analysts believed a mind-control gap existed, and to close it, they mobilized think tanks to develop a usable program of experimental research at once. From one such think tank, the RAND Corporation, came a report entitled, Are the Common Form Countries Using Hypnosis Techniques to Elicit Confession in Public Trials? Dated April 25, 1949. It helped set the stage for using national security as the rationale for resorting to mind control to motivate criminal acts, both at home and abroad. The successful use of hypnosis, the report said, 
would represent a serious threat to democratic values in times of peace and war. In addition, it might contribute to the development of unconventional methods of warfare, which will be widely regarded as immoral. The results of scientific research in the field under discussion would obviously lend themselves to offensive as well as defensive applications, and to abuse no less than use. It must be assumed that almost all of the scientific personnel in the field of hypnosis are keenly aware of these social implications of their work, and that they are interested in limiting the practice of hypnosis to therapeutic applications. That assumption proved to be untrue. The RAND report recommended that these moral and political implications of experimental research on hypnosis be explored as fully as possible prior to official encouragement or sponsorship of such research, so as to establish the most effective safeguards against its unintended consequences. The RAND study dwelt at length upon Soviet experiments in hypnosis dating back to 1923. At the State Institute of Experimental Psychology in Moscow, the report stated, it was demonstrated that hypnosis could be used in inducing an innocent person to develop intense guilt feelings and to confess to a criminal or immoral act which he did not commit. In 1932, the experiments on hypnotically implanted crimes were reported, in English translation, by A. R. Luria, who at that time was a professor in the Academy of Communist Education. Quoting Luria, the report described how hypnosis was used as a device for producing emotional disturbances in order to control behavior. We suggested to the person under test, while in a sufficiently deep hypnotic state, a certain situation, more often a disagreeable one, in which he was playing a role irreconcilable with his habits and contrary to his usual behavior. We thus obtained an actual and rather sharply expressed acute effect. After awakening the person under test, we had a subject who was loaded with certain definite affective complexes, which mostly remained unknown to himself. Luria described an experiment with a 20-year-old female college student who was told under deep hypnosis that she was sitting in her home studying when a neighbor child, a boy of six, came into the room. She was told that the child shouted when he came into the room. She asked him to stop, but he did not listen. The young woman was then told that she would get angry and forget herself. She would take a stick and beat the boy, first on the back and then on the head. The boy would cry out from the wounds on his head, but she would keep on beating him. She would then feel very ashamed and would be unable to understand how such a thing could happen, how she could beat up a child. Finally, she was told that she must try and forget the incident altogether. Luria explained that he had chosen this situation with a definite purpose, since the hallucinated event was entirely unacceptable by the moral standards of the young woman's personality, it was natural that she would feel repentant. He reinforced her natural desire to forget by suggesting to her that she remove the memory of the event from her mind. In subsequent trances, the subject was questioned about the beating. With great difficulty she reconstructed the event, but shifted the emphasis on several points so that the imagined event would conform more to her basic moral code. At first, she refused to remember that she had beaten the child. She then conceded that she had pulled his ears. Then, finally, she admitted she had beaten him, but she maintained she had not beaten him with a stick. Laura said that this showed how unacceptable the situation was to her personality. The student said twice, my conscience has tortured me. Luria said this showed the effectiveness of the hypnotic suggestion. Of the experiment, Irving Janus, author of the Rand Report, observed, In this particular case, the implanted memory was initially referred to by the examiner as a dream rather than as a real event. But from the detailed reports of other investigators, this procedure does not appear to be necessary for eliciting a false confession. A hypnotized subject will often accept and confess to an implanted memory as a real event in his own past life. The RAND report itself suggested that this trick of hypnotic suggestion might be used on a defendant awaiting trial. The defendant could be prepared in a series of hypnotic sessions to accept guilt about a criminal act he did not commit, and then, if placed in a hypnotic trance while in the courtroom, the prosecutor's interrogation would elicit a false confession. Fearing the communists' use of hypnosis, the RAND report warned that hypnosis, once accomplished, is hard to detect. Contrary to reports in the 19th century, 
A hypnotized subject is not blindly obedient, nor does he act like an automaton when in a trance. Hypnotic suggestions are acted out and elaborated in a way that is consistent with the individual's habitual social behavior and his basic personality traits. The report stated that while often the hypnotized subject seems literal and humorless, he appears entirely unselfconscious, and very often he acts abstracted, inattentive, almost as if he were insulated against his surroundings. This is not always the case. A number of experienced hypnotists have been able to train their subjects to perform in such a way that observers could not tell that the subject was in a trance or that he was acting under hypnotic suggestions. The Rand report outlined the following procedure that would elicit a false confession. First, make the subject feel guilty about some acts he had thought about or had actually carried out in the past. Second, make him feel guilty about having committed some crime of which he was actually innocent. The implanted guilt would compel the subject to confess when examined by a hypnotist or anyone else designated by the hypnotist. Third, train the subject, by means of post-hypnotic suggestion, to go into a trance whenever a simple signal was encountered. The subject would be trained to give his false confession in a normal, convincing manner, so that observers would not be able to detect the trance state. To induce hypnosis in an unwilling subject, the report suggested any of three possibilities, which were then well supported by research findings. Number one. As part of a medical examination, talk relaxation to the subject, thus disguising the hypnotic induction. For example, the person could be given a blood pressure test, told that he must relax completely in order to give an adequate test record, and then be given suggestions to go to sleep, which would result in a hypnotic trance. Number two, induce hypnosis while the person is actually asleep from normal fatigue. This could be done by simply talking softly into the sleeper's ear. Number three, Use injections of drugs to induce hypnosis. The hypnotic drugs would relax the subject and put him in a twilight state where the subconscious mind is very susceptible to suggestion. Subjects who refuse or resist the simple talking methods of hypnotic induction could be given a few grams of peraldehyde or an intravenous injection of sodium pentothal or sodium amytal. The appropriate dosage of these drugs invariably induces a state of light hypnotic sleep. During sleep, the subject could then be given suggestions which would produce the characteristic deep hypnotic trance. While in the first drug-induced trance, the patient could be given post-hypnotic suggestions to the effect that he would be susceptible to hypnosis thereafter without the use of drugs. Subsequently, the subject could be allowed to practice carrying out post-hypnotic suggestions. He could then be re-hypnotized, still without his conscious cooperation, but this time without the use of drugs. The report admitted that at the time of its writing, there was no certain knowledge of just how successful each of the three methods described might prove to be with individuals who are on their guard against being victimized by hostile authorities. The drug technique, suggested the report, would probably turn out to be the simplest and most efficient of the three, and so it would be the most likely candidate for hypnotizing defendants against their will. Another important use of hypnosis for the government, the report said, would be the induction of amnesia. Once a deep hypnotic trance is achieved, it is possible to introduce post-hypnotic amnesia so that a subject would not know that he had been subjected to hypnosis, to drugs, or to any other treatment. The report then turned to the problem of producing the deep hypnotic trance essential to post-hypnotic amnesia. It stated that, based on research reports of that time, in about 90% of any unselected population, it should be possible to produce the deepest, somnambulistic, type of trance. According to numerous authorities, a light trance is sufficient to elicit a confession of actual misbehavior, which might otherwise be withheld. But, for carrying out complete post-hypnotic amnesia, it is a somnambulistic trance that is required. The RAND document expressed fear that Soviet investigators had found other techniques which could produce deep hypnosis in perhaps 90% or more of all individuals. Anticipating future advances, the report speculated on more efficient ways to develop greater depth in hypnotic trance. It suggested that a subject could be placed in a trance many times each day until a sufficient depth of trance was achieved. It was thought that hypnotizing the subject and then awakening him several times in the same session might speed up the process. 
This technique of successive and rapid trance induction would, it was hoped, make the subject easily susceptible to deep trance in a few days. To increase speed and depth of hypnosis, special uses of hypnotic drugs were also suggested. For example, a series of drug-induced trances, as against only one such treatment, might serve to develop the majority of cases into somnambules. Moreover, certain unique drug compounds may be especially effective in inducing very deep states of hypnosis. Neurolinguistic programming practitioners have developed ways of reaccessing any drug state, or any state at all for that matter, once it has been achieved. NLP, added to that which is described above, can exponentially amplify the effects. The report then said, Conceivably, electroshock convulsions might be used as an adjunctive device to achieve somnambulism in a very high percentage of the cases. Many studies have shown that there is a temporary intellectual impairment, diffuse amnesias, and general weakening of the ego produced during the period when a series of electroshock convulsions is being administered. From my own and others' investigations of the psychological effects of such treatments, I would suspect that they might tend to reduce resistance to hypnotic suggestions. It is conceivable, therefore, that electroshock treatments might be used to weaken difficult cases in order to produce a hypnotic trance of great depth. In 1958, the Bureau of Social Science Research, BSSR, a subcontractor to the RAND Corporation, issued a technical report on hypnosis to the Air Force that took up where the earlier RAND report had left off. Once again, a think tank was calling for action in the mind control race against the communists. To both the layperson and the behavior scientist, the author, Seymour Fisher, wrote in the introduction, Hypnosis has long been regarded as a potentially powerful instrument for controlling human behavior. Undoubtedly, the intelligence divisions of many countries have given serious thought to this potential and have done classified research in various areas of hypnosis. It is conceivable that these techniques could have been used and covered up so successfully that they might be impossible to recognize. Fisher outlined areas of future research where Americans could advance in the mind control race. He urged the government to develop tests to determine who was and who was not a good hypnotic subject. He urged further research in pharmacology, suggesting that a number of drugs little known at the time might prove to be effective in inducing hypnosis. He predicted that some drugs would prove useful in reducing the amount of time required to induce complete hypnotic behavior and that others would be useful in reinforcing the lasting effects of hypnotically induced behavior control. He predicted that drugs would be developed which would permit far greater control over autonomic processes. Some drugs, he suggested, would be found to permit control over learning and perception as well. He also predicted that new drugs would be discovered which would be capable of inducing deep hypnosis in virtually any individual, regardless of his degree of cooperativeness. All of these techniques, involving drug-induced hypnosis and electroshock convulsions, were eventually developed and used to reduce some of our own citizens to a zombie state, in which they would blindly serve the government regardless of the Constitution and the laws which supposedly protect the individual against government coercion, zombies were covertly created to do the government's more unsavory bidding. Such zombies asked no questions about the legality of their assignments. Often their assignments were never consciously known, and if they were ever questioned about their own actions, amnesia protected them from self-incrimination. What had started out as a race against the communists slowly turned into a war against Americans. It was waged by a cryptocracy that had taken over the country once the electorate had been lulled into a hypnotic trance by the techniques it had developed to win the mind control race against the boogeymen commies. Chapter 5 Holy Acid Wars in 1951, a former naval officer described a secret of certain military and intelligence organizations. He called it pain drug hypnosis and said, It is a vicious war weapon and may be of considerably more use in conquering a society than the atom bomb. This is no exaggeration. The extensiveness of the use of this form of hypnotism in espionage work is now so widespread that it is long past the time when people should have become alarmed about it. Pain drug hypnosis is a wicked extension of narcosynthesis, the drug hypnosis used in America only during and since the last war. 
That naval officer was none other than L. Ron Hubbard. Before the war, an explorer and prolific science fiction writer, he went on to found one of America's fastest growing, if controversial, religions, Scientology. In an exchange of letters, Hubbard told me that he had written a book called Excalibur, which had been stolen. The information in the book, he said, had all been subsequently published in his many other books. Excalibur was, he intimated, the guts of what would be published as Dianetics, a work which takes all the mind control insights Hubbard was exposed to both in his travels in the East and in naval intelligence, and applies them to empower the human spirit, the exact opposite of mind control as it came to be. He was subsequently kidnapped, and of course we know that he and the Church of Scientology were hounded by the government much as others like Wilhelm Reich had been hounded for spreading the truth about technologies which may have the potential to liberate rather than enslave. Several years after Hubbard's death, the Church of Scientology was granted, in 1993, official recognition by the Internal Revenue Service. It finally granted them the tax-deductible status which run-of-the-mill religious groups have little trouble obtaining. Hubbard's statement on pain drug hypnosis was the tip of a vast iceberg of mind control research using drugs as an aid to hypnotic induction. In the 1950s, under Air Force and ultimately CIA guidance, a series of papers were written defining the limits to which a government, ours or an enemy's, could go to make persons behave against their will. In the introduction to one of these, the authors stated that the purpose of their study was to review available scientific knowledge on the use of pharmacologic agents to influence the communication of information which, for one reason or another, an informant does not wish to reveal. They went on to say that, contrary to the alleged necessity for conducting such drug experiments, no published reports have come to attention detailing the scientific application of drugs by intelligence agencies of any nation as a means of obtaining information. The methods of Russian interrogation and indoctrination are derived from age-old police methods that have been systematized and are not dependent on drugs, hypnotism, or any other special procedure designed by scientists. The report, expressing concern over proper drug experimentation, urged that control placebos be administered silently so that no one would know who was getting what or when. Also discussed were the effects of drugs on different individuals in various settings, the relation between dosage levels, the effect of food, drink, and other physiological needs, and the effects of individual variables, such as sex, intelligence, medical and psychiatric status, life situation, and so forth, upon drug reactions. The top priority for testing and mind control were those drugs which were found to induce hypnosis. The administration and effects of barbiturates, amobarbital, cecobarbital, pentothal, and sodium amytal were studied. Non-barbituate sedatives and calmatives, such as ethochlorvinol, glutethamide, methoprilon, methoparaphinol, captodramin, and oxinamide were also tested. A whole range of amphetamines and their derivatives were discussed as good tools to produce a rush, an outpouring of ideas, emotions, memories, and so forth. New drugs such as Ritalin, Marsalid, and Mescaline were thought to hold great promise for mind control applications. Perhaps the most promising of this last group was a consciousness-expanding drug called LSD-25. Four months after the first nuclear reaction was created in a pile of uranium ore in Chicago, the psychotropic effects of LSD-25 were discovered by a 37-year-old Swiss chemist working at the Sandoz Research Laboratory in Basel, Switzerland. On April 16, 1943, Dr. Albert Hoffman accidentally absorbed a minute quantity of the rye fungus byproduct with which he was experimenting. He later filed a report which described history's first LSD trip. I was forced to stop my work in the laboratory in the middle of the afternoon and to go home as I was seized by a peculiar restlessness associated with a sensation of mild dizziness, a kind of drunkenness which was not unpleasant, and which was characterized by extreme activity of imagination. There surged upon me an uninterrupted stream of fantastic images of extraordinary plasticity and vividness, and accompanied by an intense kaleidoscope-like play of colors. Sandoz Laboratories had actually been manufacturing LSD since 1938, when it was first used in an experiment with monkeys. Their scientists observed then that the substance caused a marked excitation of the animals, but these results did not motivate scientists to follow up with further research. 
Work with LSD fell into abeyance until the spring of 1943, when Hoffman prepared a new batch for the storeroom and accidentally ingested some himself. Dr. Hoffman described that LSD experience. I did not know what was going to happen, if I'd ever come back. I thought I was dying or going crazy. My first experiment with LSD was a bum trip, as one would say nowadays. Dr. Hoffman's new discovery was investigated by the European psychiatrists as a possible key to the chemical nature of mental illness. In 1950, LSD was introduced to American psychiatrists, and interest spread rapidly in the scientific community here. In 1953, the CIA made plans to purchase 10 kilograms of LSD for use in drug experiments with animals and human beings. Since there are more than 10,000 doses in a gram, that meant the CIA wanted 100 million doses. The CIA obviously intended to corner the market on LSD so that other countries would not be ahead of the U.S. in their potential for LSD warfare. Later, the cryptocrats were to say that they'd merely gotten milligrams and micrograms confused. That year, Sandoz Laboratories filled many orders for LSD from the CIA and the Department of Defense. According to Hoffman, they continued to do so up until the mid-60s. The Army would visit the labs every two years or so to see if any technological progress had been made towards the manufacture of LSD in large quantities. Dr. Hoffman said that he had never been told the reason for the Army's interest in the drug, but he assumed, from the large quantities being discussed, that it was to be used for weapons research. As an employee of the pharmaceutical house, Dr. Hoffman was in no position to warn the Army researchers away from the drug, despite his belief that it would be extremely dangerous if used improperly, and despite his personal distaste for their work. I had perfected LSD for medical use, not as a weapon, he said. It can make you insane or even kill you if it is not properly used under medical supervision. In any case, the research should be done by medical people, and not by soldiers or intelligence agencies. In 1963, Hoffman received a letter from a scholar at Harvard requesting 25 kilograms of psilocybin for research purposes. Psilocybin was a psychedelic substance similar in effect to LSD, but more subtle and much less powerful. Before the sales department at Sandoz would act on this order for the extraordinary large quantity of psychedelic compounds, they asked the scholar to provide them with the necessary import license from U.S. health authorities. He failed to provide it. Later, Hoffman commented on the unrealistic manner with which he handled this transaction, which left the impression of a person unconcerned with the regulations of society. The scholar's name was Timothy Leary. Leary came to the CIA's attention through a drinking buddy at Berkeley named Frank Barron. Barron had guided Leary through the creation of his first book, a supposed landmark in 1956 psychology circles entitled Interpersonal Diagnosis of Personality. Barron introduced Leary to CIA officials and set him up for his role in the psychedelic 60s. Shortly after Leary entered the cycle of the cryptocracy, his wife died and he was left with two children to raise. Miraculously, he was offered a well-paying job on the faculty of Harvard University. His boss was former OSS official David McClelland, the editor of the Secret Service's important work, Assessment of Men a book which outlined the framework by which individuals were selected for espionage work during World War II. At Cambridge, Leary launched himself into his work, which was funded by Harvard, which in turn was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, which in turn was funded secretly by the CIA's MK Ultra program. Leary began experimenting with LSD on prisoners in the Concord Correctional Facility in Concord, Massachusetts. On the books, this research was funded by the Uris Brothers Foundation in New York City under the auspices of Harvard. What Leary learned from the Concord Prisoners was published in 1962 in his paper entitled How to Change Behavior. In it, Leary explained what a powerful tool LSD was for changing ways of thinking and living. By 1960, Leary had become fascinated by the effects of LSD upon creativity, so he went to Greenwich Village in New York City. There he began to recruit artists as LSD guinea pigs. He claims to have guided trips for about 3,000 volunteers, among them Allen Ginsberg, Charles Olson, Jack Kerouac, Robert Lowell, Charles Mingus, Miles Davis, John Lennon, Jim Morrison, Aldous Huxley, Arthur Kessler, Alan Watts, as well as swamis, gurus, mystics, psychics by the troop. 
It was poet Allen Ginsberg who, after experiencing the mystical effects of LSD himself, persuaded the uptight Dr. Leary to try it. That marks the time when a very different Leary began to emerge. While Leary had received National Institute of Mental Health grants at the University of California at Berkeley from 1953 to 56, and while working for the U.S. Public Health Service from 1954 to 58, at first he denied that any of his psychedelic research projects at Harvard were funded by the government. Yet when I finally sat with him face to face after Operation Mind Control had been published in 1979, and naively asked him if he was witting or unwitting of his collaboration with the CIA, Leary answered with, Who would you work for? The Yankees or the Dodgers? I mean, who was I supposed to work for? The KGB? Previous to my interview with Leary, I had queried the National Institute of Mental Health Director, Bertram Brown. Brown said that, although such research at Harvard University was funded by HEW and NIMH grants from the period of 1956 to 63, records available for projects supported during that period generally do not go below the major institution level. Example given, awards are identified as being made to Harvard University, but not to departments or centers within that institution. Here we encounter another example of the government's built-in deniability. Harvard claimed that its records on Leary's research could not be located. Leary told ABC News hack Paul Altmaier, The CIA funded and supported and encouraged hundreds of young psychiatrists to experiment with this drug, LSD. The fallout from that was that young psychologists, like himself, began taking it themselves and discovering it was an intelligence-enhancing, consciousness-raising experience. I give the CIA total credit for sponsoring and initiating the entire consciousness movement, counterculture events of the 1960s, Leary said. The CIA's former chief psychologist, John Gittinger, obviously was asked by Altmaier if the CIA did indeed provide Leary with the LSD which fueled the psychedelic 60s. Gittinger replied on camera, the countercase that I would make in relationship to that is that remember the people who were doing the research were the people who would be doing the research regardless of who was the sponsor. That it was not the CIA who asked these people to work on these. These people were working on it, and the CIA helped them to do that particular work. In the spring of 1962, Leary was approached by Mary Pinchot Meyer, wife of CIA executive Cord Meyer. Leary says that he looked up from his desk to see a good-looking woman leaning against the doorpost with her hip tilted provocatively, studying him with a bold stare. She appeared to be in her late thirties, he said, flamboyant eyebrows, piercing green-blue eyes, fine-boned face, amused, arrogant, aristocratic. Dr. Leary, she said coolly, I've got to talk to you. She introduced herself to Leary as Mary Pinchot and told him, I've come from Washington to discuss something very important. I want to learn how to run an LSD session. I have this friend who's a very important man. He's impressed by what I've told him about my own LSD experiences and what other people have told him. He wants to try it himself, so I'm here to learn how to do it. I mean, I don't want to goof up or something. Leary invited her to bring her friend to Massachusetts for a couple of days, and he'd run a session with them. But Mary refused the idea, saying her friend was such a well-known public figure that he'd be impossible. People involved in power usually don't make the best subjects, Leary told her. Don't you think that if a powerful person were to turn on with his wife or girlfriend, it would be good for the world? Mary asked. Nothing that involves brain change is certain, Leary said, but in general we believe that, for anyone who's reasonably healthy and happy, the intelligent thing to do is to take advantage of the multiple realities available to the human brain. Later, while Leary and Mary were sharing a glass of wine, according to Leary, Mary said, You poor innocent thing. You have no idea what you've gotten into. You don't really understand what's happening in Washington with drugs, do you? Leary admits he'd said he'd heard rumors about the military. It's time you learned more, Mary said. The guys who run things, I mean the guys who really run things in Washington, are very interested in psychology, and drugs in particular. These people play hardball, Timothy. They want to use drugs for warfare, for espionage, for brainwashing, for control. Yes, Leary writes in 1983, describing what he knew in 1962 or before. We've heard about that. Teach us how to run sessions. Use drugs to do good, Mary said. 
Leary said he felt uneasy like that hit you get from people who live in the hard political world. There was something calculating about Mary. Still, apparently Leary did turn her on, and a couple of days later, he put her on the plane back to Washington. Six months passed before he saw her again. With no warning, she called him to a clandestine meeting in room 171 at the Ritz Hotel in Boston. "'Everything is going beautifully,' Leary reports, she said. "'On all fronts, in fact. I can't give details, of course, but top people in Washington are turning on. You'd be amazed at the sophistication of some of our leaders.' and their wives. We're getting a little group together, people who are interested in learning how to turn on. Leary repeated his doubts about getting high with power-oriented people, but Mary protested, saying that there were a lot of very smart people in Washington those days, but agreeing that power was important to them. And these drugs do give a certain power. That's what it's all about, freeing the mind. Until very recently, control of American consciousness was a simple matter for the guys in charge. The schools instilled docility. The radio and TV networks poured out conformity, Leary reports Mary saying. According to Leary, Mary told him that drugs were of the most vital interest to the power elite in Washington. She said that a few years before they, she was obviously talking about her husband's employers, had become absolutely obsessed with the notion that the Soviets and the Chinese were persuading our POWs in Korea to defect by brainwashing them with LSD and mescaline. There is yet no evidence that this was true. That's certainly possible, Leary quotes Leary saying. With what we've discovered about set and setting, we know that almost anyone's mind can be changed in any direction. Any direction? he says, Mary asked. With a minimum of information about the subject's personal life and two or three LSD sessions, you could get the most conventional person to do outrageous things. Suppose the person wanted to be brainwashed in a certain direction, wanted to change himself. Easier yet, Leary quotes himself, saying, Our research is conclusive on this. Changing your mind, developing a new reality fix, is a simple and straightforward proposition. Of course, altering your mind is one thing. Changing the outside world to conform to your new vision remains the difficult problem for us. Leary says he struggled with the word utopiates. Mary was delighted. I told you the first time I met, I wanted to learn how to brainwash. After talking with Leary about making it a better world, she again asked Leary to teach her how to brainwash. He said that didn't sound very ladylike, and she burst into laughter, saying, if I can teach the use of utopiates to the wives and mistresses of important people in our government, then we can... Well, shit, Timothy, don't you see what we can do? What, Leary says, he said. We can do on a bigger scale what you are already doing with your students. Use these drugs to free people. For peace, not war. We can turn on the cabinet, turn on the Senate, the Supreme Court. Do I have to explain further? One wonders who, besides Abby Hoffman, would have the courage to say something like that in public. The cryptocracy took Hoffman seriously when he threatened to dose New York City's water supply. Leary says his response was to feel scared. But come to think of it, it was close to what we Harvardites in our session rooms, lazily architecturing hopeful futures, had spelled out as the goal of psychedelic research. So Leary told her, what do you want from me, the drugs? Just a little bit to get started. With our connections, we'll be able to get all the supplies we want. And all you need, too. Mainly, I want advice about how to handle sessions and how to handle any problems that come up, Leary reports Mary, saying. Leary describes giving her a cram course on psychedelic sessions. Then he drove her to the airport to catch a plane back to D.C. Tim Leary and Richard Alpert were fired from Harvard in 1963 ostensibly for giving LSD to an undergraduate, but basically because they were giving it indiscriminately to just about anyone who asked, and the news got out. A controversy over the nature of their research exploded into headlines, so Leary and company retreated to Mexico, where they attempted to carry on LSD experiments outside the purview of the press or do-gooders in local government. In June of 1963, they ran afoul of even the notoriously corrupt Mexican government and were expelled from that country for engaging in activities not permitted to a tourist. From Mexico, they moved to a huge estate outside of Millbrook, New York, which was owned by Margaret Mellon Hitchcock and her sons, Tommy and Billy. It may have been mere coincidence that the father of Tommy and Billy, Tommy Hitchcock Sr., 
an air ace of World War I who lost his life in 1943 over England, was connected to the highest levels of U.S. intelligence. And there are more suspicious circumstances, which might be explored at another time, which could indicate that the Hitchcocks were very tight with the elements of the cryptocracy. With Hitchcock's support, Leary, Metzner, Alpert, and company established the International Federation for Internal Freedom, later to be called the Castalia Foundation. These organizations served as a platform for Leary to propagandize for LSD, which, he now claimed, could save the world from nuclear perdition by blowing the mind. In late November 1963, just after Leary had returned from Mexico, a phone call came from Mary Pinchot. With urgency in her voice, she insisted on seeing him. Oh, you reckless Irishman, she said. You got yourself in trouble again. It's magnificent, these headlong cavalry charges of yours. Mais ce n'est pas la guerre. What I do wrong, Leary says, he said. Publicity. I told you they'd let you do anything you want as long as you kept it quiet. The plan to set up psychedelic training centers around the country was ingenious from all sides. They would have infiltrated every chapter to get some of their people trained. But they're not going to let CBS film you drugging people on a lovely Mexican beach. You could destroy both capitalism and socialism in one month with that sort of thing, Leary says Mary said. Leary says he was struck by the brittleness Mary had picked up from, and here Leary knows of what he speaks, turning admirable phrases in the process. Those stern-eyed, business-suited wasps who shuttle from home to office in limousines, the information brokers, editors, board members, executive branch officials, youngish men with oldish eyes, faces you used to see around Harvard Square or in the Yale Quad, initiated early into the Calvinist conspiracy, sworn to the forever reliable, working for Wild Bill Donovan in Zurich, for Alan Dulles in Washington, for Henry Lucci as bureau chiefs, and then shuffling from Newsweek to the Post, manipulators of secret documents, facts, rumors, estimates, arms inventories, stock margins, voting blocks, industrial secrets, gossip about the sexual and drug preferences of every member of Congress, trained to grab and maintain what they can, all loyal to the Protestant belief that the planet Earth sucks. Mary was scared. She burst into tears. You must be very careful now. Don't make any waves. No publicity. I'm afraid for you. I'm afraid for all of us. Leary tried to calm her, inviting her back to the big house on the estate in Millbrook. I know what you're thinking, but this is not paranoia. I've gotten mixed up in some dangerous matters. It's real. You've got to believe me, Leary says she glared at him. Do you? The next call from Mary came the day after the assassination of Jack Kennedy. I had really been expecting it, Leary says. He could hardly understand her. He said she thought she was either drugged or stunned with grief. Leary says Mary Pinchot Meyer said, They couldn't control him anymore. He was changing too fast. He was learning too much. They'll cover everything up. I gotta come see you. I'm scared. I'm afraid. Be careful. That was the last time Leary heard from Mary. He kept waiting for her to call again, but she never did. He didn't know what happened to her until he saw an article in the New York Times. Woman painter shot and killed on Canal Towpath in Capitol. Mrs. Mary Pinchot Meyer was a friend of Mrs. Kennedy. Suspect is arraigned. Mary had been shot twice in the left temple and once in the chest at 12.45 in the afternoon of October 13, 1964. Dressed in a sweat suit, she had been walking alone along the old Chesapeake and Ohio Canal towpath in Georgetown. A friend told reporters that she sometimes walked there with her close friend Jacqueline Kennedy. Mary's brother-in-law was the Washington Bureau Chief of Newsweek, Benjamin C. Bradley. It was he who identified her body. The article described Bradley as having been an intimate of the late President Kennedy. The Times article also mentioned Mary's ex-husband, Cord Meyer Jr., identifying him as a former leader of the American Veterans Committee and the World Federalists, now a government employee. The CIA, of course, was not mentioned. Police said that the motive was apparently robbery or assault. Her purse was found in her home. The suspect, a black male, was held without bail. Distraught over the news of Mary's death, Leary asked his well-connected friend, Van Wolf, to see what he could find out. Wolf had been movie mogul Mike Todd's partner in business, and his attractive young wife was a Rothschild. 
Over the years, Wolf had developed an incredible network of friends in high places. Police intelligence knew all about the Mary Pinchot Meyer case, Wolf said. Apparently, a lot of people are convinced it was an assassination. Two slugs in the brain and one in the body. That's not the M.O. of a rapist, and a mugger isn't going to shoot a woman with no purse in her hand. James Truitt, the source for this sensational story, was identified as a former assistant to Philip Graham, publisher of the Washington Post. In interviews with the National Enquirer, Associated Press, and the Washington Post, Truett revealed that a woman named Mary Pinchot Meyer had conducted a two-year love affair with President John Kennedy and had smoked marijuana with him in a White House bedroom. A confidant of Mary Meyer, Truett told a Post correspondent that she and Kennedy met about 30 times between January 1962 and November 1963, when Kennedy was assassinated. Mary Meyer told Truett that JFK had remarked, This isn't like cocaine. I'll get you some of that. Truett claimed that Mary Meyer kept a diary of her affair with the president, which was found after her death by her sister, Tony Bradley, and turned over to James Angleton, chief of CIA counterintelligence, who took the diary to CIA headquarters and destroyed it. According to the Post, another source confirmed that Mary Meyer's diary was destroyed. The source said the diary contained a few hundred words of vague reference to an unnamed friend. Mary Meyer's sister was quoted by the Associated Press as saying, I knew nothing about it when Mary was alive. The article, Leary says, also revealed that the former husband of Mary Pinchot Meyer was Cord Meyer Jr., one of the most influential officials in the CIA, the only agent who had been awarded the Distinguished Intelligence Medal three times. Leary frequently smoked marijuana and took LSD himself. His speeches, which were, and still are, addressed to overflow audiences, were tailor-made for true believers in the new drug cult. Leary issued many public statements on the benefits of LSD to the individual and society. Always pretending to be politically naive, he predicted that there would come a day when a new profession of psychedelic guides will inevitably develop to supervise these experiences. Finally, in the mid-60s, Leary coined his famous slogan, Turn on, tune in, drop out, and spoke at college lectures to the legions of young people who had illegally experimented with LSD and other psychedelic substances. Through magazine interviews, television appearances, movies, records, and books, Leary projected himself as the culture hero of a new generation which was fighting for an individual's right to alter his own consciousness. A right, Leary then maintained, which was guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States. A declassified CIA memo dated November 1, 1963, features Dr. Leary, Dr. Richard Alpert, and their organization which advocated the expansion of consciousness through psychedelic chemicals, the International Federation for Internal Freedom, IFIF. In alarming tones, the memo ordered all CIA groups involved in mind control operations to report if any agency personnel were involved with either Leary or Alpert or IFIF. The responses to this in-house memo have not yet been released by the CIA. By 1968, society seemed to become divided into those who had taken psychedelic drugs and those who hadn't. Eventually, LSD, marijuana, and cocaine were available on street corners and schoolyards throughout the land. The cryptocracy had covertly supported Leary and Associates, and the snowballing effects of their LSD propaganda now caused an apparent reversal of policy. Was it that LSD and the other psychoactive drugs were politically dangerous, in that they suspended the conditioning of people, if only temporarily, long enough to see the lies they were being fed? Was it that they suspended the conditioning long enough for people to see through the indoctrination of the government, span the credibility gap, and the government propaganda for the Vietnam War? The acid heads began to act with visionary fervor, they started to actively criticize the war in Vietnam and call for many social reforms. The psychedelic revolution embarrassed the government at every turn. But if the government didn't deliberately create the psychedelic revolution, it certainly was responsible for shutting it down. It did this by controlling the availability and quality of drugs. The very underground LSD labs which the CIA had helped set up were raided. Then it wasn't long before the quality of LSD degenerated and the supply dried up. Several studies have shown that when LSD became illegal, 
pure LSD became scarce and the habits of the drug culture changed. Domestic counterintelligence agencies began to manipulate the press, trying to overcome all the favorable publicity psychedelics had received. A science article run in 1967, which claimed that LSD caused damage to chromosomes, proved to be untrue. The article was picked up and carried by the Journal of the American Medical Association, which warned of LSD-induced malformations, fetal loss, and mental retardation. This article was widely quoted even in the subculture press. In 1971, science ran a survey of all the available literature and concluded that LSD did not cause genetic damage. In 1969, Diane Linkletter jumped from a window to her death. Her father, talk show host Art Linkletter, blamed her death on the effects of LSD. It was murder, he said. She was murdered by the people who manufacture and sell LSD. LSD can kill. Linkletter got a lot of press and a private audience with President Nixon. In 1982, Linkletter told author Jeremy Alderson that there was never any proof that LSD was involved with his daughter's death. Rumors in the underground press had it that LSD caused flashbacks. Psychedelic sojourners of the 60s are still waiting for those flashbacks to happen. The Journal of Psychoactive Drugs did a survey which showed no more flashbacks from those that had taken LSD than from those who practiced yoga or other forms of meditation. But simultaneous with the negative press about LSD, the supply began to dry up, and large supplies of heroin mysteriously became available. It was strong heroin, imported from the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia, largely under CIA control. Many young people who had their consciousness expanded too far to distinguish between one drug and another turned to heroin. The government-inspired hysteria over drugs led many to think, well, they lied to us about pot, they must be lying about heroin. And so, when psychedelics were no longer easily obtained, and heroin was, many young people became addicts. The political visions of the psychedelic generation faded, as many who had turned on dropped out of city life and fled to the country. Those who stayed in the cities followed Leary's advice and dropped out from participation in the mainstream of the society. Many of them followed an alternate route in the American tradition by living as pushers and bootleggers, making large sums of money from the newly created demand for illegal drugs. In 1958, Dr. Louis Gottschalk, the CIA's independent contractor, had prepared a think tank report which suggested that the intelligence agencies might control people through addiction. Presaging the cunning behind the unwinnable war on drugs, Gottschalk's report put it this way, The addiction of a source to a drug which the interrogator could supply obviously would foster the dependence of the source on the interrogator. Where the source was addicted previous to the situation, the interrogator might find, already established, a pattern of evasion of laws and responsibilities which the addict had developed to meet his need for the drug in a society which proscribes its use. The report went so far as to recommend that wounded GIs who had become addicted to pain-killing drugs be recruited from hospitals. It stated, Where the source had become addicted in the setting as a sequel to the treatment of injuries, the ability of the interrogator to give or withhold the drug would give him a powerful weapon against the source. In the late 60s, when it became known that thousands of GI serving in Vietnam had become addicted to Laotian heroin, the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics tried sending a team of agents to Laos. But its investigations were blocked by the Laotian government, the State Department, and the CIA. While the Laotian government's hostility toward the Bureau is understandable, the reticence shown by the American government and the CIA requires some explanation. According to U.S. narcotics agents serving in Southeast Asia, the Bureau encountered a good deal of resistance from the CIA and the embassy when it first decided to open an office in Vietnam. Did this policy bear some relation to Gottschalk's think tank statement, made some 30 years earlier, to create an army of drug-dependent people who could be controlled by their suppliers, in this case the CIA? The CIA also contributed indirectly to the heroin traffic by training men who then turned to smuggling. In the 1974 Pulitzer Prize-winning study of the heroin trade by the staff and editors of Newsday, it was revealed the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, BNDD, agents in Miami, cross-checked a list of men who landed at the Bay of Pigs against police records. 
they found that at least 8% of the 1,500 man CIA trained force had subsequently been investigated or arrested for drug dealing. If it hadn't been for their CIA training, one BNDD agent was quoted as saying, some of these might never have gone into the smuggling business. He added that their training in paramilitary operations, weapons use, and smuggling of equipment and men from one place to another is well suited for illegal drug importing. The head of the Office of Strategic Intelligence at BNDD, John Warner, said, The key to heroin trafficking is the principle of compartmentability. It's the same way the CIA operates. Most people don't know what the whole project involves. Most just know their particular job. Former CIA agent Victor Marchetti was reported as stating, The CIA is implicated in the drug traffic in several countries. The mafia, thanks to the CIA, has a free hand in the vast opium traffic from Turkey through Italy to the United States. On July 19, 1975, Senator Charles H. Percy, a Republican from Illinois, released a letter charging that the CIA had the Justice Department drop a drug case to protect its own involvement in drugs. Percy's letter said that the CIA refused to give federal prosecutors evidence in a case against Putaporn Karam Kuran, a CIA employee, and one other person. Percy complained that, apparently, CIA agents are untouchable, however serious their crime or however much harm is done to society. The senator's letter said he had written the Justice Department to find out why charges were dropped against the two men, who were allegedly attempting to smuggle 59 pounds of opium into the United States from Thailand. The reply he received from Deputy Assistant Attorney General John C. Kenney stated that CIA Associate General Counsel John Greeney had insisted that there were other considerations at stake and that the material sought by the prosecutors would not be turned over. Kenney said Greeney had explained that if Karam Kruan and his associate went on trial, the situation could prove embarrassing because of Mr. Karam Kruan's involvement with CIA activities in Thailand, Burma, and elsewhere. The CIA knew that heroin causes no consciousness expansion. It brings on a physical feeling, a warm, glowing high, and then dullness and insulation. But the government was interested in behavior control, and heroin, like LSD, was an important tool in gaining such control. While some clandestine agencies of government were busy distributing drugs to pleasure-seeking underground America, in the laboratories they were studying drugs for their capacities to provide access to the mind for purposes of behavior control. Seeking the perfect incapacitating agent, army chemists at Edgewood Arsenal came up with a drug known as BZ, whose effects were ten times more powerful than LSD. Described as a hallucinogenic superdrug, BZ was said to be so powerful that a person who took it often experienced amnesia for long periods of time afterward. To test its effects, BZ was given to 2,490 volunteers. General Lloyd Fellins, former commander of the Edgewood facility, said that the purpose of the BZ experiment was to produce an incapacitating gas, sprayed from the sky as in the film Jacob's Ladder, or drug which could be placed in an enemy's water supply. Dr. Solomon Snyder, professor of psychiatry and pharmacology at Johns Hopkins University Medical School, had formerly worked at Edgewood. The Army's testing of LSD was just a sideshow compared to its use of BZ, Dr. Snyder said. Nobody can tell you for sure it won't cause a long-lasting effect. With an initial effect of 80 hours compared to 8 hours for LSD, you would have to worry more about its long-lasting or recurrent effects. Dr. George Agajanian, who had also worked at Edgewood, confirmed Snyder's opinion. With LSD, Agajanian explained, you tend to dwell on the experience and recall it, and that can lead to flashbacks. But with BZ, an amnesia occurs afterwards that blocks the experience out. Predicting the course of future events, Gottschalk's report stated, The volume of effort devoted to studying the behavioral effects of drugs has expanded tremendously in recent years and will probably continue to grow. In part, this may be attributed to the ready financial support such activities have achieved. The interest of scientists in employing drugs in research, however, transcends an interest in drug effects per se. Drugs constitute valuable tools for experimentation directed towards developing basic physiological and psychological knowledge. Work by scientists in several such areas in particular 
will increase knowledge of drugs which may be exploitable by interrogators. Gottschalk's conclusion was that drugs can operate as positive catalysts to productive interrogation, combined with the many other stresses in captivity that an individual may be obliged to undergo, drugs can add the factors aimed at weakening the resistance of the potential informant. But for many reasons, the use of drugs by an interrogator is not sure to produce valid results. The effects of drugs depend to a large extent on the personality makeup and physical status of the informant and the kind of rapport that the interrogator is able to establish with the informant. Knowing the predominating pharmacologic actions of a number of psychoactive drugs, an interrogating team might choose that chemical agent which is most likely to be effective in view of the informant's personality, physical status, and the various stressful experiences he has already undergone. This study, and subsequent ones, verified the fact that a number of drugs could conveniently be used to take over the human mind against the will of the individual. Through the use of drugs, the skilled mind controller could first induce a hypnotic trance. Then, one of several behavior modifications could be employed with amplified success. In themselves, without directed suggestions, drugs affect the mind in random ways. But when drugs are combined with classical conditioning and the language of hypnosis, an individual can be molded and manipulated beyond his own recognition. The government's interest in controlling minds and motivating involuntary behavior was focused not only on individuals, but also on large groups. Mass hypnosis and crowd psychology were well-known phenomena, and to that end, propaganda techniques had already been developed. But mass narcosis was a new concept out of which grew the idea of non-kill warfare, where vast populations could simultaneously, or in one action, be drugged into submission. In 1961, in an appearance before the Subcommittee on Science and Astronautics of the House of Representatives, Major General Marshall Stubbs, head of the Army Chemical Corps, gave a speech cautioning that we have not gone far enough in our research on these incapacitating compounds to be confident that they have real potential in warfare. We do not want to exaggerate claims for them to create the impression that we are on the verge of bloodless war. General Stubbs admitted, we are attempting to completely separate the incapacitating agents from the lethal agents so that any castigation normally given to toxic agents will not be associated with them, since they do not maim or kill. As a result, we hope to have a weapon which will give the commander much freer reign in its use as compared to the toxic agents. It is my hope that through the use of incapacitating agents, the free world will have a relatively clear and rapid means of both fighting and deterring limited war, which has come to the forefront in the international political scene in the last several years. It is one of the means by which we can maintain some degree of equality in the face of overwhelming manpower superiority of the communist-dominated nations. One idea consistently expressed in the utterances of government employees was the idea that we must beat the commies to the punch. To that end, the Army launched a crash programming investigating nerve gases, riot control gases, defoliants, herbicides, and biological agents such as anthrax, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and bubonic plague. It also developed what it called harassing agents, chemicals that cause headaches, vomiting, and severe pain. The idea was that one saboteur would be able to carry enough in his pocket to temporarily incapacitate the population of a city the size of New York. A two-suitor piece of luggage could hold enough drugs to disable every man, woman, and child in America. Most of the drugs the government experimented with were odorless, colorless, and tasteless, and therefore undetectable. They were easily soluble in water, and only slowly would they lose their potency in chlorinated water supplies. Food which came in contact with these chemicals remained contaminated for days unless thoroughly washed. The inhalation of particles of these drugs suspended in the air produced the same effects as ingestion. Dissolved, they could penetrate the skin and enter the bloodstream without having been ingested. The army assumed that a city exposed to such chemical attack would cease to function, the inhabitants so confused by the trip that the army could march into the city and take over, facing only minimal resistance. And the next day, the populace would return to normal consciousness and be fit to work for the occupying army. 
To test their assumption, the army gave a squad of soldiers LSD and coffee without their knowledge. After the drug effects began, the soldiers were ordered by their sergeant to perform normal and routine tasks while they were being filmed by a hidden camera. They could not follow even the simplest command nor accomplish the most ordinary task with an acceptable degree of competency. Two of the men simply giggled helplessly throughout the entire afternoon. As the platoon sergeant was not a coffee drinker, he did not receive the drug. Neither had he been told about the test. Accordingly, he grew more and more frustrated and perplexed as his men acted more and more erratically. Further studies indicated, however, that in actual warfare, things would not be that easy. Urban populations spend relatively little time out of doors. Since most of these drugs settled out of the atmosphere quickly and did not pass through air conditioning systems, they would therefore not affect everyone. If the water supply were lightly laced with a psychedelic, an individual would have to drink a pint of tap water before being affected. The concentration could be made heavier, enough so that one would only have to brush his teeth or wash his face before getting high, but with concentrations that large, even an infant's formula or a cup of tea would be a dangerous poison. Further, those exposed to minute amounts of these incapacitating agents might be able to fight off the symptoms. Those heavily dosed would suffer enormous mental distortions and could become wildly irrational. Mildly intoxicated persons might go about as if in a normal state, unaware that their judgment and motor skills were impaired. The resulting number of accidents would be monumental. The army pretended to shelve its plans for non-kill warfare, but the major obstacle, as they saw it, was only the drugs. It was not that they might kill the enemy, but that as of yet the army was unable to immunize its own troops against drug effects. Not until 1975 was a reliable LSD antidote developed. Chapter 6. The Guinea Pig Army In June 1975, it was revealed publicly for the first time what many had suspected, that the CIA and a number of government agencies under its direction had actually been giving behavior-influencing drugs to citizens within the United States for more than 20 years. I was in Washington at the time, searching the catalog card files at the National Technical Information Service. A previous search by friends in military intelligence of the MI Classified Index had revealed nothing but peripheral references to the object of my study, government research in drugs, hypnosis, behavior modification, and related subjects. The NTIS file is supposed to contain a complete numerical listing of all government contracts by contract number, whether or not they are classified. The contract cards were indeed numbered in consecutive order, but the ones I was looking for were missing. The index simply skipped over them and continued on in numerical sequence. Other cards in the index were marked classified, and I would not have been able to obtain the papers to which they referred. But the reports I was looking for were not even cited in the index, although references to them in scientific journals indicated that they had once existed. Classified or not, these documents had been removed from the record. That afternoon, press accounts of the Rockefeller report to the president on CIA activities said, beginning in the late 1940s, the CIA began to study the properties of certain behavior-influencing drugs, such as LSD, and how such drugs might be put to use in intelligence activities. Further, according to the report, the primary purpose of the drug program was to counter the use of behavior-influencing drugs clandestinely administered by an enemy, although several operational uses outside the United States were also considered. The drug program, the report went on to say, was part of a much larger CIA program to study possible means for controlling human behavior. Other studies explored the effects of radiation, electric shock, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, and harassment substances. As it would do two years later, the press played up the drug angle and ignored the other experiments. The CIA had actually been experimenting with all kinds of mind control techniques for 20 odd years. It gave me little comfort, but it reaffirmed my sanity to read in the report that, unfortunately, only limited records of these drug programs are now available. All the records concerning the program were ordered destroyed in 1973, including a total of 152 separate files. As I left NTIS, George Orwell's prophecy in 1984 came to mind. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. 
How long would it be before our society would perfectly mirror that state Orwell envisioned when he said, All that was needed was an unending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they called it. Double think. In Orwell's book 1984, the government continually changed its past by creating new historical fictions to justify its present. In 1975, I was wondering if we hadn't already gone beyond 1984, where, as Orwell said, truth is falsehood and ignorance is strength. Five days after the Rockefeller Report was released, the public flap began. The children of Dr. Frank Olson were informed by the DIA that their father had been the individual the report cited as the employee of the Department of the Army who was given LSD without his knowledge while he was attending a meeting with CIA personnel working on the drug project. Olson had died when he fell, jumped or otherwise exited from a 12th floor hotel window in New York while still under the influence of what was then billed as the most powerful mind-altering drug known to man. For 22 years, the cause of Olson's death had been concealed. His family had been led to believe that he had committed suicide because of a mysterious, unexplained mental breakdown. At no time after Olson's death was his family offered a true explanation of the real circumstances which had caused it. Eric, the eldest son of Dr. Olson, said, I'm very angry at the CIA because they let us grow up thinking our father had inexplicably committed suicide. Young Olson said that his family had decided to sue the government not only out of desire to collect monetary damages, but because we think there's more information involved in this. It's also a way of holding the CIA publicly accountable for what they did. The Olson family discovered that an individual damaged while in government employ cannot sue the government. But this didn't stop them. They asked the Senate to vote them a special bill of recompense for the death of the head of their household. On May 18, 1976, the full Senate approved Senate Bill 3035 by voice vote and sent it on to the House. Senate Bill 3035 specifically authorized appropriations totaling $1.25 million to be paid to the Olson family. The House of Representatives, being more conservative at the time, cut the Senate's generous award and the Olson family eventually received only $750,000. A similar case, tried in civil court, might have brought the Olson family as much as $3 million. Months before Olson plunged to his death, Harold Blower, a professional tennis player, died after being given repeated doses of experimental psychochemicals by the Army at New York State Psychiatric Institute in New York City. For years, the Blower family had been trying, to no avail, to find out the true cause of Harold Blower's death. In the wake of the Olson scandal, the Army relaxed its cover-up and finally surrendered Mr. Blower's medical file to his daughter, Mrs. Elizabeth Barrett. The chemical identities of the drugs he had received were not given. The drugs were listed only by number. The numbers were said to represent various hallucinogens, but because of national security, it has never been revealed what the chemicals were that killed Harold Blower. The crucial part of the Army's medical report stated, Pre-narcosis, apprehensive, considerable persuasion required, Injection administered at 9.53 a.m., post-narcosis. 9.59, subject so restless he has to be restrained by nurse, out of contact with reality, arms flailing, sweating profusely. 10.01, rapid oscillation of eyeballs. 10.11, body rigid all over. 10.15, stimulant administered. 10.20 to 11.45, deep coma. 11.50, artificial respiration administered. 12.15, Doctor pronounces subject dead. 12.30, hospital authorities notified. 3.30, body transferred to city morgue. Harold Blower died without ever knowing what drug he received, and from the words in the report, considerable persuasion required, it looks as though he hadn't volunteered either. Both Blower's and Olson's deaths were covered up by the excuse of national security. Their families were deliberately misled about the cause of death. No monetary compensation was offered except for the pensions or allotments due the families under normal circumstances. In the wake of these personal tragedies, increasing public pressure led other government agencies to make their confessions. The Army announced that since 1956, it had tested LSD on nearly 1,500 unwitting servicemen. The Army announced that since 1956, it had tested LSD on nearly 1,500 unwitting servicemen and on several thousand more volunteers, a total of 6,940 in all. 
At the same time the Army made this disclosure, it requested permission from the Defense Department to conduct further tests with at least two new drugs, drugs which were many times more powerful than LSD. Permission was granted with the stipulation that the guinea pigs be volunteers only. Within days of the Army's admission of drug testing, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare revealed that it had administered LSD to about 2,500 prisoners, mental patients, and paid volunteers between 1954 and 1968. Health, Education, and Welfare said further that it had given $7.5 million in grants to more than 30 university researchers who independently ran LSD tests on human subjects. What was not revealed until much later was that the CIA had used every possible military and civilian agency of government, as well as a number of universities and private research groups, to test LSD and other drugs, plus a whole array of psychotechnologies in an all-out search for reliable methods of controlling the human mind. But the CIA's record was pretty good, for out of all the thousands of individuals who were given LSD or other drugs without their knowledge, only three are known to have died. In 1955, a new drug testing program was begun at the Edgewood Army Chemical Center. Volunteer soldiers were recruited but were not told what drugs they would be given, nor that men had died as a result of similar experiments. They were told they'd suffer only temporary discomfort. 7,000 soldiers underwent the Edgewood Arsenal's tests. 585 men were given LSD. The rest were administered other unspecified drugs. Dr. Gerald Klee was one of the first psychiatrists to work on the drug testing program for the Army. When questioned by television crews as to how the volunteers had been recruited, he said that he didn't really know. They had come from all over the country, believing only that they were going to the chemical center to be used as subjects in chemical experiments. Most of them were not highly educated, and even if they had been told exactly what they were to be given, they wouldn't have understood it, Dr. Klee said. The advantage to them was time off to get away from some place they didn't want to be, to be near their family, girlfriends, whatever, and they had a pretty good life while they were there. As a matter of fact, they spent very little of their time in the experiments and had a lot of free time. Wendell Queen was an army sergeant in 1964 when he volunteered for the drug experiments at Edgewood. Years later, when the Olson case was made public, Mr. Queen tried to find out what drugs he had been given. He ran into a wall of security. The Army stated that it had no record that he was ever given drugs. But Sergeant Queen remembers differently. He had been given a drug that penetrated his skin, not through injection, but simply by being placed on his arm with an eyedropper. They just took a small drop and put it on my arm, and my arm became inflamed and kind of itchy, something like a bad mosquito bite, he said. He was not told what drug it was. He was told only that the effects would be temporary. Several hours afterwards, he began to float. I began to feel kind of happy, and the room started turning around, Sergeant Queen related. I had lost all my senses. I had no sense of balance or sense of the environment around me. Later on that night, I really got paranoid, and if anybody would come close to me, I would think that they were going to kill me. Sergeant Queen had flashbacks for several months after that experiment, when he would relive the states of mind he had experienced on that day. My roommate told me later that one night I woke up screaming and hollering, Don't kill me! Don't kill me! He said I became so violent that I began tearing my bed up, Sergeant Queen said. Sergeant Queen remembers that at Edgewood he tried making a joke about being a human guinea pig. The medic administering the test didn't appreciate his sense of humor. He said that the doctors were the only human guinea pigs around there because they took every new drug first. He said that they always got a bigger dose than anyone else ever did. According to the Army, their LSD testing program came to an end in 1967. An Army spokesman promised a follow-up study on the 585 men who had been given LSD, but actually carried it out with only 35 officers, and superficially at that. Still, the Army maintained that there had certainly been no LSD since Olson and Blower. Once again, it was not telling the whole truth. George Danald, a colonel at the Army Chemical School in Fort McClellan, Alabama, agreed to become a guinea pig in 1959. He believed in progress, and he believed that without experimentation and research, there could be no progress. Thus, when the opportunity presented itself to him, he readily submitted to an injection of what was said to be LSD. Immediately after he took the drug, according to his wife, his overall characteristics seemed to change, his attitude changed, mannerisms changed, 
and I'm sure a great deal more that I didn't notice at the time. A year after Colonel Danald's psychedelic experience, he was transferred to Edgewood Chemical Center. Every day it was his habit to pick up his daughter, Dawn, promptly after school. One day he didn't meet her, and Dawn walked to the officer's club looking for him. His car was in the parking lot, so, assuming her father was inside, she went into the club and asked if anyone had seen him. When nobody seemed to remember that he'd been there that day, she went up to their apartment on the floor above and knocked on his door. There was no answer, so she went in. The sitting room was littered with papers. She walked into the bedroom and noticed that the twin beds were apart. When she turned on the lights, she saw her father's body slumped at the foot of the bed. In shock, she went to her room next door and telephoned her mother, who was at work. Mommy, I found Daddy, she said. He's on the floor, and he looks awful white. Colonel Danald had been dead for five hours when Dawn found him. He had taken his own life by putting a twenty-five caliber bullet through his temple. The pistol was still in his hand. Colonel Danald did not have a history of mental instability. Until the time of his experience at Fort McClellan, he had never had a depressed moment. The only clue his family had to his apparent mental anguish was that a few months before he died, he had once threatened to kill himself in a family argument. No one had paid any attention to that since he had been such a stable person in the past. Mrs. Danald believes that her husband's death was caused by the mind-bending effects of the experiment, but she has so far been unable to prove her case. She and her family have received no compensation except the benefits which would normally accrue to a lifetime army officer. Mary Ray was a research assistant at a psychiatric hospital which held military contracts to test LSD from 1958 to 1969. She helped doctors conduct experiments on more than 900 people. Some of them were mental patients. In 1966, she offered herself for LSD testing. Her description is typical of a bum trip. I was in a state of becoming the universe. I became objects, she said. I was no longer a person. Then I got to a state of absolute terror. The closest thing I can remember being like that was as a child when I was given ether. It was the feeling like just before losing consciousness. But Mary was able to bring herself back from the LSD void. I realized that I was a person out of this billowing, black, seething weirdness, this horror. I looked down and I saw my arms, which were two white rivers with black threads, and they were my veins. I realized that, and I felt that if I tried really hard, somehow I could sever the veins. I realized, even though I was not really a person, that I could end all this living nightmare, this hell, by cutting my veins. Then I concentrated on this problem for what seemed centuries because time did not exist. It was a strange time distortion. I tried desperately to try to kill myself. There is no question in my mind that if I'd had some sort of sharp instrument and if I were alone, I would have killed myself. The doctors and medics were helpless. No one seemed to know how to handle the situation. No one knew what to do. It seemed like they were kids playing scientists. Mary Ray reported no amnesia and no recurring after effects. She never felt another overwhelming compulsion to commit suicide, nor any compulsion to keep her experience secret. In June of 1958, William F. Chaffin was a sergeant in the U.S. Air Force, stationed at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. He had been a basic training instructor in biological, chemical, and radiological warfare earlier in his career, and thought when he read the bulletin offering volunteers a 30-day tour of duty at Edward Arsenal that it would be easy duty. It would be a nice break in his dull routine and a 30-day leave at government expense. He assumed that he'd be involved in a program much like the one he'd taught in basic military training on chemical and biological warfare tactics and defenses. On September 10, 1975, before a joint session of the Senate Subcommittee on Health and the Senate Subcommittee on Administrative Practice and Procedure, Chafin testified to the lasting effects of his volunteer duty at Edgewood. He told the committee that upon his arrival at Edgewood, he was placed in a barracks with approximately 30 other volunteers. Daily, some of the volunteers were taken to various points on the base, given gas masks, and used in experiments involving DDT and other relatively mild chemicals. But at first, Chaffin was simply ordered to report to a certain station each morning, and then he would be released for the remainder of the day to pursue his own interests. Today, Chaffin cannot say with any certainty how long this procedure went on. He can't remember whether he was there for one week, two weeks, or three weeks before he was actually used in a test. 
At some point around the middle of the month, July 1958, Chaffin told the committee, myself and four or five other individuals were taken to a hospital on the base. We were, at that time, taken into a room, and a psychologist or psychiatrist, I cannot remember which, who I believe was associated with the University of Maryland, informed us that we would be administered a drug or a substance in distilled water. We were further informed that this drug or substance would be odorless, tasteless, and colorless. We were asked to perform certain tests prior to the ingestion of the substance. My best recollection of these tests is that we were simply asked to estimate certain amounts of elapsed time by any means other than a watch or clock. We were then taken back to our various wards, and a short time thereafter, I was given a beaker of colorless, odorless, and tasteless substance by an orderly or an attendant. I have no recollection whatsoever that I was informed of the nature or qualities of the substance. Certainly no reference was made to any possibility of detrimental psychological or physical effects on myself or my future family by taking of the substance. I cannot estimate adequately the length of time that elapsed after I took the drug until I first began to notice the effects, but my best recollection is that it was in the nature of one half hour. At that time, I remember being taken back to the psychiatrist or psychologist and again asked to estimate various lengths of time by any means except observing a clock or watch. It is extremely difficult for me to describe adequately what occurred in the next hours of that day. I have, to this day, distinct recollections of vivid and colorful events that made no sense whatsoever to me. I have distinct recollections of either myself hallucinating or other individuals hallucinating and imagining that they were seeing certain objects and things. I do not recall if they were in fact hallucinating or if I was simply imagining they were. I was obsessed with a feeling that I can only describe as utter and total depression. I don't think these words adequately convey the meaning of that which I experienced, but I simply do not have the words to set forth the occurrences of that day. Later, I was released from the hospital. I cannot recall if this was after a period of 12 hours, 24 hours, or 36 hours or more. It is simply impossible to adequately determine what lengths of time elapsed. Shortly thereafter, Chaffin returned to his base. His life returned to its usual routine, but for some reason he found it extremely difficult to talk to anyone. He could not even bring himself to tell his wife about his Edgewood experience. Since that time, Chaffin said, I have experienced what I believe to be LSD flashbacks on at least three separate occasions. The feelings that encompassed me on those three different occasions were again what I can only describe as a total depression accompanied by a nearly uncontrollable desire to take my life. Extensive research has shown that there is no more chance of flashbacks with LSD than with alcohol. After Chaffin's return, his wife became pregnant. In November of 1958, she miscarried. The Chaffin's doctor informed them that in all likelihood the fetus had been deformed. I do not know at this time if this was attributable to LSD which I was administered at Edgewood, Maryland, or not. We do not at this time know if various other problems which have arisen in one of my children are directly attributable to LSD or not. Conversely, we do not at this time know that there is no relation. Actually, there is no scientific evidence that ingestion of even large amounts of LSD-25 can cause genetic malformation. There is only evidence that if laboratory animals and eggs are saturated with a pure concentration of LSD, chromosomal damage can occur. Dr. Jolene West did manage to kill an elephant with a huge dose of LSD at Oklahoma University, but that's about as far as the lethal studies ever went. After the ingestion of the substance in July of 1958, Chaffin said, my personality and behavior began to change. After seven years of marriage, I was certainly not an individual that tended to depression. However, after an ingestion of LSD, I have undergone, as I mentioned earlier, several occasions of the same total and extreme depression that occurred when I was given the LSD initially. Additionally, my wife has related to me one incident that occurred and which I have no recollection of whatsoever. This incident involved my actually taking a gun and attempting to leave our home for the purpose of taking my own life. Then Chaffin told the Joint Committee, I would like to state for the record that I believe that the United States Air Force was always extremely fair to me in my military career. I enjoyed my military career and consider myself to be a loyal member of the United States Air Force retired. I must also state that the trauma that I have undergone as a result of being surreptitiously administered this drug 
is something I consider to be totally out of keeping with my concept of the service. I can only hope that the committee will take every means available to make sure that the other individuals who are administered LSD receive notification and help. Army records show that William Cheffin was given a drug known only as EA-1729 on August 5, 1975, after the Olson disclosure, Chaffin wrote a letter to the Army stating that he thought he might have been given LSD. He requested the medical follow-up the Army had promised. Michael V. Johnston of the Army Surgeon General's office responded to his letter. In checking our records, Johnston wrote, we find that you did receive LSD in the Army research program. Medical consultants in the office of the Surgeon General are now making plans for a follow-up study of persons who took LSD. You will be contacted within the next two months and invited to be examined. Chaffin was called in for a physical subsequently, but he feels the examination was inadequate. He has only the Army's word that the drug he received was LSD. Probably it was not. LSD is not known for its abilities to induce amnesia, to cause depression, or to place a lock on the tongue. If anything, LSD could be used in interrogation to loosen the mind and the tongue. Until that day in Edgewood, William Chaffin always had a firm grip on reality. Either he was given one of several drugs far more powerful than LSD, and with different properties to affect the mind, or he was given LSD and put through some extreme behavior modification procedure which programmed him to remain silent, and later, after his connection with the Edgewood experiment had been severed, to wish to take his own life. Chapter 7. The M.K. Ultrans Following the release of the Rockefeller Report, John D. Marks, author and former staff assistant to the State Department Intelligence Director, filed a Freedom of Information Act appeal on behalf of the Center for National Security Studies requesting documentation from the CIA. I filed an identical request at about the same time. Marx and I both requested documentation for the evidence cited in the Rockefeller Report on the CIA's mind control activities conducted within the United States. Seven months later, Marx was given more than 2,000 pages of top-secret and eyes-only documents by the CIA's Information Review Committee. A short time later, I began to receive what Marx had gotten. These pages were said to be the bulk of the information upon which the Rockefeller Commission had based its report. Exempted from release were portions of, or entire documents, which contained information said by CIA officials to pertain to intelligence sources and methods which the Director of the Central Intelligence has the responsibility to protect from unauthorized disclosure, pursuant to Section 102D-3, pursuant to Section 102 of the National Security Act of 1947. But in the photocopied pages obtained was a statement to the effect that within a few hours of his resignation, forced by the disclosures of the Watergate and Church Committees, Director Richard Helms ordered the records shredded and burned. The remaining documents, which were judged by the CIA to be safe to keep for subsequent release, were all highly sanitized. They contained few names of participating individuals or organizations, and none of the details of the long-range experiments designed to mold and control the minds of American citizens. In addition to offering a superficial review of the CIA's involvements in research on mind control, the documents Marx obtained gave the agency's own officially censored version of what had happened to Dr. Frank Olson. According to the CIA, at a liaison conference with Fort Detrick personnel at Deep Creek Lake, Maryland, on the 18th and 19th of November, 1953, Dr. Olson and seven other men were given LSD in glasses of Cointreau, an orange-flavored liqueur. The unsuspecting guinea pigs were told 20 minutes later that they had been given LSD. Olson suffered serious after-effects, and later the same day, he was sent, at CIA expense, to New York City with an escort, Dr. Robert Lashbrook. There he was taken to see a psychiatrist, Dr. Harold A. Abramson. After five days of observation and treatment, Dr. Abramson decided that Olson had to be hospitalized. Arrangements were made for his admittance to a private sanitarium near Rockville, Maryland. Following that consultation with Abramson on November 22nd, Olson and Lashbrook returned to their rooms at the Statler Hotel and retired for the evening. At 2.30 a.m. the next morning, Lashbrook was awakened by a loud crash. According to the Eyes Only investigation report, he went into Olson's bedroom and found him missing. 
The window, glass and all, and the blinds were also missing. Lashbrook assumed that Olson had dived through them. Before Lashbrook notified the hotel desk, he called Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, the chief medical officer of the CIA drug project, and informed him of Olson's fate. Lashbrook then called the desk man, who called the police. When the police from the 14th Precinct arrived, Lashbrook told them that Olson was employed by the U.S. Army. He also told them that he, too, was a government employee and a friend of Olson's, but nothing else. Police, however, found Lashbrook in possession of government identification, including a CIA badge, and made note of this identifying data. The CIA and the Department of Defense quickly took over liaison with the police and succeeded in covering up the cause of Olson's suicide. Three months later, CIA Director Alan W. Dulles wrote three notes of reprimand and sent them to the Chiefs of the Technical Services Staff, Technical Operations, and Chemical Division. The eyes only reprimand to the Chief of the Chemical Division said, I have personally reviewed the files from your office concerning the use of a drug on an unwitting group of individuals. In recommending the unwitting application of the drug to your superior, you apparently did not give sufficient emphasis to the necessity for medical collaboration and for proper consideration of the rights of the individual to whom it was being administered. This is to inform you that it is my opinion that you exercised poor judgment in this case. It was signed, Sincerely, Alan W. Dulles, Director. In 1975, President Gerald Ford apologized to the Olson family on behalf of the government and made a monetary settlement. The Olson case was also the subject of congressional investigations and a government-appointed commission, which found that there was no evidence of homicide. There was no change of operations. The research on mind control continued unabated. The cover-up continued. The official story was Olson fell, but the family of Frank Olson always suspected that he was pushed because he had become a security risk. According to his son, Eric Olson, the normally cheerful researcher sank into a deep depression after the CIA slipped acid into his drink. He told his wife he had made a terrible mistake and wanted to quit his job. Nine days later, he was dead. Eric Olson is now a psychologist who has access to any number of people working within the cryptocracy. In 1994, Eric and his brother Niels had the 40-year-old remains of their father exhumed. The body was found in a mummified condition. The CIA said that it had no reason to think that Olson's death was a homicide, but the sons had the body sent to the nation's top forensic pathologists who would try to determine if Frank Olson was dead before he hit the New York City pavement. It's been a pressing question for me all the time, and the questions certainly were not laid to rest with the CIA story in 1975, Eric said. The remains are in exceedingly fine condition, and that's attributable to the embalming done in New York and to the container, said James E. Stars, professor of law and forensic sciences at George Washington University. We have remains that are in mummified condition. We even have the opportunity to get fingerprints. Forensic experts analyzed hair, brain tissue, fingernails, and bones for injuries not attributable to the fall, Stars said. They looked for toxins and drugs, including LSD and other hallucinogens. The chairman of the Behavioral Science Department at York College, Dr. John S. Levisky, examined the skeleton. Stars found new forensic evidence which suggested that Olson may have landed on his feet, shattering both legs and causing massive internal trauma that would have led to death in minutes. But curiously, Stars found so many fractures in the skull that it is not possible that he received this type of injury simply from falling out of a window. It would not be possible unless he were on a trampoline. You don't bounce around like that. When you hit pavement, you hit pavement. Stars also found no evidence of cuts from smashing through the glass window, which were reported in the original autopsy. Stars characterized the new evidence as sinister, but decided, as of September 1994, to hold off his concluding remarks pending toxicological results and a final inquiry. After toxicological results were turned in, in November, Stars said, I am exceedingly skeptical of the view that Dr. Olson went through that window on his own. The CIA issued a hasty statement saying that it will cooperate fully if the case is reopened, saying that if the private investigation has uncovered new evidence, it should be brought to the attention of the authorities.
Stars singled out the presence of several bruises on Olson's skull that suggested he may have been smashed on the head before he plunged 173 feet at 65 miles per hour to his death on the sidewalk below. The criminal and dishonorable ways of the CIA again surface. Despite congressional hearings, despite exposure in the press, despite presidential apologies, Operation Mind Control continued. According to the documents, the CIA mind control program was run under four different project names. In 1949, the Office of Scientific Intelligence, OSI, undertook the analysis of foreign work on certain unconventional warfare techniques, including behavioral drugs, with an initial objective of developing a capability to resist or offset the effect of such drugs. Preliminary phases included the review of drug-related work at institutions such as Mount Sinai Hospital, Boston Psychopathic Hospital, University of Minnesota, Valley Forge General Hospital, Detroit Psychopathic Clinic, Mayo Clinic, and the National Institute of Health. This first project, codenamed Project Bluebird, was assigned the function of discovering means of conditioning personnel to prevent unauthorized extraction of information from them by known means. It was further assigned to investigate the possibility of control of an individual by application of special interrogation techniques, memory enhancement, and establishing defensive means for preventing interrogation of agency personnel. A number of the survivors of Operation Mind Control have been tattooed with bluebirds. Several think that this was a mark of rank, that it meant they had received special bluebird programming and could be accessed with certain triggers. This has not yet been sufficiently tested to my knowledge. In August 1951, Project Bluebird was renamed Project Artichoke and was subsequently transferred from the Office of Scientific Intelligence, OSI, to the Office of Security, OS. OSI, however, retained the responsibility for evaluating foreign intelligence aspects of Artichoke. In 1953, the OSI proposed that experiments be undertaken to test LSD on agency volunteers. Records do not indicate, however, whether or not such experiments were made. According to the information released, OSI's involvement in Project Artichoke ceased in 1956. The emphasis originally given Artichoke by the OS became focused on the use of drugs such as sodium pentothal in connection with interrogation techniques and with the polygraph. During this period, there was an informal group known as the Artichoke Committee, which had representatives from the OSI, OS, medical services, and technical services. True to form, only brief records were kept, so that the details of the exchanges of this committee are still secret. A CIA memo to the Director of Central Intelligence dated July 14, 1952, cited a successful application of narco-hypnotic interrogation undertaken by a team of representatives from the CIA. This memo revealed that by that date, two successful interrogations had already been conducted using drugs and hypnosis. The subjects were Russian agents suspected of being double agents. The cover was called psychiatric medical. They were admitted to a hospital. The control methods were by narcosis, by hypnosis, and by a combination of both. The subjects were regressed by hypnosis and made to relive past experiences. When the interrogation was completed, post-hypnotic suggestion succeeded in giving the subjects amnesia of the actual interrogations. The interrogations were regarded by the CIA as being very successful. In each case, the CIA memo read, a psychiatric medical cover was used to bring the artichoke techniques into action. In the first case, light dosages of drugs coupled with hypnosis were used to induce a complete hypnotic trance. This trance was held for approximately one hour and 40 minutes of interrogation with a subsequent total amnesia produced by post-hypnotic suggestion. In the second case, an individual of much higher intelligence than the first, a deep hypnotic trance was reached after light medication. This was followed by an interrogation lasting for well over an hour. However, a partial amnesia only was obtained at this time, although a total amnesia was obtained for a major part of the test. Since further interrogation was desired, a second test was made on this individual in which the artichoke technique of using a straight medication was employed. On this test, highly successful results were obtained in that a full interrogation lasting 2 hours and 15 minutes was produced, part of which included a remarkable regression. During this regression, the subject actually relived certain past activities of his life, 
some dating back 15 years, while in addition, the subject totally accepted Mr. Deleted, the case officer and interpreter at this time, as an old, trusted, and beloved personal friend whom the subject had known in years past in Georgia, USSR. Total amnesia was apparently achieved for the entire second test on this case. The memo revealed that sodium pentothal and the stimulant desoxin were the drugs used to aid the hypnotic trance. The memo continued, For a matter of record, the case officers involved in both cases expressed themselves to the effect that the artichoke operations were entirely successful, and team members felt that the tests demonstrated conclusively the effectiveness of the combined chemical hypnotic technique in such cases. In both cases, the subjects talked clearly and at great length and furnished information which the case officers considered extremely valuable. According to the agency inspector General Chamberlain, there is reference in papers in the records held by the Office of Security of something referred to as an artichoke team traveling overseas in 1954, with indications of operational applications to individuals representing a communist bloc country. There is no record of the operation or its results. A summary of a conference on July 15, 1953, offered a clue to other kinds of operations conducted under artichoke. The report, addressed to the Chief of Security, CIA, said, Mr. Deleted, then discussed the situation of a former agency official who had become a chronic alcoholic and who at the present time was undergoing operative treatment in, Deleted, for a possible brain tumor. This individual had called the agency prior to the operation and warned that when given certain types of anesthetics, sodium pentothal, previously he had been known to talk coherently. The matter was taken care of by placing a representative in the operating room and by bringing the various personnel participating in the operation under the secrecy agreement. Mr. Deleted stated that the subject did talk extensively under the influence of sodium pentothal and revealed internal problems of the agency. Dr. Deleted added that he was acquainted with the details in the case. Deleted then commented that this type of thing had been a source of great concern to himself and others in the operation's work and stated that he hoped that the artichoke efforts to produce some method that would perhaps guarantee amnesia on the part of those knowing of agency operations in vital spots would be successful. He stated that some individuals in the agency had to know tremendous amounts of information, and if any way could be found to produce amnesias for this type of information, for instance, after the individual had left the agency, it would be a remarkable thing. Mr. Deleted stated that the need for amnesia was particularly great in operations work. Mr. Deleted and Mr. Deleted both explained that work was continually being done in an effort to produce controlled amnesia by various means. Mr. Deleted called attention to the fact that at the preceding conference, Colonel Deleted had advanced the idea of testing new methods, new chemicals, and new techniques, and combinations thereof, on certain carefully selected employees of the agency, probably individuals in the training groups. One of the documents John Marks obtained was dated July 30, 1956. Under the heading, Schizophrenic Agent, the memo stated that Bobo Capnine, an alkaloid, could cause catatonia or stupor from its effects on the central nervous system and the cerebral cortex. The report stated, We desire to have certain psychochemical properties tested on man using the bulbocapnine, which we were fortunate to obtain from, deleted, a sample being enclosed herewith. More bulbocapnine is available if needed. Along with the sample was the request that subjects be tested for loss of speech, loss of sensitivity to pain, loss of memory, and loss of willpower. Another memo in 1956 authorized psychiatrists in universities and state penitentiaries, names were deleted, to test these drugs on unwitting subjects. An even earlier memo said it was essential to find an area where large numbers of bodies would be used for research and experimentation. Doctor, deleted, stated that in connection with the testing of drugs, he was quite certain a number of psychiatrists all over the United States would be willing to test new drugs, especially drugs that affect the mind. Artichoke evolved to become Project MK Ultra, which, according to CIA documents, was an umbrella project for funding sensitive projects, approved by Alan Dulles on April 3, 1953. Cryptonym MK Delta covered policy and procedure for use of biochemicals in clandestine operations. Besides drugs, 
MK Delta and MK Ultra experimented with radiation, electroshock, psychology, psychiatry, sociology, anthropology, harassment substances, and what were called paramilitary devices and materials. Contacts were made with individuals at prominent hospitals and drug safe houses under Bureau of Drug Abuse control. Through the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, BNDD, and federal institutions such as prisons, drugs could be administered to unsuspecting individuals. 139 different drugs, including various amnesia potions, were first tested under laboratory conditions, see Appendix B. Then, beginning in 1955, the most promising drugs were given to unwitting subjects in normal social situations, through the informal arrangement made between the CIA and BNDD. The CIA Inspector General's report indicates that this part of the mind control program was terminated in 1963, but that a project to test various drugs in an inquiry into improvement of learning ability and memory retention did continue until 1972. Document 32 in the MK Ultra file sheds a more direct light on the CIA's involvement in mind control research. The memorandum for the record was written by an unidentified intelligence officer. It is reproduced below in its entirety. 17 January 1975. Memorandum for the record, subject MK Ultra. The following represents the best of my unaided recollection regarding the MK Ultra program. I was first briefed on it in 1962. At that time, it was in the process of a significant decrease in activity and funding. As Chief Defense and Espionage, CDNE, I continued to decrease funds significantly each year until the program was phased out in the late 1960s. 2. MK Ultra was a group of projects, most of which dealt with drug or counter-drug research and development. The Director Central Intelligence, DCI, and the Deputy Director of Plans, DDP, were kept informed on the program via annual briefings by Chief Technical Services Division, CTSD, or his deputy. Most of the research and development was externally contracted and dealt with various materials which were purported to have characteristics appealing for their covert or clandestine administration under operational conditions. The objectives were behavioral control, behavior anomaly production, and countermeasures for opposition application of similar substances. Work was performed at U.S. industrial, academic, and governmental research facilities. Funding was often through cutout arrangements. Testing was usually done at such time as laboratory work was successfully completed and was often carried out at such facilities as the deleted and deleted. In all cases that I am aware of, testing was done using volunteer inmates who were witting of the nature of the test program, but not the ultimate sponsoring organization. Number three, as the Soviet drug use scare and the amount of significant progress in the MK Ultra program decreased, the program activities were curtailed significantly as budgetary pressure and alternate priorities dictated. Four, over my stated objections, the MK Ultra files were destroyed by the order of DCI, Mr. Helms, shortly before his departure from office. CI officer, by authority of 102702. As for the unidentified intelligence officer's claim that the experiments, in all cases that I am aware of, were performed on volunteer and witting subjects, one can only suggest that this man may not have had the need to know about the unwitting subjects. Records of court proceedings indicate that many guinea pigs in federal institutions were not fully informed of the long-range consequences of drug-enhanced behavior modification. One such experiment on human guinea pigs conducted at the California Medical Facility at Vacaville involved the use of the drug anectine, a strong muscle relaxant, which leaves the victim totally without involuntary muscle control. The body lets loose its waist, breathing stops, and without proper attendance, death can result. Whether or not the subject dies, he experiences the feeling that he is dying. According to Chief Vacaville psychiatrist Dr. Arthur Nugent, anectine induces sensations of suffocation and drowning. The subject experiences feelings of deep horror and terror, as though he were on the brink of death. While in this condition, a self-styled therapist scolds him for his misdeeds and tells him to reform or expect more of the same. Dr. Nugent told the San Francisco Chronicle, Even the toughest inmates have come to fear and hate the drug. I don't blame them. I wouldn't have one treatment myself for the world. 
Writing about the anectine therapy program, Jessica Mitford noted that of those given the drug, nearly all could be characterized as angry young men. Yet some seem to have been made even angrier by the experience, for the researchers said that of 64 prisoners in the program, nine persons not only did not decrease, but actually exhibited an increase in their overall number of disciplinary infractions. Experimentation with drugs and behavior modification became so widespread in prisons and mental institutions that in the middle and late 1960s, court dockets became crowded with lawsuits filed on behalf of the human guinea pigs who were victims of such research. By 1971, the number of lawsuits had reached such proportions that the Senate Subcommittee on Constitutional Rights began an investigation. Three years later, the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, chaired by Senator Sam Irvin, released a report entitled Individual Rights and the Federal Role in Behavior Modification. It was largely ignored by the press, yet it revealed some interesting information. Two years before the CIA and its subcontractors owned up to their mind-dabbling, a large number of behavior modification projects were already underway. The report disclosed that 13 projects were run by the Defense Department, the Department of Labor had conducted several experiments, the National Science Foundation conducted a substantial amount of research dealing with understanding human behavior, even the Veterans Administration participated in psychosurgery experiments, which, in many cases, were nothing more than an advanced form of lobotomy. One of the largest supporters of behavior research was the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and its sub-agency, the National Institute of Mental Health. The subcommittee said the HEW had participated in a very large number of projects dealing with the control and alteration of human behavior. Largest of all the supporters of behavior modification was the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, LEAA, which, under the Department of Justice, funded hundreds of behavior modification experiments. All the above agencies were named in secret CIA documents as those who provided research cover for MKUltra. The subcommittee found that controls and guidelines, where they existed, were at best loose. The poorly organized and loosely accountable research operations included not only traditional conditioning techniques, but also more advanced modifiers such as chemotherapy, aversive therapy, neurosurgery, stress assessment, electric shock, and the well-known form of psychological indoctrination, popularly called brainwashing. Another of the documents released to John Marks was one dated February 10, 1951, entitled Defense Against Soviet Mental Interrogation and Espionage Techniques. It began, International treaties or other agreements have never controlled the experimental development and actual use of unconventional methods of warfare, such as devices for subversive activities, fiendish acts of espionage, torture and murder of prisoners of war, and psychological duress and other unethical persuasive actions in the interrogation of prisoners. According to this document, the Technical Services Division of the CIA contracted with officials of what was then known as the Bureau of Narcotics to have mind-influencing drugs given to unwitting subjects. The CIA felt that the drugs needed to be tested in normal life settings so that the full capabilities to produce disabling or discrediting effects of the drugs would be known. With the full approval of Alan W. Dulles, an arrangement had been made with the Bureau of Narcotics whereby the CIA financed and established safe houses in which federal narcotics agents could dispense the drugs and record the reactions of those who took them. No CIA men were present when the drugs were administered. The report did not reveal the number of unwitting subjects given drugs, nor the identities of any but Olson, but it did acknowledge, for the first time, the scope of the cryptocracy's interest in mind control. The CIA Inspector General, Donald Def Chamberlain, was stimulated by Olson's death to investigate the above-cited drug program himself. In a summary dated February 5, 1975, he wrote, Records do not permit a description of such relationships as may have existed between these various activities. It is apparent that there was some sharing of information between these various components in the agency and some overlap in time, but there also are indications of independent approaches to the problem. Naturally, the CIA allows itself to be questioned and examined only by loyal employees. 
but even the in-house inspector general could not avoid reporting that the CIA had a recording interest in behavioral drugs for more than 25 years. The earliest record of this interest dated to the post-World War II period, when the CIA, heir to the OSS mind control research, and perhaps the victim of its own motivating propaganda, thought that the Soviets were using drugs and other behavior-influencing techniques. In 1949, Irving L. Janus of the Rand Corporation wrote, Defense against these mind control actions will depend largely upon knowledge of enemy capabilities. Reports of experimental and actual use of illegitimate interrogation techniques by the Soviets to obtain intelligence and court confessions against the interrogatees will indicate clearly the need for medical investigation, the report claimed. The implications referred to above embrace several categories. The behavior of defendants in Soviet courts and in those of the satellite countries, together with the whole pattern of Soviet trial procedure, makes it essential for us to consider Soviet use of drugs, hypnotism, hypno-narcoanalysis, electric and drug shock, and possibly the use of ultrasonics. The report continued, There is documentary evidence to support the belief that the Soviets have been conducting medical research, have actually used various techniques, and have made provision for large-scale productions of uncommon drugs known for their speech-producing effects. Only a few drugs with which the Soviets were supposed to be experimenting are named. No hard evidence is presented that they were, in fact, experimenting with such drugs. The report goes on to point to the trial of Joseph Cardinal Minzenti, who was accused of collaborating with the enemy, the United States, as an example of the Russians' use of drugs in obtaining forced confessions in court procedure. Behavior patterns, rapport, symptoms of residual effects of treatments, and the physical condition of the defendants all indicate the use of drugs. Several documents refer to memorized testimony and departures from text, indicating forced false confessions. It was later learned that the elicited confessions were false. By Menzenzi's own admission, they were not induced by drugs or sophisticated techniques of mind control. They were simply forged, and rather poorly forged at that. Menzenzi's foggy mental state at the trial had resulted from psychological indoctrination, isolation, and interrogation, and generally can be regarded as standard police procedure for most countries of the world. The report clearly stated that the use of drugs does not usually result in amnesia of past interrogations unless the victim's mental faculties have been destroyed by their effects. Thus, even if drugs were used on Minzenti, by the CIA's own conclusion, he would have remembered getting the drugs and something about the subsequent interrogation sessions. The fact was he remembered neither. It is surely not a coincidence that the CIA eyes-only report, which claimed Minzenti was narco-hypnotized, was issued that same year that Edward Hunter, the CIA propaganda specialist, released Brainwashing in Red China. Most newspaper reporters would never go to press on the kind of sourceless generalized information provided in the CIA report. Yet are we to believe the cryptocracy had launched a 30-odd year research and development project based on evidence which amounted to hearsay? Another CIA report uncovered by Marx, Defense Against Soviet Medical Interrogation, revealed the alarming statistics that, although susceptibility to narcohypnosis varies from person to person, Skilled operators can readily hypnotize about 25% of a given group of average persons. It added at least 80%, however, would be susceptible following the use of certain drugs. This second document also discussed the plan of the CIA's organization of a special defense interrogation program. In addition to outlining the use of drugs and hypnosis, the report brought up two other mind-bending possibilities, electroshock and ultrasonic sound. Psychiatrists in many nations, the report said, have used insulin and electric shock as methods of choice under certain circumstances in their psychiatric work. Electric shock is more rapid than any of the above techniques, drugs, or hypnosis. It is instantaneous. It can be applied with or without the recipient's knowledge. Amnesia of interrogations equals that of hypnosis. If the enemy uses electric shock for interrogation purposes and the victim is available after recovery from the shock, highly trained specialists should be able to reveal the past use of electric shock by electroencephalographic analysis. The report went on to recommend that groups within the CIA, the armed forces, and the FBI be organized and coordinated to give high-level direction to this project. Civilian capability for solution of some of the problems should be utilized, the report said. 
close liaison between the CIA and armed services has been established, but it is not as effective as it should be. Liaison within the armed services appears to be inadequate, and they do not seem to be aware of some civilian sources of knowledge. Liaison with the FBI on this subject may be described as cooperative, although somewhat mutually evasive. A satisfactory guiding organization could be set up under high-level direction for the development of an integrated program. If feasible, a committee to accomplish this purpose should be appointed. The report concluded by recommending that a technical committee should include medical intelligence representatives from the CIA, Navy, Army, Air Force, probably the FBI, and ad hoc government and non-government consultants. From the first days of Project Bluebird and throughout all the ensuing CIA projects, the goal was the same. Find answers to the following questions. Can accurate information be obtained from willing or unwilling individuals? Can agency personnel, or persons of interest to this agency, be conditioned to prevent any unauthorized source or enemy from obtaining information from them by any known means? Can we obtain control of the future activities, physical and mental, of any individual, willing or unwilling, by application of mind control techniques? Beyond the laboratory and operational research on unwitting subjects, the CIA set up training teams which included polygraph operators, interrogation specialists, hypnotists, and others in what was a long-range, all-out effort to develop reliable mind control and counter-mind control techniques. In all, 15 separate research areas were defined by the CIA planners. Most of the drug projects came under the operating authority of the U.S. Navy. At Bethesda Naval Hospital, under the direction of a Dr. Gafsky. The drug project, begun in 1947, continued until 1972. The CIA reports defined the project as one which sought to isolate and synthesize pure drugs for use in effecting psychological entry and control of the individual. Also under the Navy's direction was a project headed by a Dr. Elson at the University of Indiana called Detection of Deception. This project was aimed at determining the physiological changes which occur when a person is engaged in deception. Mechanical and electrical devices were developed to measure these changes. At the University of Rochester, again under Navy direction, a Dr. Wendy investigated motion sickness. The CIA report describes that study as one to determine the effect of drugs on the vestibular function of the ear and the development of side effects which indicate the possibility of psychological entry and control. Besides mind control drugs and techniques, also investigated were tools which might be effective in compromising individuals. One report stated that in spite of the intensive research, as late as 1960, no effective knockout pill, truth serum, aphrodisiac, or recruitment pill was known to exist. Towards that goal, under the auspices of the U.S. Army Surgeon General's office, a Dr. Beecher at Harvard University was given $150,000 to investigate the development and application of drugs which will aid in the establishment of psychological control. And... Under Air Force guidance, a Dr. Hastings at the University of Minnesota was engaged to research the effects of LSD on animals. His research area, as defined by CIA, also included the use of electric shock in interrogation, with particular emphasis placed on the detection of prior use of electric shock and the guaranteed amnesia it produced. According to the documents, the investigation of hypnosis as a mind control tool was kept under the aegis of the CIA. Their prime research interest was the investigation of the possibilities of hypnotic and post-hypnotic control. While MKUltra was the code name for the research and development period of mind control, MK Delta was the code name for the operational phase, during which all of the techniques of mind control were applied to individuals. What followed next was the MK Ultrans, acting out their mindless roles at the behest of the cryptocracy. Chapter 8 the Mata Hari of Mind Control Candy Jones was a sex symbol during World War II. Born Jessica Wilcox, with her catchy stage name and shapely legs, she rose to a standing second only to Betty Grable as America's most popular pinup girl. She was a favorite of the troops at the front, and she felt it a duty to entertain them near the battlefields. After her advertised beauty faded, and she could no longer serve to raise the morale of the troops with her appearance, she served her country in another way.
She served under MK Ultra as a hypno-programmed CIA courier for 12 years. While on a USO tour in the Pacific in 1945, Candy contracted a case of undulant fever and, shortly thereafter, malaria. On top of that, she caught the contagious fungus known as jungle rot. Within a week, her hair had begun to fall out and her complexion had turned a sickly yellow. The combination of these diseases sent her to a military hospital in Manila, where she met a young medical officer whom she identifies only by the pseudonym Gilbert Jensen. Later, he would offer her the opportunity to become a CIA courier. In 1959, Candy started a modeling school in New York. She rented office space in a modern skyscraper across the hall from an office occupied by the one-time heavyweight boxing champion, Gene Tunney. One night, Candy noticed a cleaning lady fumbling for keys to open Tunney's door. The next day, Tunney reported that his office had been burglarized, but nothing important had been stolen. Later the same week, Candy observed a young couple approaching Tunney's door. She watched as the young man took out a set of keys and went through the same trial and error process that the cleaning lady had performed a few nights earlier. Candy went into the hallway and asked the young man what he was doing. He told her that he was supposed to meet Tunney there. Candy informed him that Tunney had left hours before and was not expected back that evening. The couple hurriedly left. The next day, Candy told Tunney about the incident. He was not alarmed, nor did he even seem to be interested that a second burglary of his office had been attempted. One day later, in the lobby of her building, Candy ran into a retired army general she'd known in the South Pacific. The general had not known her well in the past, but now he was more than courteous. He mentioned that he was on his way to have lunch with Tunney, so Candy invited him to her office first and showed him around. Then she brought him across the hall to Tunney. Tunney seemed quite surprised that Candy had known the general, and, after a brief conversation, the two men went to lunch and Candy continued with her business. A few days later, Candy was visited by a man who introduced himself as an FBI agent. He asked her about the burglary of Tunney's office, and Candy told him what she had told both Tunney and the superintendent of the building. The FBI man then unexpectedly went over to the window ledge and picked up a microphone Candy had obtained from Alan Funt of Candid Camera fame. The agent wanted to know what use Candy had for the microphone. She explained that she used it to tape her model's voices to help them develop their speech. The agent said that he'd been looking for just such a microphone to use in a surveillance job on 57th Street. He asked Candy if she would mind if he borrowed it. Flattered that she'd been asked to help the FBI, Candy offered it for as long as it was needed. The FBI man thanked her and left with the microphone. When he returned a month later, he was accompanied by another agent. After making casual conversation for a few minutes, the FBI men asked Candy if she would allow them to have some of their mail delivered to her office. There would be letters addressed to fictitious names in care of her modeling school. Some of the letters, he said, might be mailed from Europe and addressed to her or to a specified fictitious man's name. If that happened, she was supposed to call a number and report the arrival of the mail. Candy, once again flattered, said she'd be happy to help. Two weeks after Candy took the job with the FBI, Gene Tunney moved out of his office. The general, however, kept in touch with her all during that year. He invited her to several parties and even sent her a Christmas card. In the summer of 1960, Candy received a letter at her apartment from the first FBI man, and the next day, the general called her at her office. Somehow, he knew she was taking a trip to speak at the all-male Tuesday night supper club in Denver and afterwards going on to San Francisco to attend a fashion show. The general wondered if, since she was going to California anyway, she would mind carrying a letter from a government agency. He told her the letter was to be delivered to a man who would call her at the hotel and identify himself. Again flattered to be called upon to serve her country, Candy agreed to act as a courier. The important letter was hand-delivered to Candy's office a few days after the general's phone call. There were two small envelopes, a large one inside of which were her instructions, and a smaller one which contained the actual letter. Candy carried the letter with her to Denver, then on to San Francisco, where she waited for her contact. Within a few days, she received a call at her hotel from a man who identified himself as Gil Jensen. It was the same man who had been Candy's doctor in the Philippines. Jensen invited her to dinner that evening at the Mark Hopkins Hotel. During dinner, Candy brought up the subject of the letter, but Jensen avoided the subject, saying that they could talk about it at his office the next day. Candy protested she had to go back to New York the next day, but Jensen would not take no for an answer. 
He told her it would be worth her while to stay on for a few days, saying, There's some interesting work you could do for the Central Intelligence Agency, Candy, without interfering with your business. He told her that the work could be quite lucrative, and since at that time she needed money, she decided to stay and find out what the CIA was offering. The next day, a car picked Candy up at her hotel and drove her across the Bay Bridge to the Oakland office of Dr. Jensen. That was the beginning of what Candy's biographer, Donald Bain, who told Candy's story in the book The Control of Candy Jones, described as 12 years of adventure which would eventually take her to the Far East as a covert operative of the CIA. She would be harassed, badgered, and even tortured, Bain wrote. Her role was small, a carrier of messages, and the fact that she chose initially to perform such duties for pay renders the misfortunes that befell her occupational hazards. What Candy hadn't bargained for, however, was becoming a human guinea pig in a secret CIA scientific project in which mind control was the goal. She was an unwilling and unknowing laboratory subject for 12 years, and only her chance marriage saved her from the final stage of her adventure, her own suicide as choreographed by Dr. Gilbert Jensen. In 1973, Candy Jones married an old friend, Long John Nebel, the host of a New York all-night radio talk show. Candy had met John in 1941, at the height of her career, when he was working as a freelance photographer assigned by a magazine to photograph her. After losing contact with each other for more than a decade, they accidentally renewed their acquaintance and were married 28 days later. On their wedding night, John noticed his bride was suddenly acting out of character. She had left the bed and gone into the bathroom to look in the mirror. When she returned, John said, I remember somebody who only resembled the woman I'd married. He stressed the word resembled because, although the body which walked out of the bathroom belonged to Candy, the being inside it did not. Her voice was cold and distant, and her expression was cruel. Soon the strange bitter mood passed, and the warm and loving Candy returned. The next evening, Candy's strange mood returned. John naturally became curious about his wife's psycho-history, and began asking questions about her past. Candy told him about her contact with the FBI in 1959. She also told him that from time to time she would still have to take little trips for the government. On June 3, 1973, John and Candy came home early in the morning after doing one of his all-night talk shows. Candy tried to sleep, but found she could not. She tossed and turned, and when she complained to John of her sleeplessness, she was near tears. John told Candy that he'd read that hypnosis could relax insomniacs, and although he never had tried to put anyone into the trance state, He'd read a lot about it and suggested perhaps they ought to try it. Candy laughed and said, I can't be hypnotized, John. But a short while after John began to hypnotize her, Candy was deeply asleep. Although John had no way of knowing it then, Candy was already a highly suggestible subject since she had been hypnotized on many previous occasions by the CIA. Because of this, whenever John sought to induce trance in Candy, she rapidly became relaxed and was able to get a full night's natural sleep. One night, while under John's hypnosis, Candy suddenly and spontaneously began to relive her childhood. During these age regressions, she revealed many terrible incidents in what had been an obviously lonely and troubled past. In dreamlike monologues, she related how her father had abused her. Once, when she was eleven, he'd crushed her fingers one by one in a nutcracker because she wouldn't cry when he was about to leave. Candy's portrayal of her mother depicted a person only a little less cruel than her father. A calculating woman, she often locked Candy inside a closet as a form of punishment. In several hypnotic monologues, Candy revealed how she had developed an alter ego named Arlene to defend her from the blows of her formative years. Later, John was to discover the despicable personality which he had observed taking over his wife's consciousness on their wedding night was the same alter ego she'd developed in her childhood. John Nebel began tape recording his wife's hypnotic monologues. Bain fails to say whether or not Candy's alter ego playmate was a manifestation of what was then thought to be the rare illness known as multiple personality disorder, MPD. Since 1976, the psychiatric community has come awake to the fact that there are tens of thousands of people suffering from what today is called dissociative identity disorder, or DID. But then, there were only a handful of cases diagnosed. We now know that DID children were recruited by the cryptocracy, which made good use of their many outstanding capabilities.
One day, while under hypnosis, Candy told John about working with Dr. Jensen in California. She revealed that Jensen worked for the CIA, and she did too, but John was not interested in the CIA story. John became interested, however, when his wife described how Dr. Jensen had tried to hypnotize her. According to Candy, when Jensen had suggested she submit to hypnosis, and she had told him with great certainty that she couldn't be hypnotized, he had agreed with her that this was probably true, judging from what he knew of her personality. John had read that the best way to deal with a subject who believes he cannot be hypnotized is first to agree with him, then proceed to demonstrate how a hypnotist might try to induce trance. John's subsequent hypnotic sessions with Candy verified that was exactly what Jensen had done. But he'd gone one step further. According to the memories dredged up from Candy's subconscious, Jensen had regularly given her injections of vitamins. John thought these might actually have been hypnotic drugs. Although Candy had probably always been a good hypnotic subject, narco-hypnosis provided access to greater depths in her already pliable personality. When John began asking Candy about Jensen in her conscious state, he found that she could provide little information about him. She could only recall visiting Jensen on that first trip for the CIA. She had no memory of what had happened in his office, nor of the events of her life which immediately followed that visit. John began to fear that the CIA doctor still possessed a hold over his wife's mind. Over the course of many hypnotic sessions with Candy, John Nebel gathered up her fragments of memory and wove them into a picture of a satanic CIA doctor. But, reports Donald Bain, the major difficulty in dredging up this material is that Candy Jones was programmed by Jensen not to remember, and this programming proved frighteningly effective. John later discovered that on that first visit, Jensen had obtained from Candy the important piece of information about her imaginary playmate named Arlene. This single fact provided the basis for the methodical splitting of her personality, for it was Arlene that Jensen wished to cultivate as a courier, not Candy. Candy's willingness to carry messages was the extent of her conscious cooperation with the CIA. But from the first visit to Jensen's office, she had become an unwitting victim of Operation Mind Control. Jensen had her sign a security oath which officially made her an employee of the government, and as such, she forfeited her right to legal compensation for the harm done her by the ruthless mind control operation. Jensen also placed her against a large sheet of paper and traced her silhouette. Then he photographed her and asked her to pick a pseudonym for a new passport. She suggested her actual middle name, Arlene. In answer to Jensen's questions, she revealed that her imaginary playmate had spelled her name A-R-L-E-N-E. -E. Jensen said that he didn't care which way she spelled it and asked her to pick a last name as well. Candy suggested the name Grant, which was the last part of her grandmother's name, Rosen Grant, and Arlene Grant was agreed upon. It would be an easy name for Candy to remember, since that was the very name she had given to her alter ego in childhood. As time went on, John found that he was talking more to Arlene than to Candy. In one session, John asked Arlene if she thought Jensen had in any way crippled her. Arlene scornfully replied that Candy had not wanted to be programmed, but that she didn't know what end was up. John asked Arlene who had developed her, and she replied, Mother Jensen. He hatched me like a mother hen. Jensen had told her to come through Candy's stomach, she'd say. He'd say, A.G., A.G., and Candy would experience a severe stomach pain before Arlene took over her personality. When she refused to come when she was called, Jensen would give Candy an injection, and one day he miscalculated and gave her three injections, which put Candy to sleep for 14 hours. Jensen had quite a scare because he had a difficult time reviving her. Under John's hypnosis, Candy revealed that she had been given a number of drugs by Jensen, possibly aminazin, reserpine, and sulfazin, as well as the truth drugs sodium amytal and sodium pentothal. She was programmed not to allow any doctor except Jensen to treat her, and never to allow anyone to give her Thorazine, the powerful tranquilizer. The details of Candy's role as a mind-controlled CIA courier were pieced together from hundreds of hours of tapes of her hypnotic monologues. She worked for the CIA under her professional name, Candy Jones, under the name Arlene Grant, and under her given name, Jessica Wilcox. She was first ordered to lease a post office box at Grand Central Station in the name of Jessica Wilcox in August of 1961. She maintained this box until 1968 or 1969 and paid for it herself. 
Mail seldom arrived at the box, but when it did, Candy would take it to her office and hold it for an unidentified man who always made the pickup, or sometimes a phone call would order Candy to deliver certain letters to various locations around the city. Slowly it began to dawn on Candy that some of the people she was delivering mail to might be just the kind of people who could kill her for reasons of their own. To protect herself, she wrote a letter to her attorney and put two copies in safe deposit boxes at different banks. The letter stated that for reasons she couldn't disclose, she often used the names Arlene Grant, Jessica Wilcox, and Candy Jones. She wanted to put on record the fact that these different names all referred to her. In the event of her death, she wrote, whether it was due to accident or sudden illness, whether it happened in the United States or outside the country, there should be a thorough investigation. She wrote that although she was not at liberty to divulge her sideline activities, she was not performing illegal, immoral, or unpatriotic acts. Candy held that assumption to the end of her days, even after hearing her own voice under hypnosis tell tales of physical torture, of illegal entries and exits from the country, and of the most shocking kind of abuse at the hands of the CIA. Candy probably still would do almost anything out of this hypno-cultivated sense of patriotism. Eventually, John tried to get his wife to see a psychiatrist, but she refused, saying that if she did go, she would get very sick and might even have a convulsion. Evidently, Jensen had told her this. Even talking about possible therapy gave Candy severe stomach cramps. Candy had been programmed so that she would not only be protected from foreign intelligence operations, but from everyone, the CIA included. Jensen planned to use her for some evil design of his own. Candy Jones was, in fact, not one, but two zombies, Candy and Arlene, sibling rivals trapped inside the same skin. They would talk to each other, but never about each other, to anyone but Jensen. They traveled together on the CIA assignments, Candy Jones being the person who acted within the United States, and Arlene Grant, the alter who took over once the airplane left the country. Usually, when Candy arrived in San Francisco from New York, she would immediately go to Jensen's office. There, she would change clothes, don a black wig, and pick up her fake passport in the name of Arlene Grant. Jensen would call forth the Arlene personality and send her off to Southeast Asia to deliver her messages. In his book, Donald Bain writes that Arlene often carried an envelope, but he wonders, wisely, if in fact there was anything in the envelope. The possibility is strong that Candy carried her secret messages within her mind, locked behind post-hypnotic blocks which could be released only by hearing the proper cue. In 1966, she was sent on several missions to Taiwan where three businessmen were her contacts. On her first mission to Taiwan, Arlene was met at the airport by one of them. She immediately offered him the envelope, but he insisted that she accompany him to his home, which turned out to be a large and institutional-like structure located on an impressive estate 20 miles outside Taipei. In front of the house, a long row of trees lined the driveway, which circumscribed a lush green lawn. There were other buildings on the property some distance from the main house. As he escorted Arlene into the house, she noticed two Chinese women dressed in lab coats on the lawn. She asked him who these women were, and he explained that they were only household help. During that first three-day visit, the man entertained Arlene royally. He took her to extravagant dinners and on an extensive sightseeing tour of the island. When she returned to San Francisco, Jensen met her at the airport and drove her back to his office. There he gave her an intravenous injection of drugs and restored her to the Candy Jones personality. She turned in her Arlene Grant passport and put her black wig, dark makeup, and clothing in a closet in Jensen's office. On that trip, she also turned over to Jensen several rolls of exposed film, which she had taken on her sightseeing tour. On her return to New York, she found her staff at the modeling agency very upset because she had forgotten to tell anyone where she was going or how long she would be gone. A month later, Candy was again summoned to San Francisco. Jensen put her through the same procedure as before, having Arlene Grant emerge and travel to Taiwan. Again, the same man met her at the airport and took her to his country home. Again, she stayed for three days. But this time, she was not a guest, but a prisoner. Candy recalled, through John's questioning under hypnosis, that she was hooked up to an electronic box of some kind and was shocked repeatedly on her shoulders, arms, and breasts. 
the Chinese grilled her about the contents of the envelope she'd just delivered. She protested that she did not know anything about its contents, but that answer did not satisfy her torturers. When she wouldn't change her story, they turned to questions about Dr. Jensen. Arlene maintained that she did not know Dr. Jensen. Obstinately, she stuck to her programmed cover story, even though she was severely and repeatedly shocked. Although the real event had taken place almost ten years earlier, the physical impressions revived by reliving these experiences under her husband's hypnosis were so strong that her lymph system responded protectively and pumped fluid to her shin, producing blisters in the exact places where the electrodes had been attached. According to Candy's recollection, the torture stopped only after the Chinese man talked with someone on the telephone. Following his conversation, he unstrapped her from the chair and seemed most friendly and apologetic. He told her the electrodes had been used not to torture her, but to try and jog her memory. After lunch, he drove her to the airport and put her on a plane for San Francisco. She remembers that on the return flight, she wore gloves in order to hide the blisters. She also recalls that her hands smelled of sulfuric acid, although she has no recollection of having been burned with it. At San Francisco, Jensen met her and gave her the customary injection after they reached his office. He told her that the torture had been a mistake, the result of a typographical error in the message she had carried. In 1968, Candy was again sent to Taiwan. Normally, an individual would not knowingly and willingly place herself in a position to be tortured a second time. But Jensen's control over Candy was so complete that she did his bidding without the slightest hesitation. The final trip to Taiwan brought her into contact with other Taiwanese. She delivered her envelope, this time to a girl in an art gallery. She remembers that after the girl took the envelope from her, she spit in her face. Under hypnosis, Candy could not recall any reason why the girl had done so. After delivering the message, Arlene was picked up by the same man and driven to his home. Again she was tortured with electrodes and questioned about the contents of the message she delivered. When she would not or could not answer, her torturers put in her hand a box which contained a scorpion. This, apparently, was supposed to be a scare tactic, for when the scorpion bit her, the torturers immediately stopped the shocks and gave her antibiotics and administered other medical treatment. Candy told her husband that on another occasion her thumbnails had been cut to the quick in an attempt to make her talk. She remembered that this had taken place on January 24, 1968. On still another occasion, something had been put in her ears to cause pain. But throughout all this torture, Jensen's programming held. She said nothing. In another hypnosis session, Arlene told about getting dizzy in a Taiwan hotel after having one drink. She began to sweat profusely and went to a bathroom which had a little dressing room and a bed in it. An attendant accompanied her and took her clothes and hung them up since they had become drenched with perspiration. She was given a dressing gown and allowed to lie down. Eventually, a doctor came to see her. He gave her an injection, and she drifted off to sleep. After the doctor left the room, the female attendant came over and began to pinch her on different parts of her body, asking where the papers were. When the attendant began to pinch Arlene's nipples, she fainted from the pain. The woman persisted, repeatedly pulling her to a sitting position and severely pinching her nipples. When the woman finally left the room, Candy remembers, she tried to crawl under the bed to hide. The doctor came back and gave her another injection. The next day, when she awoke and dressed, she was courteously escorted to the airport by her torturers, as if nothing had happened. When she got back to Jensen's office, she reported the incident to him. He seemed most concerned about it, but when he asked to see her bruises, she refused to show him her black and blue nipples. On a number of occasions, Candy was sent to the Central Intelligence Agency's training ground called The Farm. Known to the outside world as Camp Peary, it appeared to be an ordinary military installation. There, Candy learned how to search a room and various guerrilla warfare tactics, including how to commit undetectable arson. She was taught how to use a poison lipstick to take her own life, and how to use the same lipstick to kill someone else by sticking a pin inside it, then jabbing the intended victim. She learned how to use acid as a defensive and offensive weapon. She learned how to fire various weapons, how to climb ropes, and how to write coded messages on her fingernails and cover them with polish. The training at the farm was known as 3D, Detect, Destroy, and Demolish. 
At one point, Candy told her husband of an especially outrageous incident, which took place at CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. She had been taken to an amphitheater where more than two dozen CIA men were gathered to witness a performance of Dr. Jensen's Stable of Zombies. There were eight subjects scheduled for the performance, and Candy was the first. In a deep hypnotic trance, she was made to lie naked on a table. The table was wheeled before the CIA audience, and Candy was introduced to the group as Laura Quidnick. She wore her Arlene wig during the entire performance. Dr. Jensen demonstrated his complete control over the prone, disrobed figure of Candy Jones. He lit a candle and told his nude subject that she would not feel a thing. Then he shoved the burning candle deep into her vagina. Several of the witnesses tried to break through Jensen's control, but they all failed. Candy is perfect, Arlene told John. Jensen proved in Virginia how impossible it was to break his control. Piecing together such fragmented incidents of Candy's secret CIA past, John Nebel discovered that his wife had been programmed to commit suicide once she was no longer useful to the CIA. The self-destruct program was to be activated in Nassau. She was to check into the Paradise Beach Hotel on December 31, 1972. She'd stayed at the hotel many times before on normal business trips, so there was nothing unusual about that. But on this occasion, Arlene was primed to spontaneously take over Candy's body upon receiving a phone call from Jensen. She was programmed to walk Candy's body to a steep cliff overlooking the sea and there to make a high dive. This was to be the last dive of Candy Jones's life, for from that location her body would certainly have crashed into the rocks on the beach below. It was extremely fortunate that Candy married John Nebel on the very day she was supposed to check into the hotel. The marriage, by putting off the Nassau trip, had short-circuited Jensen's program of suicide, which was scheduled for the same month. Even to the end of her life, despite John's help in countering much of Jensen's programming, Candy was still not completely free of his control over her mind. Still, whenever she looked into a mirror, she felt Arlene struggling to take over her consciousness. Although Candy told Jensen that she was through working for the agency in the middle of 1972, more than six months after she and John were married, a strange phone call was recorded on their answering machine. The message was, Japan Airlines calling on the 3rd of July at 4.10 p.m. Please have Miss Grant call 759-9100. She is holding new reservation on Japan Airlines Flight 5 for the 6th of July, Kennedy, Tokyo, with an open on to Taipei. This is per Cynthia that we are calling. Thank you. A check with Japan Airlines disclosed that the number 759-9100 was indeed the reservation number for the airline. There was, however, no record in the airline's computer of the reservation or a record of who made it. Neither was there a reservation clerk named Cynthia or anyone else at the airline by that name. The per Cynthia phrase may have been a code which was supposed to trigger Candy's automatic program, or it may have been a thin disguise for the agency represented by Cynthia's first and last two letters. Candy's controlled mind and John Nebel's sense of patriotism prevented the whole truth of the story from emerging. For some reason, John Nebel, Candy Jones, and Donald Bain conceal the real names of Candy's programmers. In Bain's book, the name Gilbert Jensen is said to be a pseudonym. Another doctor, who supposedly conditioned to hate and distrust people, is given the name Dr. Marshall Berger in the book, though at one point there is a footnote stating that Nebel wondered if Berger wasn't a cover name for the California hypnotist Dr. William Jennings Bryan. In a Samistat document supposed to have come from a CIA briefing, see Chapter 37, it was noted that Bryan had been one of the programmers of Sirhan Sirhan. Bryan, as noted in an earlier chapter, was the hypnotist and physician who offered the long-distance instant diagnosis that Gary Powers had been powerized by the Soviets. He was formerly a hypnotist for the Air Force and has been linked to the CIA. He was also the technical consultant for the film The Manchurian Candidate. According to the April 22, 1969 Los Angeles Times, the California State Board of Medical Examiners found him guilty of unprofessional conduct in four cases involving sexual molesting of female patients. For this offense, Brian was only placed on five years probation. The lightness of the penalty might well have been accomplished through his connections with the CIA. 
Alan W. Shefflin, an attorney who spent five years researching the subject of mind control for his book, The Mind Manipulators, said he has evidence which suggests that Nebels and Donald Bain may be concealing the fact that the doctor who programmed Candy is the same doctor who programmed Lee Harvey Oswald, James Earl Ray, and Sirhan Bashara Sirhan. In early 1976, Candy Jones and I both spoke on a KSAN radio special on mind control. I was interviewed via telephone, and Candy was interviewed in the studio. We did not meet face-to-face, -face, but KSAN provided all the participants with duplicate tapes of the program. On the KSAN program, Candy Jones and Donald Bain both insisted, despite my own evidence and arguments, the testimony of Jessica Mitford and the evidence provided by two other investigative reporters that Candy had been only a human guinea pig used for experimental purposes. The records of the CIA Mind Control Project clearly show, however, that during the 1960s, the cryptocracy's mind control had gone far beyond the experimental stage. On that radio show, Candy herself revealed that Sir William Stevenson, a man called intrepid, believed that she was no guinea pig. She reported that Stevenson wrote her that as far back as the early days of World War II, he had used zombie agents like her in the service of British intelligence. Shortly after the program was aired, I called Nebel's office to try and make contact with Candy or John. They had ignored my previous letters and my calls were taken by their producer, who tried to help me but finally had to report that the Nebels were not interested in being interviewed. I subsequently learned that neither would they grant an interview to John Marks of the Center for National Security Studies. My attempt to clarify the question of whether or not Dr. William Jennings Bryan had anything to do with programming Candy Jones was also frustrated by his avoidance of me. I persisted in trying to get an interview with him until March of 1977, when Dr. Bryan died prematurely at the age of 50, allegedly of a heart attack. He was a rather flamboyant man who toured the country holding conferences where he would lecture on the uses of hypnosis in police interrogation. He died at one such conference in Las Vegas, Nevada only months after his name was raised in connection with Candy Jones. Both Long John and Candy are now molding in their graves. Among the legacy they left are questions which begged for their answers. What are the real names of the men who programmed Candy? Why weren't they included in the book? What are Candy and John's personal political affiliations? Why were they not outraged by Candy's manipulation? Why are they attempting to protect the guilty and justify the rape of Candy's body and mind by the national security rationale? Why wouldn't they sit still and let me interview them in detail? In light of Candy's disclaimer and the Nebel's refusal to clear up these questions, I can only ask the reader to decide whether or not Candy Jones was a courier in a fully operational sense or only an experimental guinea pig as she tried to make us believe. Chapter 9. The Story of O. Due to the volatile nature of the information contained in her story, I am withholding this victim's identity. The evidence is still being uncovered. Others are coming forward with corroborating information. While details of her testimony are still being checked, we do know that what she describes in her story is entirely possible. So from the perspective of students of mind control, this story has great value as it is here presented. Future editions may contain more. We'll call her O. She was born in 1957. Her first memories are of being suffocated by her father's penis in what was to be a childhood of continual sexual abuse. After six years of deprogramming with Mark Phillips, O has come to reintegrate her fragmented personality and has gained access to most of the shocking memories of her abuse by, among others, high government officials. In her unpublished autobiography, O writes, I recall as a toddler being unable to run, I could barely walk, to my mother for help as my instincts demanded. Describing one moment of the lurid details which drove her to a condition many call multiple personality disorder. Instead of helping, her mother abused her. Multiple personality disorder, MPD, she explains, is the mind's sane defense to an insane situation, a way of dealing with trauma that is literally too horrible to comprehend. By compartmentalizing the memory of such horrendous abuse as incestuous rape, which violates primitive instincts and surpasses pain tolerance, the rest of the mind can function normally as though nothing has happened. This compartmentalization is created by the brain actually shutting down neuron pathways to a specific part of the brain. 
Those neuron pathways are triggered open again when the abuse recurs, whereby the same part of the brain that is already conditioned to the trauma deals with it again and again as needed. The results of this childhood abuse left O unable to recall her father's sexual assaults. Until she saw or felt his penis thrust at her in another attack, she remained innocent and open, amnesic of the previous abuses. As quickly as I felt the terror from conditioned response to his sexual assault, she writes, my neuron pathways opened up instantaneously to the part of my brain that had previously endured the trauma. This part of my mind developed into a personality of its own which belonged to my father, which he rented out and later sold to the U.S. government. Her father, through her own investigations, it was discovered, was apparently a multi-generational incest victim himself from a large, poor, and horribly dysfunctional family, where his mother earned a living as a prostitute to local lumbermen. My father's brother and sister, O says, were all sexually and ritually abused just as he was, and they grew up to be drug addicts, prostitutes, street derelicts, and pedophiles who also sexually abused me and my brothers and sisters. By occult ritually abused, O means such as in the black rites of Satanism. O's case duplicates the mind control effects described by the cases of David, Louis Castillo, and Candy Jones. But it goes further because O says she's regained her memory and reintegrated her multiple personalities, remembering the process that she was a courier, like David and Candy, who carried secret messages locked behind post-hypnotic blocks, and she muled drugs, mostly cocaine, for the CIA and performed perverted sex acts for a number of leading politicians, including two presidents of the United States while they were in office and one before he came to office. Her father prostituted her to his friends, local mobsters, masons, relatives, Satanists, strangers, and police officers before he entered her into service of the cryptocracy. Young O and her siblings were used in child porn films by her father and her uncle. As a child, she was forced to perform sex acts before the cameras with her uncle's boxer dog, Buster. It was her uncle, she says, who informed her father of the U.S. Government Defense Intelligence Agency's mind control operation that was recruiting multi-generational incest-abused children with multiple personality disorder for its mind control studies. I was a prime candidate, a chosen one, and my father seized the opportunity as it would provide him immunity from prosecution for the child porn charge he was facing. Her father, she says, was hurriedly flown from Boston for a two-week course on how to raise me for this offshoot of the MK Ultra project, Project Monarch. When he returned from Boston, she says, he was smiling and pleased with his knowledge of what he termed reverse psychology. This she describes as puns and phrases that stuck in my mind, like, you earn your keep and I'll keep what you earn. Her description of her father's newly acquired linguistic techniques include what David called audio reversals. It is slowly coming into acceptance among the psychiatric community that people suffering from multiple personality disorders often exhibit unusual abilities in their different personalities. While the control or day-to-day -day normal personality might be seriously nearsighted, another personality might have 20-20 vision. Quite common is the hypermnesia David described and the high tolerance to pain we find in Candy Jones's story. O has her own version of these abilities. I learned to read at the young age of four due to my photographic memory, which is a result of MPD. Our government researchers, O says, knew about the photographic memory aspect of MPD, as well as the increased visual acuity, which is 44 times greater than that of the average person, the unusually high pain tolerance, and the compartmentalization of memory, all of which were appealing for military and covert operations development. Additionally, my sexuality was primitively twisted since infancy, which was appealing to perverse politicians who could hide their actions deep within my memory compartments referred to as personalities. I had personalities for pornography, a personality for bestiality, a personality for incest, a personality for withstanding the horrendous psychological abuse of my mother, a personality that witnessed my occult father ritually murdering a man, a personality for prostitution, while the rest of me functioned somewhat normally at school. My normal personality provided a cover for the abuse I was enduring, but best of all, it had hope. Hope that there was somewhere in the world where people did not hurt each other. O's young mind was scrambled with the Project Monarch methodologies, she says, which confused fantasy with reality. Disney stories, Cinderella, and The Wizard of Oz were placed at the base of her programming. When she was 13, 
with her breasts beginning to swell, she was judged to be too old for pedophile perversions. It was then that she was sold to U.S. Congressman Senator Robert C. Byrd, Democrat, West Virginia. From that point on, she says, my MPD existence became more regimented. I was kept physically worn down to the point of exhaustion in order that I be sufficiently receptive to my father's limited hypnotic programming capabilities. My television, books, and music became even more strictly controlled and monitored than before, not only to infringe on my last minuscule freedom of choice, but for total mind control conditioning purposes. For example, the annual television broadcast of Judy Garland's Wizard of Oz was celebrated as a holiday around my house to prepare my mind for future base programming on the theme that I, like Dorothy, could spin into another dimension over the rainbow. After all, birds fly over the rainbow. My father insisted I watch the Walt Disney movie Cinderella with him, paralleling my existence to Cinderella's, magically transforming from a dirty little slave to a beautiful princess and in typical reverse psychology humor, he referred to pornographic photos when singing, Someday my prince will come, or by placing literal sexual emphasis on will come. My brother, who was often featured in kiddie porn with me, was not a chosen one for Project Monarch, beyond supplying more children to be dedicated in later years. Yet my father figured what was good for me would be good for my brother, he took us to see Walt Disney's Pinocchio, explaining that my brother and I were his puppets still in the carving stage. The distortions of reality that these and other Disney theme movies provided, when coupled with my father's controlling conscious and subconscious influence, began to further erode our ability to discern fantasy from reality. My brother, now 37, remained psychologically locked into those traumatic childhood years and is obsessed with Disney to this day, decorating his house in Disney memorabilia, wearing Disney clothes, listening to my father's instructions on his Disney telephone, and maintains When You Wish Upon a Star as his favorite song, with no conscious idea as to why. Every other Project Monarch slave she met had been programmed along similar lines as she had. I had to watch such programs as I Dream of Genie, The Brady Bunch, Gumby and Pokey, and Bewitched. I could relate to the genie pleasing her master, who was a major in the Air Force in I Dream of Genie, this served to confuse the reality of my own experiences with the fantasy of the TV production. I told all outsiders that my family was just like the Bradys, though Gumby and Pokey, I was led to believe that I was as flexible as these clay figures, capable of being physically maneuvered into any sexual position. In Bewitched, it is the normal next-door neighbor that is considered crazy rather than the witches, another reversal that applied to my bizarre existence. O says her father took advantage of his new political connections and advanced himself in his work. Soon he was promoted, due to who he knew within the Pentagon Procurement Office and the General Services Administration, and what he had learned about double-bind hypnotic persuasion. In true pedophile fashion, he surrounded himself with children by coaching Little League sports, chaperoning school and catechism activities, and becoming involved with the Boy Scouts, all of which made him appear to be a pillar of the community. The illusion was forming. Abused by both government representatives and priests in the Catholic Church, O says that there are strong political ties between the Catholic Church and the U.S. government, which was evidenced by the much-publicized relationship between the President and the Pope during the Reagan administration. But this political relationship was evident to me years before through experiencing direct involvement in Project Monarch's physical and psychological conditioning and abuse. Satanic rituals, she says, were often used to traumatize her in attempts to further fragment her personality. But that, she says, did not promote the helpless attitude that was desired. What they wanted, she says, was to make people believe that there was spiritual warfare going on, which was beyond mankind's ability to stop. I knew it was my father, not Satan, that murdered the unsuspecting hunter in the woods during a ritual and I knew no spirits or demons were being appeased by my Uncle Bob's slaughter of numerous pets, even when Bunny screamed like a woman while being tortured to death. Regardless of my spiritual beliefs, I experienced the results just the same, being subjected to and witnessing trauma so horrible, it literally drove me out of my mind while my body was raped, tortured, and ravaged by men. Whether I was in a military, NASA, or government building, the procedure for maintaining me under total mind control remained consistent with Project Monarch requirements. This included physical and or psychological trauma, sleep, food and water deprivation, 
high voltage electric shock, and hypnotic and or harmonic programming of specific memory compartments and personalities. The high-tech equipment and methods I endured from that time on gave our government absolute control of my mind and life since I had been literally driven out of my conscious mind, and I existed only through my programmed subconscious. I lost my free will, ability to reason, and I could not think to question anything that was happening to me. I could only do as I was told. In the summer of 1975, O's family drove her from Michigan to the Teton Mountains of Wyoming. There she was introduced to Dick Cheney, Wyoming's congressman who had become the White House Chief of Staff to President Ford and eventually Secretary of Defense to George Bush. O says Cheney enjoyed a sadistic ritual called a most dangerous game. Originally devised to train the military in survival and combat maneuvers, it was used on O as a means of further conditioning her mind to believe that there was no place to hide, as well as to more deeply traumatize her for ensuing programming. It was my experience over the years, O says, that a most dangerous game has numerous variations of the primary theme of being stripped naked and turned loose in the wilderness while being hunted by men. In reality, the wilderness area was enclosed in military fencing, and it was only a matter of time until I was caught, repeatedly raped, and tortured. Dick Cheney has an apparent addiction to the thrill of the sport, and appears obsessed with playing a most dangerous game as a means of traumatizing mind-control victims, as well as for his own sexual kink. My introduction to the game occurred upon arrival, and it physically and psychologically devastated me. O says she was so traumatized by the event that after it she stood trembling naked in his dark hunting lodge office after being hunted down and caught. Cheney was talking as he paced around, she says. I could stuff you and mount you like a jackalope and call you a two-legged deer. Or I could stuff you with this. He unzipped his pants to reveal his oversized penis. Right down your throat and then mount you. Which do you prefer? While O stood silently trembling, not knowing what to say, Blood and sweat and dirt slid down her legs and shoulders. "'Make up your mind!' Cheney shouted, O says. "'You don't get a choice anyway. I make up your mind for you. That's why you're here. For me to make you a mind, and make you mine mind. You lost your mind a long time ago. Now I'm going to give you one. Just like the wizard gave Scarecrow a brain, the yellow brick road led you here to me. You've come such a long, long way for your brain, and I will give you one.' When O asked to use the bathroom, Cheney's face turned red with rage, she says, and he was on her in an instant, slamming her back into the wall, growling, If you don't mind me, I will kill you. I could kill you, kill you with my bare hands. You're not the first and you won't be the last. I'll kill you any time I goddamn well please. He flung me on the cot that was behind me and finished taking his rage out on me sexually, O says. During that assault, Cheney used an electric cattle prod on the young woman. The following year, O says, she was dropped off at the Kennedy Space Center in Titusville, Florida, where she was subjected to her first NASA programming. From then on, I was obsessed with following the Yellow Brick Road to Nashville, Tennessee, where she got involved with people in the country music business who were working undercover for the cryptocracy. In the early 1980s, my base programming was instilled by U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino, who holds a top-secret clearance in the Defense Intelligence Agency's Psychological Warfare Division. PSYOPs. Aquino is a professed neo-Nazi, the founder of the Himmler-inspired occult Temple of Set, and has been charged with child ritual and sexual abuse at the Presidio Daycare in San Francisco, California. But like my father, Aquino remains above the law while he continues to traumatize and program CIA-destined young minds in a quest to create the superior race of Project Monarch mind-controlled slaves. I quickly learned that Aquino did not adhere to his profoundly professed occult superstition any more than I did, and that his satanic power was in the form of numerous variations of high-voltage stun guns, which he used on me regularly. Although Aquino used occultism, blood trauma, as a trauma base, his programming was high-tech and clean, not muddled in a proverbial witch's brew of ignorance. He quickly dispelled the influence of her previous programmers and began programming me according to Bird's specifications as his own little witch for sadistic sex and covert CIA drug muling, blackmail, and prostitution operations. Aquino provided the ancient instructions on how to mutilate me, O says. Silver nitrate and hot exacto knives were used to carve the details of the witch on her vagina without any form of anesthesia. 
The muscles were cut so that when she flexed, they would protrude from her body showing the hideous face. This was done not only as a curiosity, but because, according to O, it made her vagina suited to Bird's tiny, underdeveloped penis, and made her Bird's own little witch, for which witch, witch is witch, programming. In 1981, Bird joined Aquino at Huntsville, Alabama, during one of the programming sessions. O says, NASA cooperates with Bird since it is Bird's Appropriations Committee that determines how much and or whether or not NASA receives any government funding. I laid naked on the cold metal table, tranced and photographically recording every word and detail of my programming and every word that Bird and Aquino exchanged. Bird was providing Aquino with specific details of certain perversions he wanted me equipped to fulfill or perform. Additionally, they talked about scrambling my immediate memory with two private porn films they were arranging to have produced locally, how to divide a personality, and how to create a sex slave. These films are the kind NASA became involved in producing for the dual purpose of scrambling memory as well as documenting their mind control procedures. The resident pornographers were two local police, one of which was a sergeant, and this serves NASA and CIA well when cover-up is necessary. I photo-identified the sergeant and his jailer officer in 1990, and my life was threatened as a result of this revelation. The How to Create a Sex Slave film depicts the common spin programming, which in essence is the combination to unlocking or accessing a specific programmed act. For example, the compartment of the brain that holds memory of incest is stimulated to open when the abuse occurs again. Seeing my father's penis would trigger specific responses, supposedly opening the neuron pathways of my brain to allow the part of my brain that dealt with him before to deal with him again. With spin programming, the trigger of seeing my father's penis is replaced with a combination of specific verbal commands and a specific number of revolutions in turning my body so that anyone with the combination could access that particular part of my brain. The part of my mind originally abused by my father learned to like sex painful sex. Bird wanted me programmed in such a way that he could decide if he wanted me to scream and cry when he whipped me, or if he wanted me to become sexually aroused and beg for more. After programming, when I met with Bird, I would dance like a music box dancer, twirling round and round until Bird's fiddle music stopped. My brain knew how many revolutions I had made, whether I was capable of conscious counting or not, and the desired results were produced and the appropriate state accessed. This is but one simplified example of sex programming, and I was programmed for more than sex. But this particular incident of programming at the U.S. Army Redstone Arsenal would change my existence entirely and set the stage for my role in covert government operations as a presidential model. The majority of my programming, O continues, was Oz theme based, which meant the combination of codes, keys, and triggers to access me were related to L. Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz. CIA cryptic language is a manipulation of the English language in such a way that the words have double meaning, much the way people familiar with each other have inside jokes. Since a mind-controlled slave exists through their very literal subconscious, which has no way of discerning fantasy from reality, or intended meaning from literal, cryptic language is especially effective. Many CIA covert operations I was involved in occurred in public, and anyone who might have overheard the conversation would have heard something very different than what actually transpired. For example, my escort linked arms with me like Dorothy's companions did with her when walking the yellow brick road in The Wizard of Oz, which must have appeared normal or even romantic to outsiders, but signaled me that I had better follow directions. He read the sign on the door, Service Entrance, accentuating syllables ever so slightly so that I heard him command, Serve us and trance. After Aquino instilled my base sex programming, I was often taken to Youngstown, Ohio to attend the sex slave training camp referred to as Charm School, O says. Often O was trained with other CIA mob slaves. Whenever Charm School was in session, O says, there were several girls being tortured and trained at once. I have seen and known numerous girls to go through Charm School, but understandably very few are reported to have survived or recovered their minds enough to talk about it. This so-called charm school, O says, was owned and operated by a member of a prominent banking family who took the name and role of governor from the movie My Fair Lady in an attempt to confuse reality with movie fantasy. In the movie, Governor is the cockney title given Professor Doolittle, who transforms a female street urchin into a high-society lady. 
Additionally, the title of governor was intended to create a scramble for the real governor who often frequented the school as though it were a whorehouse. The governor of Pennsylvania at that time was Richard Thornburg. Charm school, O says, meant I would be charmed, mesmerized, hypnotized, and programmed to be a high-class prostitute for politicians. I did learn their way to walk. I learned when to talk, how to dress, how to sit, stand, etc. Table manners were not taught as they were not needed, since slaves endured food and water deprivation when working. Noticeable in O's behavior is her conditioned way of sitting, walking, talking, and smiling, in a quite charming, if artificial, manner, not unlike the behavior of sorority girls in the South during the late fifties or early sixties. A typical three-day course at Charm School, O says, included the usual factors of sleep, food and water deprivation, trauma and high-voltage programming, aversive conditioning with electric shocks, often experimental drugs or tried and proven CIA manufactured designer drugs were administered which produced specific brainwave activity to maximize and or compartmentalize programs. I usually spent the first day hanging in the dungeon. Charm School was housed in a historic stone railroad magnet's former residence, in the basement wine cellar. It is dark, damp, and musty, O says, and has been decorated in classic torture chamber fashion, complete with hanging chains, stretching rack, whips, altar, and animal altars. As I hung by my wrists, I could hear and smell the animals in the next cells. A menagerie of animals were kept in the charm school dungeons. According to O, there was a black Nubian goat called Satan, a small donkey named Nestor, and a small white pony called Trigger and various dogs and snakes. The animals were trained to respond sexually to the smell of urine. As O describes it, when someone entered my cell and urinated on me, I knew I would soon be released from my chains and led to the animal altar for bestiality lessons, pornography, or to please a perverse onlooker. I was hung by my ankles, stretched on the rack, burned and tortured repeatedly. My feet and hands were chained to a wall for what was termed off-the-wall sex, and I was taught silence in Oz fashion, since screaming did not produce results anyway. I was repeatedly filmed pornographically and always taken upstairs to the master's chambers for prostitution to various participants. Other programming took place at Tinker Air Force Base near Tulsa, Oklahoma. At Tinker, the Disney theme of Peter Pan's Never Never Land was cryptically used to further convince my child personalities that reality was fantasy and that I would never grow up due to the timelessness of my existence. I was cryptically labeled a Tinker Bell, which signaled those in the know that I had endured government military programming consistent with Tinker Air Force Base mind control research and development. My Tinker Bell conditioning further enhanced my photographic memory through direct control for receiving and delivering government messages, a computerization, compartmentalization of my brain, so to speak. I was also trained in covert criminal operations, such as international drug transactions, for funding the Pentagon's and CIA's black budgets. She was led to a secret NASA installation at Maxwell Air Force Base in Nebraska. There she experienced what she calls the you-can-run-but-you-can't-hide conditioning. I was taken underground to a secret circular room where the walls were covered with numerous screens showing satellite pictures from around the world. These satellites are referred to as the eye in the sky, and an Air Force official explained to me that my every move could be monitored via satellite. On a separate four-screen viewer, he demonstrated what in retrospect was a contrived pre-recorded slideshow, with the scenes changing as rapidly as he spoke and typed it into the computer. Where will you run? To the Arctic? The Antarctic? Brazil, the mountains, the desert, the prairies, the hills of Afghanistan, the city of Kabul, Devil's Tower in Wyoming? Would you try to run to Cuba and live among our enemies? We can find you there. There is truly no place to run and no place to hide. The U.S. Senate? The picture was of Bird. The White House? Or to your own backyard? My father was waving from his front door, cupping his hands over his mouth, saying, Come back, just like Aunt Em in The Wizard of Oz. The moon? We've got you covered. You can run, but you can't hide. This well-produced and tailor-made multimedia presentation convinced O that her every move could be monitored. O says that her owner, Senator Byrd, prostituted her routinely to other high-ranking politicians in Washington, D.C., and when Byrd used her for his own pleasure, it was usually with a whip and a pocket knife. O says he picked up where my mother left off to destroy any self-esteem I might have had left. 
He often threatened me and told me that I was considered disposable because, after all, the first presidential model, Marilyn Monroe, was killed right in front of the public, and no one knew what happened. Byrd justified mind control atrocities, O oh, says, as a means of thrusting mankind into accelerated evolution according to the neo Nazi principles he adheres to. He justifies manipulating mankind's religion to bring about the prophesied biblical world peace through the only means available total mind control in the new world order. Because, after all, even the Pope and the Mormon prophet know this is the only way to peace. They cooperate fully with the project. Byrd justified our country's involvement in drug distribution, pornography, and white slavery as a means of gaining control of all illegal activities worldwide to fund black budget covert activity that will bring about world peace through world dominance and total control. 95% of the people want to be led by the 5% is Byrd's justification for mass mind control worldwide, and he claims this can be proven because the 95% do not want to know what really goes on in government. Literally, Byrd's captive audience, O absorbed and remembered information that the masterminds behind the New World Order would never have revealed for security reasons. Since Byrd regarded her as his object, a game piece that could be moved through life as though he were playing chess, he felt it safe to make her listen to his hidden political beliefs. Bird likely would have talked to a post, she says, and I filled the role as his silent sounding board. To date, I apply much of what I absorbed from his recitations to my survival and ultimately exposure of who is running our government and the mind control atrocities and crimes proliferating against humanity for ushering in the new world order. O identifies several of the hidden mind control centers in the U.S., one, she says, is at Mount Shasta, California. It is used as a training and operations camp for a variety of paramilitary projects. Among other things, robot soldiers are trained there. Usually, this training is done with the highest technology in invisible weaponry, even what she calls Star Wars electromagnetic mind control equipment. She reveals that there is a CIA near-death trauma center at Lamp, Missouri, and several more across the country. At these centers, a most dangerous game is played. As her discipline and programming took over what was left of her, she was forced to do strenuous exercise for two hours a day and was programmed to eat like a bird, bird, to keep a stunning figure. My public image was a programmed personality that always smiled, looked and talked like the proverbial airhead blonde, and kept outsiders away by socializing only within my controlled environment. One of the most frequented centers for her programming was MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida. Presidential modeling action, for O, consisted in taking cruise ships from Miami, Florida, throughout the Caribbean and Mexico, mewling cocaine. While I was robotically carrying out transactions as ordered, I was also prostituted to Central and South American drug lords and politicians, and oftentimes filmed pornographically. In the early 1980s, her duties included passing messages to and from Senator Byrd to baby Doc Duvalier and Puerto Rican drug lord Jose Busto. The working relationship between the CIA and Haiti was abruptly concluded with baby Doc being whisked away from an uprising in Haiti by our government, along with his CIA drug profits. The only drug wars I ever witnessed in the U.S., Caribbean, and Mexico were those launched by the CIA against its competition. The drug business was booming for the CIA. I brought suitcases of cocaine into the port of Miami. According to O, her mind-controlled existence became more complicated after Byrd introduced her to President Ronald Reagan in 1983 at a White House party. Byrd told her, she says, When you meet the chief, imagine him with his pants down. He's most comfortable knowing you are imagining him with his pants down. He doesn't want formality. Apparently, Reagan had seen the videos made at Huntsville how to divide a personality, and how to create a sex slave. He was very pleased with me as though I had participated in them willingly, O says. Within the first few minutes of meeting Reagan, he was giving me acting tips to utilize in pornography. When you become your part, O reports Reagan saying, your performance increases, which in turn increases your ability to do your part for your country. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country, your part. Here was Reagan using one of her trigger phrases. Reagan explained to me that the illegal CIA covert activities I was forced to participate in were justified as they funded covert activities in Afghanistan and Nicaragua. 
Oh, says Reagan, said, America's freedom train is spanning the globe, and sex is but a sidetrack to the ultimate course of freedom. Our job of procuring and transporting arms is the most difficult part of all, but it can and must be done. How can a man with no arms fight? She says that he told her that covert activity was necessary as American people raise too much hell about violence, and it is better they're not informed of our supporting wars they cannot understand. O oh says that Reagan twisted reality to fit his personal perceptions rather than adhere to Byrd's philosophies of providing rationalizations for what he deemed the order of things. In typical Reagan fashion, O oh says, he did not perceive mind control as slavery, but as an opportunity for those who otherwise would have been nothing in life. Multi-generational incest-abused children like myself, she says, or previously impoverished baseball players from third-world countries and slums are provided an opportunity to be all they can be through making a contribution to society, our nation, and the world by utilizing their talents to maximum potential and becoming programmed machines. With this attitude, Reagan was proud of the role he played as the Wizard of Oz to Project Monarch slaves like myself, O says. The night she met Reagan, she says, Byrd acted in the capacity of a pimp and prostituted her to the president. He informed me that Uncle Ronnie doesn't sleep with his mommy, preferring his LLB flannel sheets, nightshirt, and nightcap because they're warmer, softer, more comfortable, and don't snore. Reagan accessed my sexual programming, and I became my part as a prostitute to Uncle Ronnie. O says he did not move during sex. After all, that was my job, and my job was to please him whatever it takes, and it takes more time than anything. She says Reagan never hurt her, but he made sure someone else did that. He used this as a bond to the little child personality he always accessed for sex. O says that Reagan's biggest kink was bestiality pornography, and his passion for pornography escalated its manufacture and distribution during his administration. He wholeheartedly approved and encouraged porn for funding covert activity. Many porn films were manufactured solely for the president's pleasure, sometimes according to his instructions, O says. These were referred to as Uncle Ronnie's bedtime stories. After meeting President Reagan, O says, she endured additional base programming by Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. She says this was done largely for security reasons in order to override Byrd's control. Since Reagan had been shot, she says, he took extra precautions to ensure his safety, which included directing Aquino as to how he wanted me programmed. Much to Aquino's dismay and embarrassment, Reagan loved the occult role that this Army Lieutenant Colonel played for mind control traumatization purposes, as it fit in with the public promotion of religion Reagan had launched. The masterminds behind the New World Order, O says, wanted to project the illusion that their mind control operatives were demon possessed, and that the atrocities people were witnessing were biblical in proportion in order that they would feel helpless to oppose them. Without Christianity, Satanism loses its effectiveness. But together, Reagan, like Byrd, the Pope, Aquino, and so many others, believed world peace would be acquired by controlling the minds of the masses through their religion. Aquino's rule delighted Reagan, and he demanded that Aquino wear his black robes to a White House party to influence the superstitions of a few South American diplomats. Aquino appeared foolish in the eyes of his peers, who knew Aquino's image was only a guise for psychological warfare, as it made Aquino look like he believed in his own facade. Aquino paid Reagan back. Minutes before I was prostituted to Reagan that evening, Aquino ordered me into a closed side room of the White House and very quickly had intercourse with me, slapped me on the behind, and disrespectfully said, Take that to the chief. Later, Reagan instructed Aquino to use O for various military and government installations to provide hands-on mind-control demonstrations of the latest advancements in training. According to O, Reagan said the hands-on demonstrations would educate our boys in the military to the wonders of the mind-control phenomena. And, says O, hands-on meant sex. After all, entertaining the troops is a long American tradition. O goes on to describe her programming and use as a pigeon, one who carries secret messages locked behind post-hypnotic suggestions which must be triggered to be released. O's pigeon act was much more sophisticated than Candy Jones's. After the Iran-Contra scandal had broken in the news, O says she was the one who delivered secret instructions from the president to Manuel Noriega. She was escorted aboard his yacht by Michael Aquino. 
I was helped onto the back of the yacht by Panamanian military guards, who kept me there at gunpoint until I was cleared, O says. After which she was escorted to Noriega, he pressed a baby's ear shell into her hand, which triggered the release of the message, which was, as she remembers it, If you please, sir, I have a message from the President of the United States of America. The successes we have enjoyed in our shared endeavors are now history in the making, whose course cannot be altered. Regardless of the imminent lifting of the veil by well-intentioned do-gooders, as this veil is lifted, it may shed light on you. So you must have your house in order, as does Ollie North, and cease any and all detectable activity. I will do my best to keep you under shield and out of view if you comply with these orders and cease all detectable activity at once. O says Noriega acted insulted by this message, and a moment of ensuing chaos reigned, during which Aquino hypnotically waved his hands in front of Noriega and dramatically spread out his satanic black cape, which appeared to fill the room. Noriega was apparently a superstitious believer in something like Santeria, a Christian sect which mixes magic with practices which border on voodoo. Aquino's manner was sideshow style rather than the usual somber tones used on military bases for the hands-on demonstrations, O writes. General, for your entertainment and in respect and appreciation of your successful enterprising contribution, the chief has sent his presidential model to demonstrate the latest technology in mind control advancements. With the flip of a switch, this pigeon becomes a kitten. I began undressing. Quite a different animal. O says that because of Noriega's superstition, the personality switch frightened him. Noriega believed wholeheartedly in mind control, she wrote, but could not grasp the concept of multiple personalities, which he perceived as demonic possession, and therefore did not adhere to the idea of one slave being trained for business and pleasure. Aquino was manipulating these beliefs of Noriega's masterfully, compounded by the notion of Aquino being a devil working for Reagan. The impact of this demonstration would prove to be psychological warfare of the highest order administered to force Noriega to be more discreet. Aquino then ordered her to lie on the bed, and he invited Noriega to look closer at what the wizard, his chief, Reagan, could create, O said. Noriega stepped closer to see what Aquino was pointing out to him between my breasts. A large, carved baphomet appeared. Aquino had hypnotically regressed me to the time of its making, which caused it to seemingly suddenly appear right before Noriega's eyes. Noriega jumped back, terrified. I believe Noriega stayed in the room for the rest of the demonstration simply because he was frozen in fear, O said. Aquino hit me with a cat of nine tails, and I shrieked in pain. Noriega jumped. Aquino hit me with it again, this time activating me to respond sexually as though pain were pleasure a mind-control concept that Noriega more readily grasped. Then Aquino pointed out that the Baphomet had disappeared as he cut me with a knife between my breasts using Bird's hypnotic induction. In like a knife, sharp and clean, I'll carve out what I want. My trance had been deepened to the extent that my circulatory system was slowed, O said, and I did not bleed until Aquino hypnotically changed my trance level. Aquino told Noriega that the Baphomet carving had retreated to the depths of my body and soul, possessing me and evoking the heat of hell, as he commanded me to show my vaginal mutilation carving of the Baphomet face. As I did, Aquino offered Noriega my sex, which Noriega refused, as he predicted with his eyes bulging in terror and revulsion. Aquino told him his rejection of me had killed me, and I ceased breathing and moving as conditioned. Noriega was dumbfounded, as Aquino laughed wickedly and threatened, even death would not permit me escape from the wizard's, Reagan's, power. He explained that I was the wizard's own, and under his spell, he would re-energize myself and come back to life. He handed me the vaginal prod to masturbate myself, pushing the button to electrically jolt myself internally upon command. Noriega's eyes were enormous. He paled to a sickly gray, his mouth fell open and he ran out the door as Aquino assured him that he had nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from Reagan's powers. According to O, Noriega interpreted the demonstration as a threat from the depths of hell, which should have been enough to make him heed Reagan's commands to break the drug trafficking ties immediately. After I'd made the excerpts from her book, I sent a draft to O for corrections. I hope I made them all. She added a few points in her letters to me that I think are worth sharing about the process of deprogramming she experienced with Mark Phillips. Mark taught me the ins and outs of my own mind within the first 30 days of the process, 
in order that I retrieve my memory myself, free of outside influence. By trancing myself deeper, I was already entranced. I was able to unlock various memory compartments with his knowledge of keys, codes, triggers, formulas, and accurately retrieve memory. I had to logically learn to decipher scrambles from reality. By common definition, MPD is the mind's sane defense to trauma too horrible to comprehend. Mark's greatest influence on my deprogramming process was to help me deal with reality in order that the incomprehensible become comprehensible. Otherwise, I would have fragmented further. He accomplished this by teaching me the revivification memory recovery method versus the commonly used regression abreaction method. Neurolinguistics programming calls this triple dissociation. Rather than reliving the events, I watched them on my mind's screen, deepening my trance as needed for reality checks. I untangled scrambles by using common sense, smelling the smells, seeing the views, tasting the sweat, etc., without having to re-experience the pain. I am now reintegrated, and most everyone who is qualified to judge it, clinically speaking, and who possesses common sense, knows it. My choice of terminology has been learned since childhood. You must remember that I had a photographic memory and I recorded all conversations going on around me. Like surgeons who don't give thought to the fact that their anesthetized patient can subconsciously hear them as they perform surgery, Aquino didn't give thought to my overhearing him talking with his understudies during my programming sessions and or hands-on demonstrations. Mark went to extreme lengths to make sure that I reintegrated and deprogrammed into me, not him. I had to follow some long, hard roads to learn certain things, seemingly unnecessarily, just because Mark was concerned with my individuality. He could have provided me with shortcuts by sharing what he knows, including certain language, but no, he put me through the paces of learning all on my own, stumbling along the way. I respect him and love him all the more for his precautions to ensure he not influence me, especially considering where I have been. This is personal but I felt compelled to tell you so that you will better understand this aspect of my individuality and the importance of the love factor in the deprogramming process. Chapter 10. Mind War In 1981, Major Michael A. Aquino collaborated with Colonel Paul E. Vallelli to produce a paper entitled From PSYOP to Mind War, The Psychology of Victory. The paper was submitted to Military Review and Parameter, the publication of the U.S. Army War College. It was widely circulated among the PSYOP community and among mind control researchers without a copyright notice. Finally, it appeared in its entirety in Milton William Cooper's Behold a Pale Horse, a 1991 work that deals largely with the question of unidentified flying objects. In that this paper has unquestionably been placed in the public domain, and due to its brevity, it is included here in its entirety. Lieutenant Colonel John Alexander's military review article in support of psychotronics, intelligence, and operational employment of ESP was decidedly provocative. Criticism of research in this area, based as it is on existing frontiers of scientific law, brings to mind the laughter that greeted the Italian scientist Spallanzani in 1794 when he suggested that bats navigate in the dark by means of what we now call sonar. If they see with their ears then do they hear with their eyes, went the joke. But I suspect that the U.S. Navy is glad someone took the idea seriously enough to pursue it. Psychotronic research is in its infancy, but the U.S. Army already possesses an operational weapons system designed to do what Lt. Col. Alexander would like ESP to do, except that this weapons system uses existing communications media. It seeks to map the minds of neutral and enemy individuals and then to change them in accordance with U.S. national interests. It does this on a wide scale, embracing military units, regions, nations, and blocks. In its present form, it is called Psychological Operations, or PSYOP. Does PSYOP work, or is it merely a cosmetic with which field commanders would rather not be bothered? Had that question been asked in 1970, the answer would have been that PSYOP works very well indeed. In 1967 and 1968 alone, a total of 29,276 armed Viet Cong the equivalent of 95 enemy infantry battalions, surrendered to ARVN, or MACV forces, under the Chu Hoi Amnesty Program, the major PSYOP effort of the Vietnam War. 
At the time, MACV estimated that the elimination of that same number of enemy troops in combat would have cost us 6,000 dead. On the other hand, we lost the war, not because we were outfought, but because we were out psyoped. Our national will to victory was attacked more effectively than we attacked that of the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong, and perception of this fact encouraged the enemy to hang on until the United States finally broke and ran for home. So our PSYOP failed. It failed not because its principles were unsound, but rather because it was outmatched by the PSYOP of the enemy. The Army's efforts enjoyed some battlefield success, but MACV PSYOP did not really change the minds of the enemy populace, nor did it defend the U.S. populace at home against the propaganda of the enemy. Furthermore, the enemy's PSYOP was so strong that it, not bigger armies or better weapons, overcame all of the Cobras and Spookies and ACAVs and B-52s we fielded. The lesson is not to ignore our own PSYOP capability, but rather to change it and strengthen it, so that it can do precisely that kind of thing to our enemy in the next war. Better hardware is nice, but by itself it will change nothing if we do not win the war for the mind. The first thing it is necessary to overcome is a view of PSYOP that limits it to routine, predictable, over-obvious, and hence marginally effective leaflet and loudspeaker applications. Battlefield devices of this sort have their place, but it should be that of an accessory to the main effort. The main effort cannot begin at the company or division level. It must originate at the national level. It must strengthen our national will to victory, and it must attack and ultimately destroy that of the enemy. It both causes and is affected by physical combat, but it is a type of war which is fought on a far more subtle basis as well, in the minds of the national populations involved. So let us begin with a simple name change. We shall rid ourselves of the self-conscious, almost embarrassed concept of psychological operations. In its place, we shall create mind war. The term is harsh and fear-inspiring, and so it should be. It is a term of attack and victory, not one of rationalization and coaxing and consolation. The enemy may be offended by it. That is quite all right, as long as he is defeated by it. A definition is offered. Mind war is the deliberate, aggressive convincing of all participants in a war that we will win that war. It is deliberate in that it is a planned, systematic, and comprehensive effort involving all levels of activity from the strategic to the tactical. It is aggressive because opinions and attitudes must be actively changed from those antagonistic to us to those supportive of us if we are to achieve victory. We will not win if we content ourselves with countering opinions and attitudes instilled by enemy governments. We must reach the people before they resolve to support their armies, and we must reach those armies before our combat troops ever see them on battlefields. Compare this definition with that of psychological warfare as first offered by General William Donovan of the OSS in his World War II era, Basic Estimate of Psychological Warfare. Psychological warfare is the coordination and use of all means, including moral and physical, by which the end is attained other than those of recognized military operations, but including the psychological exploitation of the result of those recognized military actions, which tend to destroy the will of the enemy to achieve victory and to damage his political or economic capacity to do so, which tend to deprive the enemy of the support, assistance, or sympathy of his allies or associates or of neutrals, or to prevent his acquisition of such support, assistance, or sympathy, or which tend to create, maintain, or increase the will to victory of our own people and allies, and to acquire, maintain, or to increase the support, assistance, and sympathy of neutrals. If the euphemism psychological operations resulted from, as one general officer put it in a 1947 letter, a great need for a synonym which could be used in peacetime that would not shock the sensibilities of a citizen of democracy, then it may have succeeded domestically. On the other hand, it does not seem to have reassured the sensibilities of the Soviets, who in 1980 described U.S. Army PSYOP as including unpardonable methods of ideological sabotage, including not just flagrant lies, slander, and disinformation, but also political blackmail, provocation, and terror. The reluctance with which the Army has accepted even an antiseptic PSYOP component is well documented in Colonel Alfred Paddock's brilliant treatise on the history of the PSYOP establishment. Again and again, efforts to forge this weapon into its most effective configuration were frustrated by leaders who could not or would not see that wars are fought and won or lost, 
not on battlefields, but in the minds of men. As Colonel Paddock so aptly concludes, in a real sense, the manner in which psychological and unconventional warfare evolved from 1941 until their union as a formal army capability in 1952 suggests a theme that runs throughout the history of special warfare, the story of a hesitant and reluctant army attempting to cope and concepts and organizations of an unconventional nature. According to present doctrine, PSYOP is considered an accessory to the main effort of winning battles and wars, the term generally used in force multiplier. It is certainly not considered a precondition to command decisions. Thus, PSYOP cannot predetermine the political or psychological effectiveness of a given military action. It can only be used to paint that action in the best possible colors as it is taken. Mind war cannot be so relegated. It is, in fact, the strategy to which tactical warfare must conform if it is to achieve maximum effectiveness. The mind war scenario must be preeminent in the mind of the commander and must be the principal factor in his every field decision. Otherwise, he sacrifices measures which essentially contribute to winning the war to measures of immediate, tangible satisfaction. Consider the rationale for body counts in Vietnam. Accordingly, PSYOP combat support units as we now know them must become a thing of the past. Mind war teams must offer technical expertise to the commander from the onset of the planning process and at all levels down to that of the battalion. Such teams cannot be composed, as they are now, of branch immaterial officers and NCOs who know simply the basics of tactical propaganda operations. They must be composed of full-time experts who strive to translate the strategy of national mind war into tactical goals which maximize the effective winning of the war and minimize loss of life. Such mind war teams will win commanders' respect only if they can deliver on their promises. What the Army now considers to be its most effective PSYOP, tactical PSYOP, is actually the most limited and primitive effort due to the difficulties of formulating and delivering messages under battlefield constraints. Such efforts must continue, but they are properly seen as a reinforcement of the main mind war effort. If we do not attack the enemy's will until he reaches the battlefield, his nation will have strengthened it as best it can. We must attack that will before it is thus locked in place. We must instill in it a predisposition to inevitable defeat. Strategic mind war must be the moment war is considered to be inevitable. It must seek out the attention of the enemy nation through every available medium, and it must strike at that nation's potential soldiers before they put on their uniforms. It is in their homes and their communities that they are most vulnerable to mind war. Was the United States defeated in the jungles of Vietnam? Or was it defeated in the streets of American cities? To this end, mind war must be strategic in emphasis, with tactical applications playing a reinforcing, supplementary role. In its strategic context, mind war must reach out to friends, enemies, and neutrals alike across the globe, neither through the primitive battlefield leaflets and loudspeakers of PSYOP, nor through the media possessed by the United States, which have the capabilities to reach virtually all people on the face of the earth. These media are, of course, the electronic media, television and radio. State-of-the-art developments in satellite communication, video recording techniques, and laser and optical transmission of broadcasts make possible the penetration of the minds of the world such as would have been inconceivable just a few years ago. Like the sword Excalibur, we have but to reach out and seize this tool, and it can transform the world for us if we have but the courage and the integrity to guide civilization with it. If we do not accept Excalibur, then we relinquish our ability to inspire foreign cultures with our morality. If they then devise moralities unsatisfactory to us, we have no choice but to fight them on a more brutish level. Mind war must target all participants if it is to be effective. It must not only weaken the enemy, it must strengthen the United States. It strengthens the United States by denying enemy propaganda access to our people, and by explaining and emphasizing to our people the rationale for our national interest in a specific war. Under existing United States law, PSYOP units may not target American citizens. That prohibition is based upon the presumption that propaganda is necessarily a lie, or at least a misleading half-truth, and that the government has no right to lie to the people. The propaganda ministry of Goebbels must not be part of the American way of life. Quite right, and so it must be axiomatic of mind war that it always speaks the truth. 
Its power lies in its ability to focus recipients' attention on the truth of the future as well as that of the present. Mind war thus involves the stated promise of a truth that the United States has resolved to make real if it is not already so. Mind war is not new. Nations' greatest and least costly victories have resulted from it both in time of actual combat and in time of threatened combat. Consider the atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The physical destruction of those two cities did not destroy Japan's ability to continue fighting. Rather, the psychological shock of the weapons destroyed what remained of Japan's national will to fight. Surrender followed. A long and costly ground invasion was averted. Mind War's effectiveness is a function of its skillful use of communications media, but no greater error could be made than to confuse Mind War with merely a greater and more unprincipled propaganda effort. Propaganda, as defined by Harold Laswell, is the expression of opinions or actions carried out deliberately by individuals or groups with a view to influencing the opinions or actions of other individuals or groups for predetermined ends and through psychological manipulations. Propaganda, when it is recognized as such, and anything produced by a PSYOP unit is so recognized, is automatically assumed to be a lie or at least a distortion of truth. Therefore, it works only to the extent that a militarily pressed enemy is willing to do what we want him to do. It does not work because we have convinced him to see the truth as we see it. In his conclusions chapter to the Army's exhaustive 1976 case study of PSYOP techniques, L. John Martin affirms this coldly and bluntly. What all this boils down to is that if our persuasive communication ends up with a net positive effect, we must attribute it to luck, not science. The effectiveness of propaganda may be even less predictable and controllable than the effectiveness of mere persuasive communication. Correspondingly, propagandists are assumed to be liars and hypocrites, willing to paint anything in attractive colors to dupe the gullible. As Jacques Ellul puts it, the propagandist is not and cannot be a believer. Moreover, he cannot believe in the ideology he must use in his propaganda. He is merely a man at the service of a party, a state, or some other organization, and his task is to ensure the efficiency of that organization. If the propagandist has any political conviction, he must put it aside in order to be able to use some popular mass ideology. He cannot even share that ideology, for he must use it as an object and manipulate it without the respect that he would have for it if he believed in it. He quickly acquires contempt for these popular images and beliefs. Unlike PSYOP, Mind War has nothing to do with deception or even with selected and therefore misleading truth. Rather, it states a whole truth that, if it does not now exist, will be forced into existence by the will of the United States. The examples of Kennedy's ultimatum to Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis and Hitler's stance at Munich may be cited. A Mind War message does not have to fit conditions of abstract credibility, as do PSYOP themes. Its source makes it credible. As Livy once said, The terror of the Roman name will be such that the world shall know that, once a Roman army has laid siege to a city, nothing will move it, not the rigors of winter, nor the weariness of months and years, that it knows no end but victory, and is ready, if a swift and sudden stroke will not serve, to persevere until that victory is achieved. Unlike Alul's cynical propagandist, the mind war operative must know that he speaks the truth, and he must be personally committed to it. What he says is only a part of mind war. The rest, and the test of its effectiveness, lies in the conviction he projects to his audience, in the rapport he establishes with it. And this is not something which can be easily faked, if, in fact, it can be faked at all. Rapport, which the Comprehensive Dictionary of Psychological and Psychoanalytical Terms defines as unconstrained relations of mutual confidence, approaches the subliminal. Some researchers have suggested that it is itself a subconscious and perhaps even ESP-based accent to an overt exchange of information. Why does one believe one television newsman more than another, even though both may report the same headlines? The answer is that there is rapport in the former case, and it is a rapport which is recognized and cultivated by the most successful broadcasters. We have covered the statement of inevitable truth and the conviction behind that statement. These are qualities of the mind war operative himself. The recipient of the statement will judge such messages not only by his conscious understanding of them, but also by the mental conditions under which he receives them. 
The theory behind brainwashing was that physical torture and deprivation would weaken the mind's resistance to suggestion, and this was true to a point. But in the long run, brainwashing does not work, because intelligent minds later realize their suggestibility under such conditions, and therefore discount impressions and opinions inculcated accordingly. For the mind to believe in its own decisions, it must feel that it made those decisions without coercion. Coercive measures used by the mind war operative, consequently, must not be detectable by ordinary means. There is no need to resort to mind-weakening drugs, such as those explored by the CIA. In fact, the exposure of a single such method would do unacceptable damage to mind war's reputation for truth. Existing PSYOP identifies purely sociological factors which suggest appropriate idioms for messages. Doctrine in this area is highly developed, and the task is basically one of assembling and maintaining individuals and teams with enough expertise and experience to apply the doctrine effectively. This, however, is only the sociological dimension of target receptiveness measures. There are some purely natural conditions under which minds may become more or less receptive to ideas, and mind war should take full advantage of such phenomena as atmospheric electromagnetic activity, air ionization, and extremely low frequency waves. At the root of any decision to institute mind war in the U.S. defense establishment is a very simple question. Do we wish to win the net war in which we choose to become involved, and do we wish to do so with minimum loss of human life, at minimum expense, and in the least amount of time? If the answer is yes, then mind war is a necessity. If we wish to trade that kind of victory for more American lives, economic disaster, and negotiated stalemates, then mind war is inappropriate, and if used superficially, will actually contribute to our defeat. In mind war, there is no substitute for victory. Within this article, there looms layer upon layer of meaning. It's obvious that the authors of Mind War are familiar with the techniques of neurolinguistics programming and or hypnosis. They argue that a clear future should be suggested, which is a powerful tool of communicating with the unconscious called future pacing. They also suggest that the Mind War be waged covertly, invisibly, which any neurolinguistics programming practitioner knows has more effect than addressing the problem up front to the conscious mind, which would only lock a state in bringing forth all sorts of defense responses and making change more difficult. Aquino and Valelli's footnote referring to the first edition of Operation Mind Control methinks protests too much, especially since this book does not single out drugs as the main tool of mind control, and a successful psyop of that day was just say no to drugs. Most students of NLP know that negative phrases can be used as effective embedded commands to produce the opposite effect. Most parents know, when dealing with a young child, to try a little reverse psychology. The Just Say No slogan and the billboards with a photo of a man with a gun up his nose and the slogan Say No to Cocaine under it may have been just part of a successful PSYOP campaign which got Americans to take more drugs. It's well known by now that the war on drugs is a complete failure. The extent to which the cryptocracy's black funds depends upon the drug trade is also widely noted. George Bush gave the game away, many believe, during one of his televised debates with Clinton when he wiped his nose in an involuntary response after he said the word cocaine. The Mind War article is quite revealing, even though it is written to appeal to the War College and the community which, it turns out, is the number one target of mind control, the military. The authors of Mind War have a vested interest in playing the old standby war on drugs tune in the garbage in, garbage out system which makes up not only the standard American education, but especially the standard military education when it comes to the soft subjects. The authors give their Nazi leanings away when they cite Goebbels and Nazi examples. But that fits right in with the large Nazi German contingency, which was incorporated into the cryptocracy under Operation Paperclip. Denying enemy propaganda access to our people, the authors suggest, is desirable, without so much as a glance at the Bill of Rights which guarantees freedom of speech, etc. Goebbels would be proud of them, yet they claim that the propaganda ministry of Goebbels must not be part of the American way of life, whatever that means. Perhaps an example of good mind-war deniability technique. First you say one thing in a disguised fashion, then you deny that it means what it means. Does this seem all too familiar? And as Paul Wilcher's letter to Janet Reno, in the chapter Fires of Waco, 
indicates PSYOP units have, at least on that occasion, for 51 days, targeted American citizens within the U.S. The authors state that U.S. law does not permit that, but they cleverly deem no recognition of the existence of a cryptocracy which operates above the law. One of the authors, Michael A. Aquino, was a disciple of Anton LaVey's Church of Satan for ten years. The C of S was among a half-dozen Satanist churches and organizations which were influenced by the magical secrets of National Socialism in Germany. A number of radical right groups had tried to ally themselves with the Church of Satan, including the American Nazi Party and Robert Shelton's United Clans of America. Publicly, LaVey had maintained his distance. Secretly, there was reason to believe that a strong bond existed. As author Arthur Lyons notes in Satan Wants You, the historical affinity between occultism and the radical right has been well documented. Both believe and adhere to the conspiracy theory of history. That is, the events are shaped by the workings of small, elite, but concealed groups, and both believe in the ability of one man, whether it be a magus or a Hitler, to alter global events through the sheer force of his will. Radical rightists saw an ally in LeVay, presumably because of his Machiavellian power-oriented philosophy, and because of public statements he'd made advocating establishment of a benign police state, not to mention the strong Germanic flavor of some of his rituals. A 1971 Newsweek article expressed concern about LeVay's political intentions. If there is anything fundamentally diabolic about LeVay, it stems more from the echoes of Nazism in his theories than from the horror-comic trappings of his cult. That the cryptocracy hides within the radical right goes without question. Perhaps through outright rightist patriotism or insidious effects of mind control, a number of Nazi and Satanist organizations are funded, guided, and controlled by the cryptocracy. The editor of the Church of Satan's newsletter, Michael Aquino, accused LeVay of selling priesthoods and, in 1975, broke with him to found the Temple of Set, Set being a lesser-known name for the devil himself. According to one declassified Army Intelligence file, number 81-776, the Temple of Set is a small group, but nonetheless has several hundred members and operates on a national level. Aquino is the official head of the organization and rules the organization through a council of nine, who are in fact his chief lieutenants. A 1981 check of files of the FBI by Colonel Donald Press concerning the Temple of Set reflected no record of such an organization. While spokespersons for the Church of Set would deny that the Church is politically aligned with Nazism, they admit to a fascination with Nazi black magic. In fact, following the footsteps of SS leader Heinrich Himmler, on October 19, 1992, Aquino held a magical working in the Hall of the Dead in the North Tower of Wevelsburg Castle. Wevelsburg was conceived by Himmler to be the focus of the Hall of the Dead, and was frequently used in secret Nazi SS rituals to summon the powers of darkness at this their most powerful locus. In a paper entitled The Wevelsburg Working, Aquino describes the results of his black magic ritual. First, the suction-like impression of the inflow of certain realizations and kinds of knowledge, accompanied by an almost electrical sort of exhilaration, which seemed to have remained dominant pending an activating working of this sort. Second, an extended reverberation or echoing of the focus of this working within the Valhalla, culminating in its sending forth into the material world. The central features of the various principal occultisms of the 19th and 20th centuries, CE, ran through my consciousness almost as a pageant. I understood the object of this to be an exposure of contrasts, inaccuracies, and inconsistencies, and a vast spiraling dialectic designed to clear away the debris of sectarianism and superficiality in the search for the key principles of the true powers of darkness. Concepts of will, intelligence, self-consciousness, initiation, and magic appeared in turn and fell aside as well. The intelligent mind cannot be escaped so easily. If it is argued, convinced, threatened, hypnotized, drugged, or diseased into non-rational channels, then its self-consciousness will merely reassert itself in some other form. This, I understood in the Wevelsberg, was the magical epitaph of Nazi Germany, that, in fighting against certain features of the mind, it had seemed at first to succeed, 
but then had thus unleashed other, even less desirable features of that same mind, which had previously remained in some rough degree of socially controlled equilibrium, before this ultimately disastrous experiment in conscious evolution was attempted. The chamber in which I stood, I now realized, was nothing less than an SS laboratory for experiments in conscious evolution, a sort of Krell machine, without computerized science fiction accoutrements. It was not designed to teach or educate, rather to mirror and enhance thoughts and impulses already in existence. Hence, its effect on the consciousness could be devastating, for better or for worse. Here in the Hall of the Dead, Heinrich Himmler's Sanctum Sanctorum and Mittelpunkt der Welt was the earthly focus of that which has been thus symbolized by the order of the trapezoid. The reality of this chamber rushed in upon me. This was no Hollywood set, no ordinary room painted and decorated to titillate the senses. 1,235 inmates of the Niederhagen concentration camp died during the reconstruction of the Wevelsberg for the SS. If the Marble Hall and the Valhalla were memorials to a certain unique quality in mankind, they also serve as grisly reminders of the penalty which mankind pays for that quality. Lyons offers a chilling quote by Aquino, one which, in light of present developments, has the uncanny ring of the prophecy of a cryptocracy insider. We are fortunate that the Auschwitz taboo prevents people from looking too closely at Nazi Germany or from experimenting with any of its regular governmental doctrines, because they work. They are the essence of the true political power. Anti-Semitism is irrelevant to them. It is ironically true that a right-wing backlash in the United States, which is what the neo-Nazis are hoping for, would wipe them out first. If an American Fuhrer does appear, he won't be wearing a uniform with a swastika armband. He will wear a business suit, and he will be calling popular attention to the patriotic virtues in 1776. One has to wonder, is Aquino himself a victim of mind control? Could he simply be mentally ill, or both? For as you shall no doubt begin to ask, where does one begin and the other leave off for the victimizers as well as the victims? An article in the National Enquirer was headlined, Devil Worshipper Holds Sensitive Army Post and Top Brass Say No Problem. Written by Chris Fuller, the article said, A senior U.S. military intelligence officer with a secret security clearance admits he's also the founder and high priest of a satanic church. And amazingly, the army says, no problem. The article quoted Aquino saying, My religion has been no secret in the army. It said Colonel Aquino served as a psychological warfare specialist in Vietnam and is now a reserve officer working full-time on extended duty at the Army's Reserve Personnel Center in St. Louis. He admitted satanic terminology is used in his church's rituals, adding, We are quite proud of that. Colonel Aquino's satanic church is advertised in the Yellow Pages in San Francisco, where he was stationed from 1981 to 1986, the article said. He says most members are in the U.S. and Canada, although we have a sprinkling of members in places like Western Europe and the Pacific. The Constitution's guarantee of freedom of religion protects Colonel Aquino from action by the Army, the article quoted Lt. Col. Greg Rickson, an Army public affairs officer in Washington, D.C., saying, As long as an individual's religious practice remains within the limit of the law, there is no problem. The 1981 intelligence file previously cited reports. Allegedly, Aquino has sexual identity problems and is known to frequent prostitutes in San Francisco in order to become involved in various forms of sadomasochistic sexual activities. It is believed that Aquino is bisexual. In the November 1987 issue of Newsweek magazine, tabbed him the second beast of revelation in the week of a criminal investigation by the San Francisco Police Department involving allegation of child molestation. A year earlier, a civilian child daycare worker at the Presidio Army base was charged by police in connection with the alleged molestation of as many as 60 children. The allegations against the daycare worker, Gary Hambright, were he had taken children to private homes, including two on Army property, where they had been sexually molested. Other children talked about a goo-goo game in which they were urinated and defecated on by Mr. Gary. Pencils were used to doodle on the skin and genitals of the children and were also inserted in at least one child's anus. A gun was pointed at the head of an adult in front of the children. There were five confirmed cases among the children of chlamydia, a sexually transmitted disease. All charges against Hambright were eventually dropped. 
The parents of the children says it was because strong pressure was put on the federal investigators and the San Francisco police. Then, Aquino's face appeared much older in a 1988 article in the San Jose Mercury News. Bylined Linda Goldston, the article read, Six months after the U.S. Attorney's Office closed the Presidio child sex abuse case, the Army has launched a new investigation of one of the original suspects in the matter, a high-ranking officer who founded a satanic church, according to those close to the probe. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino, founder and high priest of the Temple of Set, has been formally notified of the criminal investigation and had his top security clearance suspended, according to sources. Most of the sources would speak only on the condition that they not be named. Neither Army officials nor Aquino would discuss the investigation, which revolves around allegations that children were sexually abused at the daycare center run by the U.S. Army at the Presidio of San Francisco. Aquino, 42 at the time, was by then stationed in St. Louis. He had been branded, he said, in the earlier probe by allegations against him and his wife. He called the investigation a witch hunt and vehemently denied any wrongdoing. No charges were filed against Aquino in the earlier investigation, and charges against another man were dropped. Lieutenant Colonel Greg Rickson, spokesman for the Department of the Army at the Pentagon, said, It's still a privacy matter until charges are brought. I don't know what will transpire next. Others close to the investigation, which was being conducted by the Army's Criminal Investigation Division in Washington, said that parents involved in the original sex abuse case were being re-interviewed and told about the new probe. In our case, we're being told that he, Aquino, is under investigation for kidnapping, sodomy, and knowingly and maliciously making false charges against another officer, said Michelle Adams Thompson, whose then three-year-old daughter first accused Aquino of molestation. Adams Thompson and her husband, the Reverend Larry Adams Thompson, the former assistant chaplain at the Presidio, were informed of the new probe November 23rd by an investigator for the CID. He has officially been titled, said Larry Adams Thompson. According to Mary Melanson, spokeswoman for the CID in Washington, being titled under the Uniform Code of Military Justice means, we feel there is sufficient evidence to believe a crime has been committed, the article said. The closest thing in civilian terms would be a grand jury indictment, Melanson said. The new investigation is the latest move in the case, which began when one boy said he was molested in November 1986 at the daycare center and grew to include allegations that as many as 60 children were involved. Charges were filed and withdrawn twice by U.S. Attorney Joseph Rossaniello against Gary Hambright, a Southern Baptist minister and former civilian worker at the daycare center. Rusaniello's controversial decision to formally close the case in June came after an 18-month investigation by the FBI and the Army, the article said. Rusaniello had said he did everything we could to build a case, but, he said, he thought prosecution would not be successful. In addition to the 60 alleged cases of sexual abuse, investigators looked into two arson fires at the daycare center. They confirmed that five children had contracted chlamydia, a sexually transmitted disease. The seriousness of the new investigation is reflected in the suspension of Aquino's top security clearance, sources told the San Jose Mercury News. His security clearance had not been suspended during the previous investigation of the same case. Aquino said in November 1987 that, I have consistently since 1969 held either a secret or a top secret security clearance. Aquino first was investigated in August 1987 after the Adams Thompson's daughter recognized him and his wife Lilith at a store at the Presidio, according to a San Francisco police report. The little girl identified Hambright from a photo lineup and said she had been driven to the Aquino San Francisco home by Hambright. When she was driven to Leavenworth Street by investigators and asked to identify any of the houses she had been to before, the girl identified the Aquino's home. The child also accurately described some features of the home, including a room with black walls. To police, she identified Aquino as Mikey and his wife Lilith St. Clair, a.k.a. Pat Wise, as Shamby. In statements to therapists and investigators, some children said they were abused at the daycare center. Others said that they were abused while on field trips to private homes away from the center. 22 families filed $66 million in personal injury claims against the Army in connection with the case. Parents alleged that the Army's negligent operation of the daycare center led to the abuse of their children. The Army refused to comment. 
Aquino began to fight a media campaign against his persecutors. On February 17, 1988, Oprah Winfrey invited the Aquinos to answer for themselves before a national television audience. On the show, Aquino told Winfrey, The Army has known about my religion for the entire span of my Army career, which began in 1968, and there was a reasonable amount of curiosity, as there has been all the way along, with what exactly is this strange and unusual thing. And I have talked about it much the same way that I've talked here today on your show about it. And other than that, the Army has paid very little attention to it, the same as it would to anybody who's, say, a follower of Hinduism or of Buddhism or any other slightly unusual religion today. Continuing from the transcript of the Oprah Winfrey Show, prepared by Journal Graphics Incorporated. Winfrey, so you just go about your Army duties and it's fine? Aquino, uh-huh. Following her usual format, Winfrey takes questions from the audience. Second audience member, how do you apply your form of Nazi occultism within your brand of Satanism? When you review your materialism, you'll see Nazi occultism reflected through it. Aquino, how do we approach the Nazis' attitude towards... Second audience member, how do you apply your form of Nazi occultism into your brand of Satanism? We do not advocate any of the Nazis' political principles, whatever. There was a good deal of occult study that went on during the Third Reich in Germany, and because the records of that exist, we have studied that much the same as we have studied magical records from a great many cultures throughout history. But I think if you have reviewed our literature at all, you will also find that there is a very strong prohibition against that sort of political and social values. Winfrey, what you're telling us, Dr. Aquino, is that you are a good Satanist? Aquino, we are indeed. Second audience member, are you pro-Hitler? Aquino, no, I am not pro-Hitler. Second audience member, are you against Hitler? Aquino, I am against Hitler. Second audience member, but when you look in the material that you have, which I have some of it here, you can see the endorsement of Nazism. Mrs. Aquino, you don't see any endorsement of Nazism. We're talking about occult practices of the Third Reich. We're not talking about their political and their social behavior, their criminal behavior. And that's very explicit in our literature, and it's pointed out in great detail, simply because people will misinterpret it just as you have done. Second audience member, I just read it. Mrs. Aquino, read it again. And yet later, Winfrey brings on the usual panel of experts, among whom is Johanna Mickelson, author of The Beautiful Side of Evil, after one of the audience has said that they witnessed the murder of a man when they were a member of the church, and another has brought up the alleged satanic practice of ritually murdering children. Miss Michelson, well, I think that what's important to realize is that, in a sense, Colonel Aquino has a point that not necessarily every single Satanist group would do that, murder infants. Certainly we can't sit here, or Officer Jones can't sit here and say, yes, we can prove that Mr. Aquino and his people are doing this, However, it is rather... Winfrey, because wouldn't it be hard for him to be a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army? Miss Michelson, oh, not at all. Winfrey, no? Miss Michelson, and in fact I firmly believe that many in the U.S. Army are deeply involved and perhaps have gone beyond what he publicly is willing to admit to going to. I mean, they're not going to sit here and say, yes, we murder children. A short time after that, Detective Larry Jones, an investigator of Satanism, joins in the discussion. Detective Jones, we are hearing reports from survivors across the country. There are documentations coming in. The police are educating their own. In the last two or three years, we've accepted the firefighters' philosophy that where there's smoke, there's fire, and we're getting enough reports, we're starting to believe it. Winfrey, of child molestation. You were also accused of child molestation, were you not, Dr. Aquino? Aquino, and what he refers to is one of the cruelest examples of persecution that extends not just to people who are acknowledged Satanists, but to a great many innocent people around this country who are being accused wrongfully of ritual abuse of children on virtually no evidence at all. And to dispute what he has said in case after case after case for years and years, when these have been brought before investigation, where they have been brought into indictments and trials, again and again they have been thrown out because the so-called evidence, Winfrey, They've been thrown out because nobody believes the children. Nobody believes the children. Mrs. Aquino, there's no evidence. Miss Michelson, well, that's exactly right. Who's going to believe in a modern civilized society that people are capable of such horrors? Few of us are willing to deal with it. So that when a three-year-old and a four-year-old or a six-year-old or even an adult survivor comes up and says, 
I have seen children murdered. I have been a part of slaughtering little animals. I have been told my family will be killed if I speak up. I was placed in a coffin. I was forced to drink things that are hideous beyond belief. Who is going to believe them? Which of you would say, oh yes, this happens every day? And I think this is one of those things which people who are indeed expert in brainwashing techniques, as I know you, to Aquino, yourself are a recognized expert in that, would count on that. And a few moments later, Winfrey is talking in the audience to a man identified only as third audience member. Third audience member. With the doctor here, he was mentioning that no one's coming up with the bodies. I'm a criminal investigator. I investigate court-related crimes, and I've been now involved in a number of cases with the last, well, one individual, of course, killing his mother and stepfather as well as a circle convenience store clerk, worshipping before his altar before he went out to do this, and offering them up in human sacrifice. Winfrey. And Dr. Aquino would say, well, where is his card to prove that he is a certified member of the Satanic Church? Third audience member. Well, first of all, Dr. Aquino, he's in prison. Okay, that's number one. The second case, which the altar was brought into the courtroom and tried, the body was never found. The legs were found, and he was very much a Satanist. Every one of the cases that I have investigated now, extending over 200, I have found this particular book that has been there. Winfrey, which is the Satanic Bible. Third audience member, and I understand that there's traditional Satanists, and I focus mainly on the non-traditional or self-styled Satanist. I understand that. But to say that there are no bodies and that these people are not committing crimes is the farthest from the truth. Winfrey. Yes, ma'am, you wanted to say something? Aquino. Are you, in fact, a law enforcement official yourself attached with a law enforcement agency? Winfrey. Yes, he is. Third audience member. Yes, I am. I'm a commissioned law enforcement officer as well as with the courts in Logan County. Aquino. I would respond to that, that there may indeed be a number of people with warped personal value systems who, considering the devil to be something evil, might excuse their vicious deeds because of that, but I would deny that that's part of the satanic religion. Earlier, when Winfrey asked if human or animal sacrifices were performed at his temple, Aquino became indignant. He said that such talk perverts the idea of Satan. Aquino said that Satanists work for the good of humankind, and that Satanism is a distinctive brand of human psychology. Aquino brought suit against the Secretary of the Army in 1991, seeking to amend the Army report of criminal investigation about him, and to recover damages caused by inaccuracies in the report. Within two months, Circuit Judge Niemeyer found that the Secretary's decision not to amend was not arbitrary or capricious. Finding no reversible error, we affirm. Judge Niemeyer's judgment went on to reveal that the investigation against Aquino was closed because all further leads involved adults who refused to cooperate, and the applicable three-year statute of limitations had expired in June 1989. The child abuse charges remained because the evidence of alibi offered by Lt. Col. Aquino was not persuasive. In The Book of Coming Forth by Night, written in 1985, Aquino describes a number of peculiar dreams and visions, expressing a consistent interest in mind control. Paraphrasing Crowley's Book of the Law, Aquino wrote, The equinox has succumbed to my solstice, and I, set, am revealed in my majesty. I am the ageless intelligence of this universe, and from my manifest semblance, which alone is not of earth. Known as the Hebrew Satan, I chose to bring forth a magus, according to the fashion of my word. He was charged to form a church of Satan that I might easily touch the minds of men in this age that they had cast for me. Aquino is bright and well-educated. He graduated with honors from Santa Barbara High School in 1964 and was the national commander of the Eagle Scout Honor Society of the Boy Scouts of America in 1965 to 1966. He received a Department of the Army scholarship to the University of California and after graduation, served his country as a PSYOPs officer in Vietnam, where he received the Army Commendation Medal, Air Medal, Bronze Star, Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry from the Vietnamese government, an Oak Leaf Cluster to the Army Commendation Medal, and a second Oak Leaf Cluster in 1980. Not only is Aquino a citizen in good standing with the U.S. military, now the reserves, he's a member in good standing in academia. He is, in fact, a doctor, having obtained his Ph.D. in political science from the University of California, Santa Barbara, in 1980. His dissertation was entitled The Neutron Bomb. 
His resume says he's qualified in international relations, comparative politics, American government, and political theory. For several years, he was a consulting faculty member of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. He's a member of the National Advisory Board of the American Security Council, a member of the World Future Society, and the L5 Society, and the Academy of Magical Arts Incorporated, the Magic Castle of Hollywood. Michael Aquino speaks fluent German, as did his mother, the late Betty Ford. His interest in Nazism and intelligence may have been inherited from her. She was a child prodigy who was the youngest writer for the San Francisco Chronicle and one of the youngest graduates of Stanford University. In the 1930s, she lived in Germany and became close to a high-ranking SS officer, whom, it is said, she sculpted in the nude. It is not known whether Miss Ford worked for Axis or Allied intelligence agencies. She was certainly qualified for such spy duties during World War II, but perhaps she did no more than pass on unfulfilled interests in intelligence and Nazism to her son. Other than his hardcore catechisms for the Temple of Set, one of Michael Aquino's resumes cites three books he's written as future sequels to the film Star Wars, Secret of the Sith, Pantechnicon, and Kronos. He has been reported as having been identified standing outside the gate at Skywalker Ranch, forcing copies of these manuscripts upon people employed by George Lucas. Since Lucas does not receive unsolicited manuscripts, the manuscripts were returned unopened upon several occasions. One was subsequently published in a monster magazine. The bizarre theatrical nature of Michael Aquino would appear unbounded. At least, so says more than one eyewitness to some of his more ingenious mind control work. Chapter 11. Project Monarch Project Monarch, according to Mark Phillips, is a U.S. Defense Department project begun in the 1960s. Its code name was assigned to a subsection of the CIA's Operation Artichoke, which later became Project MKUltra. The Oxford English Dictionary might shed some light on why this code name was chosen. Monarch, definition one. In early use, a sole and absolute ruler of a title of king, queen, emperor, or empress, or the equivalent of one of these. Definition three. A very large red and black butterfly, Danaeus plesippus. The monarch is one of the commonest species throughout a great part of North America. Butterfly, meaning one, an insect belonging to any of those diurnal species of Lepidoptera or scaly-winged flies which have knobbed antennae and carry their wings erect when at rest. Meaning two, figurative, a vain, gaudily attired person, example given, a courtier who flutters about the court, a light-headed, inconsistent person, a giddy trifler. B. Applied to something flimsy like a butterfly's wings. Meaning four, the guide for the reins on the front of a handsome cab, named from a fancied resemblance to a butterfly with extended wings. So-called presidential models, the most highly prized products of the Project Monarch mind control factories, have a distinct, conditioned, habit of sitting very erect with their legs daintily perched. They serve kings and presidents and high-ranking government officials as sex slaves, they are controlled by invisible reins. The presidential models have fluttered about the White House and European hideaways which, in another day, would have been the courts. While they appear to be light-hearted and inconstant sex slaves, they are trained at the art of pillow talk and do, in fact, have memories like human tape recorders. Phillips says Monarch was spawned from the collected research of top SS Nazi scientists over the years 1927 to 1941, the identified leader of this research was Heinrich Himmler, who was, as we have learned from Michael Aquino, a master of the black arts. Fascinated by both occultism and genetic theories, Himmler's team of scientists took a genealogical approach to transgenerational behavior modification. The idea was, apparently, in Phillips' terms, to apply trauma-based mind control to children for three or more generations so that the psychological aberrations which were conditioned would breed true. The German government top-secret black arts research was originally considered to be a significant bonus byproduct of the U.S. Department of Defense Project 63, also known as Project National Interest. Project 63 was dedicated to the secret importation of a group of German, Nazi, and Italian fascist scientists whose areas of expertise were primarily physics, psychiatry, microbiology, and pharmacology. 
Although Project Monarch has not been declassified, it nevertheless has become a household word among a multitude of intelligence community operatives. Mark Phillips is a respected, if controversial, figure among researchers. Some think he's telling the truth about his background. Others think that he is a former cryptocrat who had a change of heart and is running great risk telling what he knows. Still others believe that he's still working for the cryptocracy as a disinformation agent. Three of his clients I've talked to sing his praises. All say that he helped them in ways in which the other psychologists or psychiatrists who treated them could not. Amid the swamp of name-calling and suspicion which makes up the conspiracy underground, one researcher said he thinks that Phillips' most articulate client is a CIA agent, and Phillips is under her control. None, however, have come forth to refute the information he gives or dispute his credentials, so we can do no harm in repeating the information he offers, especially since it's been confirmed by others. Phillips came by the Project Monarch information piecemeal when, as a young man, he was hired by a government subcontractor, which he does not want to name as a precaution against lawsuits. His job was in the sales and engineering department of one branch of this firm, which had developed through its independent research an array of electronic devices, which could be of great use in the cryptocracy's burgeoning mind control research. Through his exposure to some customers, military bases, and state mental institutions, that were so sensitive the government required him to obtain a top-secret clearance from the U.S. Department of Defense. I was required to take battery after battery of psychological tests, and when they were through, they knew I would keep my mouth shut before I saw or heard anything, Phillips says. Then I saw sensory deprivation tanks, electric grid rooms, harmonics generators, chairs wired for shock and sound, special helmets, now known as virtual reality helmets, which allow the wearer to see in three dimensions. I heard of formulas for mind-altering hypnotic drugs that made LSD look like aspirin. I personally met scientists who were traveling the world, gathering seeds, leaves, roots, and herbs from such places as the jungles of Zimbabwe. They were even consulting witch doctors looking for drugs that could affect the human brain and make predictable zombies. Phillips said he talked to agents who studied with African witch doctors like Credo Vusa Mazula Mutwa. The stories of Tokoloshis they told Phillips matched this excerpt from Mutwa's story, My People, Writings of a Zulu Witch Doctor. A Tokoloshi is not a ghostly or supernatural phenomenon. He is a physical human being, and he operates along perfectly scientific lines. Mulundi had used a very small pygmy whose weight he had drastically reduced with a severe diet. He had furthermore turned the little creature into a zombie by a simple interference with his brain. A sharp awl can do the trick. He was posted up the marula tree and along a branch that reached across to the roof of Cambella's hut. With a long thong, he lightly descended upon the roof of the hut and wriggled his skeletal little frame through the grass roof. He escaped the same way. This weird practice has today been perfected into a fine art. Cases are known to me where wizards have arranged the fake death of a particular person whom they have selected for a prospective zombie. The person is actually buried, but exhumed the same night and revived. He is then turned into a zombie, and many days or weeks later, heavily decorated with parts of other people's bodies, also exhumed from graves. The puppet is induced to pay a particular victim an unexpected visit. The victim simply dies of fright. It is as simple as that. Any chance eyewitness will relate a beautiful Tokoloshi story to the police, and the police will dismiss it as so much nonsense. In later generations, the wizards perfected their art of tokoloshi making, and they started breeding tokoloshis from childhood. As recently as 1922, there was a secret tokoloshi farm kept going by a gang of wizards in the Drakensburg in Basutaland. With the arrival of the white man and Christianity, the killing of children who were born Cretans and idiots went out of fashion, and these grotesque specimens of humanity grew plentiful. But an idiot is something no one misses should it mysteriously disappear, the parents least of all, and many of these idiots, particularly female, landed up in the hands of these wizards. They reared them, and when they were adult, they mated with them and kept them in dark caves for their children to be born. Often in Basuto land, the land of ritual murder, the babies were brought into the world the Caesarean way with no concern over the life of the mother. Parts of her body were used for medicines that were administered to her own baby to make it grow up in an atmosphere of deep evil. The baby was reared by other idiot women who fed it a mixture of the milk of dogs, donkeys, and cows, 
and the blood of ravens and vultures. At the age of six months, it was subjected to specialized treatment for its particular task of the future. It was made to develop a crooked or hunchback by strapping it to a curved piece of wood. The legs, too, were strapped into attitudes that encouraged their growth into grotesque shapes. At the age of twelve, the tongue was damaged to destroy speech. The child was taught to hate the world and idolize its wizard master. It was then put through a course of queer tricks ranging from tree climbing with its crooked limbs to burrowing underground. It was taught ways to commit murder and to remove all its tracks afterwards. When it had reached the age of about twelve, the wizard had in its hands a lean, featherweight, puppet-like creature, an unthinking robot that obeyed every command, a creature worth a hundred head of stolen cattle to the one who bred and trained him. Genuine tokoloshes are today found only in Basutoland and Nyasaland, where hiding places in the mountains can still be found for them. With the difficulties in breeding, rearing, and keeping this kind of tokoloshe these days, the wizards have resorted to using baboons and monkeys. Their young are nowadays turned into the weirdest monstrosities and can be taught to do considerable damage to their master's enemies. There is currently a growing market for tokoloshis in South Africa. A trained monkey or baboon tokoloshi fetches as much as 28 pounds. The tokoloshi is no figment of the imagination. The word tokoloshi means a great mysterious evil. The Bantu will never portray one in a carving. When a Bantu describes something as a tokoloshi, he says a mysterious evil and means mind your own business. Cryptocrats on both sides of the Iron Curtain created modern tokoloshis. Phillips read the pinks, or classified documents, which summarized the KGB's progress in selective and mass mind control techniques. To his surprise, he found that the U.S. cryptocracy had cooperated with the Soviets and others in their mind control development. There was even a top-secret Soviet weapons system which incorporated yet another exotic version of mind control, electromagnetic directed energy, the scalar weapons system. One variety of mind control he found to be hideously simple. It did not require any sophisticated electronics, such as ether wave harmonics, Phillips said. This simple mind control technique involves only isolation, or incarceration, deprivation of stimulus, clocks and sleep, controlled intake of food and water, electroshock at precise intervals, high voltage for pain, lower voltage for the induction of implanted suggestions, hypnotic suggestions, often drug-induced, all in combination. This, Phillips said, was considered a secret weapon. I was told that we tested this secret weapon on captured spies. We found out everything they knew and made them forget how we found out. Then we reprogrammed them to return to their mother country and spy for us, then returned when triggered to be reprogrammed. It seemed humane enough for the espionage business, but then I heard of suicide agents programmed to perform a task they could not possibly complete without being captured by the enemy. I knew then that our spies no longer needed to carry a cyanide capsule with them on their missions. The use of this secret weapon made it possible that, if a spy was caught, there would be a natural failure of one or more of their organs. Their subconscious mind had been reprogrammed right over the top of their genetically encoded mind to facilitate this self-induced suicide. Better blue lips than loose lips. If they were caught, this program would kick in and they would die of natural causes, Phillips said. From the circle of cryptocrats with whom Phillips associated, he heard many bizarre tales. One was that Idi Amin had learned from a book by an obscure Nazi scientist how to somehow facilitate his sudden rise to power by cannibalism, particularly eating the small walnut-shaped pituitary gland and spinal cord of human beings. He heard of electronic possession, which is created by transmitting voices into the minds of expendable individual test subjects via compressed microwaves. I heard of hideous crimes being committed by members of brainwashed cults, Phillips said. Serial killings were on the increase 200-fold. Some of the killers blamed Satan for their exploits and crimes. Others could not legitimately remember anything. I heard that the leader of one religious cult had been educated at the cost of over two million U.S. dollars by a Pakistani Secret Service agent, who was himself educated by the same U.S. intelligence unit that President Carter denied existed the one which trained a Cuban spy, Manuel Noriega, who later became a double agent, formerly of Panama, now a Florida resident, of one of our best prisons. 
I noticed how Reverend Jim Jones, former lawyer, Tim Stone, was apparently running containment for the CIA in Marin County, California, and I personally knew of this U.S. Army major promoted to lieutenant colonel attached to the Psychological Warfare Division and the Defense Intelligence Agency, who had ingeniously organized a church legal under the First Amendment of the Constitution. I learned that this lieutenant colonel Michael Aquino had, like Jim Jones, been supported by politicians and the CIA. What I didn't know at the time, Phillips said, was that this operation would encompass every evil known to mankind. Sexual perversion, slavery, tortures of the mind and body, and even ritual cannibalism. Age seemed to be no barrier. Children were being used in satanic rituals, filmed pornographically, and beautiful young women used for Project Monarch, trained to sexually service politicians, bankers, law enforcement officials, and to mule drugs and carry secret messages locked behind post-hypnotic blocks. These people are now being bought and sold, specifically programmed to tasks too disgusting to describe. Phillips is talking about slaves of the cryptocracy, human butterflies created by Project Monarch. Many were assassinated after they were no longer useful. They were thrown from the freedom train, Phillips says. According to Phillips, Project Monarch has four distinct levels of behavior modification named Alpha, Beta, Delta, and Theta. Alpha is considered regular programming. This is actually what would be considered the base control personality. Originally, the purpose of Alpha programming was to condition the mind through torture so that black ops mercenaries and espionage agents could perform certain difficult tasks. This program also locks in photographic memory and improves physical strength. Visual acuity is radically improved. It develops in the individual a number of almost superhuman traits. Alpha programming, Phillips says, is accomplished through deliberately subdividing the victim's personality, which in essence causes a left-brain-right-brain division, which then allows for a triggerable reprogrammed union of left and right through neuron pathway stimulations. Once this is accomplished, you have a person who can utilize both sides of their brain at once for any simple task. Beta programming deals with the primitive mind's reproductive system and sex programming. It eliminates learned moral convictions and stimulates the primitive sex instincts devoid of inhibitions. This training program is for developing the ultimate prostitute, a sex machine. This is used most by the abusers knowledgeable of the MK Ultra Project Monarch program, Phillips said. Apparently, there are good guys and bad guys even within the cryptocracy? Children of knowledgeable persons are being preconditioned through incest and sold into the conspiracy for additional beta conditioning to eventually satisfy the bizarre perversions of politicians, bankers, drug lords, or anyone deemed valuable. Phillips says that Delta programming was originally designed to train special black ops and espionage agents' minds for becoming terrorists devoid of fear and basic self-preservation instincts capable of incredible feats of physical endurance and murder. Delta eventually was used to train a new breed, one who kills and, if caught, self-destructs. This program is now applied to some beta prostitutes who double as drug mules to protect the identity of their owners. If they are caught, they die of natural causes or suicide. Theta programming is psychic programming which evolved into biomedical human telemetry and directed target energy involving lasers and or electromagnetics, the results of which are referred to as electronic possession. It's the ultimate challenge for the 21st century exorcist, providing he works a day job as a skilled CIA-supported neurosurgeon. Theta programming, Phillips said, involved the surgical implantation of sodium-lithium-powered high-frequency receiver transducers coupled to a multi-range discharge capacitor that, when signaled by remote control, would electronically stimulate designated parts of the brain to signal the victim to respond according to his or her hypnotic program. These Delgado experiments were only partially successful, Phillips said, with a high mortality and paralysis rate. However, the technical mind control equipment evolution has advanced to levels well beyond the grasp of most people. Non-implanted, non-programmed victims will hold the largest majority since, in the 1990s, breakthroughs were made which allow mind control without either implant or trauma base. The new Theta programming, Phillips said, operates by computer-driven satellite-directed energy. Now, anybody can become a target of the new technology. 
The original physical apparatus for mind control were, according to Phillips, rather complex and cumbersome. There were elaborate sound and light-proof sensory deprivation isolation chambers using exotic suspension fluids that could mimic weightlessness. Direct current high voltage and very low amperage electroshock devices, plus designer drugs, were the most important tools of the trade as the brain is electrically and chemically powered. Voltages ranged from 0.072 volts to 200,000, depending on application and to what part of the body it was to be administered. There were strap-on head and foot devices that could deliver a mild altering shock of an exact duration according to the subject's brainwave activity and or heartbeat. Other portable handheld stun gun type devices can deliver shocks up to 200,000 volts for the instant control of the human conscious mind. A great deal of successful research and development went into the effects of harmonics or inaudible sound waves that affect the RNA covering of the neuron pathways to the subconscious, Phillips said. Harmonics generators, codenamed EtherWave, are capable of subconscious mind embedding detailed messages, commands linked to audible triggers. This is known as electronic programming and is a standard programming device in all forms of Project Monarch. Hence the reason many Monarch survivors drug mules and prostitutes, recall being taken under certain U.S. military bases and freedom ranches that are trauma centers for reprogramming. Mind-altering drugs, both natural and synthetic compounds, Phillips said, were discovered and developed which can instantly alter certain brain thought functions. These were developed from modern medical technology and discovered from ancient shamanic and witchcraft formulas. The components list is not immense. A soundproofed burial casket makes a great sensory deprivation chamber, similar to the one being used at a Kentucky CIA conditioning camp in which Delta, Alpha, and Beta victims are regularly put for reconditioning and programming for drug muling assignments. The only other components needed are devices to hang victims upside down by their ankles, cattle prods, the cylinder type, that are inserted deep into the vagina or rectum for a simulated orgasm with the devil. High voltage, up to 200,000 volts DC, handheld law enforcement type stun guns are a must tool for the victim's owner to erase certain memories, Phillips said. They are used on the muscle area of the victims within two hours of the to-be-forgotten event, and to control the victim's insane fits of rage if they are mistakenly triggered to perform a preconditioned task when they are at the moment in the wrong personality. The only other component the beta owner must possess, Phillips said, are a diary or a damn good memory of their programs, keys, and triggers, and a working knowledge of hypnosis. In other words, a small briefcase will contain everything a beta owner needs to control his slave completely, forever. The formula for beta programming is the exact same as for alpha. The only difference is that through a series of specific tortures and commands, the beta victim retreats deeper into their primitive mind. The results are you have a person with a childlike, insatiable sexual appetite. This retapped sexual appetite is developed in the formative years through constant incest with a father figure. What begins as unbearable pain to a child's mind, Phillips said, quickly switches to a sexual desire for the very person who was abusing her, daddy and or uncle. This mind-altering phenomena is now known as Stockholm Syndrome. This reversal is the key to all programming. Pain becomes pleasure, up is down. Hence the reason Colonel Michael Aquino adopted the satanic philosophy of reversing everything, including bad is good. Phillips said the first victims of Project Monarch were captured spies and dissidents from friendly and unfriendly nations. Unfortunately for the second group, Phillips said, there weren't enough victims caught to properly study the so-called Manchurian candidate. The second group, it is alleged, Phillips said, were bright, aggressive young men who had applied to Officers Candidate School, or OCS. These men took entrance exams and psychological tests that revealed whether or not they would become candidates for Project Monarch. If their entrance psychological exams revealed they were victims of child abuse, they were most often chosen. These eager young men were allegedly told that they couldn't go to OCS for whatever reason, but they could volunteer for a career in intelligence, and with their top-secret training, they could develop incredible superhuman physical and psychological abilities. These human guinea pigs volunteered for the destruction of their persona with a just sign here. Philip says he knows the identities of some of the main villains of Project Monarch. They existed, he says, at the top of the U.S. government. They appear to have focused, he said, not on recreational sex, but on drugs, 
billions of dollars annually in heroin and cocaine mulled into the U.S. via cruise ships and private and commercial airplanes, etc., etc., etc. The sale of these drugs is allegedly supporting the CIA's illegal covert action habits, Phillips says. The CIA doesn't have a black budget like the Pentagon boys. They earn theirs the old-fashioned way, by importing and selling drugs through elaborate networks of distributors to users that the CIA has decided to cultivate. They also consume a lot of their own product. There are drug lords, politicians, federal, state, and local, corrupt law enforcement personnel, federal, state, and local, big-name entertainers who themselves usually own a beta victim or two, which they trade among themselves like livestock. When one of the betas reach 30 years of age or so, they are often used in snuff porn movies, or what is termed, thrown from the freedom train. Phillips has passed out a lengthy list of the abusers, many of whom are high on the Washington, D.C. social register. He hopes the media will eventually wake up and target them with a legitimate investigation. Psychological mind control techniques, formulas, and equipment, unlike nuclear weapons systems, can be reproduced without exotic and expensive component systems, Phillips said. In the privacy of one's own home, virtually anyone of average intelligence, a little information, and no conscience can create their own mind control slaves. Mind control is out of control. It's just as lethal as nuclear war byproducts. However, through genetic engineering psychology, the evil seed is passed on generation to generation, Phillips said. Trauma-based mind control promises a world of white slavery for the chosen ones of the 21st century. It could turn out to be the largest cottage industry in the world, immense in terms of profits, death, and destruction of the innocent, unless the trend is stopped and those responsible in government and the private sector are punished and the survivors and victims given rehabilitative psychiatric care. As has been pointed out, according to Phillips, the majority of Project Monarch victims are female, at 71%, who have multiple personality disorder, a.k.a. dissociative identity disorder, 100% of the time. They have been or are used in commercially and privately produced pornography, 100% of the victims interviewed, which is often the underground kind containing bestiality, child and adult, child and child, adult and infant, sadomasochistic, satanic and occult films, videos and magazines. Older victims were frequently tattooed for easy identification with a so-called blue monarch butterfly, a rose, or both. The practice became more or less abandoned in the early 1970s and was replaced by the victim wearing butterfly hair barrettes, large butterfly earrings, pins, necklaces, bracelets, or embroidered insignias to advertise their art of expertise to insiders. This rule applies to 100% of the victims I've interviewed, Phillips said. All monarch survivors were victims of brutal sexual child abuse, who have been found to be multi-generational incest victims whose upbringing seems to cluster around Jesuit Catholic, Mormon, or charismatic Christian believers, or U.S. intelligence families. Many victims have been adopted. Survivors, once in the standard therapies, are usually triggered to possess homicidal and or suicidal ideations. This has only recently been determined to be the result of the sophisticated trauma-based psychological programming. Victims almost always possess multiple electric prod, stun gun scars, and or the resultant moles in the muscled areas of the back, arms, neck, and thighs. Some victims are also vaginally mutilated through body piercing, rings placed in nipples, vaginal lips, or clitoris, or through elaborate carving of the vaginal area. They often possess branding scars from irons or hot knives over various parts of their bodies. Monarch witnesses tell of pornographic sessions, tortures, and programming taking place at the following bases. Papillion, Nebraska, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, McGill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida, Kirkland Air Force Base, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Homestead Air Force Base, Langley Research Center, Langley, Virginia, Panama City, Panama, and Redstone, McClellan, Patrick, Grissom, and Maxwell Air Force Bases. Seeing the use of brainwave frequency names to describe types of programming brings us to a couple operating under the name Social Movements Recovery Center, SMRC, out of Boulder, Colorado. Survivors have told me that SMRC may be a damage control operation whose purposes are part of the cryptocracy's effort to smudge the memories of the many recovering monarch victims. The two instructors who present SMRC training to law enforcement personnel on deviant social movements and ritual crime, according to information circulated at their seminars, are Jim McCarthy, M.A., and Cynthia Burtis. McCarthy holds degrees, their handout says, 
in philosophy of religion, systematic theology, and comparative religion, and has performed doctoral work in social psychology through the University of Colorado. According to the bio circulated, McCarthy has been a research assistant and associate for a research team funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and the Center for the Study of New Religious Movements at the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley. He was the co-founder and executive director of the Bethesda Psych Health Institute, a center for research and treatment of deviant ritual behavior and abuse in Denver. According to the bio, he is also a member of the Institute of Police Technology and Management of the University of North Florida, where he instructs courses for law enforcement personnel on deviant social movements and ritual crime. He is also an adjunct staff member of the Adanta Group Behavioral Health Services in Somerset, Kentucky, and has served as a consultant for over 200 agencies here in the U.S. and abroad. He has defined an alleged syndrome which he calls marionette abuse syndrome. He describes his work as deprogramming. McCarthy's partner in SMRC is Cynthia Burtis, a self-described survivor of multi-generational intrafamilial ritual abuse, incest, sexual, physical, and emotional abuses. According to the company bio, she was diagnosed as having multiple personality disorder in 1980 and has been involved in intensive psychotherapy since that time. In 1989, Cynthia developed an instructional program according to the handout for law enforcement on MPD and ritualistic abuse. She teaches this program to the expanded class of the Deviant Social Movements course at the Institute of Police Technology and Management in Jacksonville, Florida, and various other police agencies across the country. At present, the handout says both are engaged in discussions with professionals who are training and consulting on the treatment model. Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Procedure, EMDR, which sounds like the source might be neurolinguistics programming, in order to better understand and work with clinicians using this procedure and to possibly recommend applicable integrative aspects of this procedure into our specific areas of expertise. At first I tried to interview McCarthy, who told me that he'd never heard of any government or military programming from any of his clients. That statement contradicted the information published in the SMRC handout. A follow-up interview with Burtis, under one of my pseudonyms, found a seemingly overly defensive woman who wanted to know my credentials. She said that she knew nothing of Candy Jones, yet Candy's book is cited, the title is wrong, in their list of resources. When I spoke of the mysterious mind controller reported by the survivors, Dr. Green, Burtis was adamant about his authenticity. She told me that the Dr. Green or Greenbaum myth was true, as the survivors are saying. Burtis indicated that she had proof that there was a Nazi mind control doctor by that name. She also said that there was a Project Monarch, and their literature gives a comparative chart which lists Alpha, Beta, Delta, Omega, Theta, and Gamma, Epsilon, with a different explanation than that supplied by Mark Phillips. A survivor who has been around the track of existing treatments, so to speak, attended SMRC seminars, heard their tapes, and received the treatment of Burtis. The survivor told us that while Cynthia The survivor told us that while Cynthia Burtis's material includes many of the symbols and systems of programming which she knows are true, Burtis puts her ego into the therapy. It doesn't work. It actually suppresses memories. This survivor suspects that SMRC is a government-affiliated damage control project aimed at keeping the survivors of Monarch from remembering too much. Maybe it's just one survivor's opinion, but this survivor took the trouble to prepare her own paper several years ago on the so-called marionette programming. Dr. Green is allegedly a Nazi war criminal who was hired by the CIA and was thus given access to children throughout the U.S. because he traveled to military bases and appeared to have worldwide resources. He is also known by other aliases, including Herr Doctor, Faraday, and David. Dr. Green is also associated with Heinrich Muller, head of the Gestapo, and Heinrich Mueller, a Nazi doctor who did experiments on animals that were grotesque. Survivors believe there is a Nazi Dr. Green. They saw similar experiments. We have other information on the possible identity of Dr. Green, but we'll withhold it from this edition pending further research. The goals of the doctor appear to be to train a force to prepare for the return of the Antichrist and overthrow the world in 1999. The callback was to be for 1991 for cults to gain all possible manpower for the final takeover. It also gives a year for reprogramming and retraining for the Antichrist's appearance. 
There are significant internal names in these marionette systems and include some of the following. Sisters of Light, Mothers of Darkness, Program Director, Master Programmer, Grandmother with Three Faces, Grand Wizard, Grand Master, and others. At least two parallel program systems which are first implemented in the very young children by teaching them to sing nursery rhymes and through fairy tales. These are built on, year after year, with hypnotic suggestions so that when the client begins to remember one part of the memory, it triggers many memories. The following books and tales have been known to be used. Snow White, Alice in Wonderland, Rose White and Rose Red, Lost Horizons, Wizard of Oz, Tall Book of Make-Believe, Sleeping Beauty, and also the game Candyland. They are often programmed while very young, then let go with a heavy callback program to return approximately 18 to 21 years, beyond the rebellious years. Something like this is described in O's book. There are usually computers within the system. Sometimes there is one in every level or one in each section of the matrix, depending on the form the matrix takes. The program often used the Greek alphabet. Split-brain programming is done with a specific kind of torture and or hypnosis that leads the survivor to believe they cannot have access to both sides simultaneously without amnesia. There are usually bridges between the sides, and sometimes they are actually altars. There are common internal images in these survivors. It includes trees, i.e., tree of knowledge, green tree, Kabbalah tree, dollhouse, which may hold the computer, Vortexes or black holes which can pull altars between levels, a little like booby traps. Hourglass, maybe a matrix. Ribbons, cords, wires, mirrors, jewels, mazes, altars of the man with glasses. Doctor or Dr. Green. Seeds, dots, waves, riptides, wind, ocean, daisies, birds, porcelain faces, pits, elevator shafts, worms, glass balls, ships, shells for silence, and cylinders. The number of layers has to do with levels of power. The layers may include names like External World, Our World, Atlantis, Troy, Heliopolis, Phoenix, The Ship, Shangri-La, The Computer, etc. Their names are often dependent upon the type of rituals that were used, i.e. Satanic, Pagan, etc. Altars can go back and forth between systems and can have no hearts and no faces. There may be clones or robots, that is, artificial altars that are made of plastic or metal that look like human altars, but have switches or keys on their backs or necks. Some of the programming is done with cricket noises or a noisemaker that is a clicker. At the end of this report, there is a disclaimer. These notes are not to be taken for fact. They are ideas and clinical observations as shared by survivors. There are probably variables and differences within each marionette survivor, and the accuracy of reporting what's inside is a subjective experience often changed by time and or severe torture. It is also possible that some of this information is disinformation designed to confuse the survivor or anyone else attempting to help them out of these many hypnotic and torturous suggestions and images. Another survivor described the coded programming of the rainbow variety. I am an intergenerational ritual abuse survivor who is struggling to get to the bottom of cult-related behavior and programming, past and present. At a recent conference on child abuse, with some emphasis on ritual abuse, I heard Corey Hammond and Roberta Sachs speak of Greek letter programming, a rather complex combination of using Greek letters to stimulate certain pre-induced cult-related behavior, in combination with an imaginary computer keyboard in the survivor's brain. The implication was that programming in the ritual abuse survivor had become so complex as to be virtually impenetrable by the therapist trained to deal with feelings and behaviors. What I was left with was a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, that there was no way for a conventionally trained therapist to deal with this maze of codes, and therefore one might as well give up. I was intrigued by the information nonetheless, and determined to find a way to manage this information in my own life. In discussing the codes with other survivors, we began coming up with concurrent information about access codes of a simpler nature. I presented the information I had gleaned from these discussions to my therapist, who has been my guide and helper in my painful journey. He has been ever willing to learn from his clients and seemed undaunted by the prospect laid before him and was willing to listen, learn, and assist. In follow-up, I was able to, with his help, abreact situations where codes were induced, 
where codes were used, and where codes were reintroduced due to destroying barriers between certain feeling states in the process of therapy. I have verified this information with other survivors who have been able to see the use of codes in eliciting behavior on their part and uncovering memories of code induction and code-related cult activity. The following is a list of codes used in the life of this survivor and apparently the lives of other survivors to obtain certain programmed behavior. Number 1. Code Green Used to induce self-destructive or suicidal behavior, Code Green usually refers to code-induced suicide or self-mutilation. Sometimes survivors associate this code with a Dr. Green. Generally, this program is induced and in place for the event when the survivor begins therapy or a therapy has proceeded to such a state that much memory is being recovered. It related directly to the no-talk code of secrecy. A survivor would rather die than talk. Sometimes it is necessary to dismantle this code first so that a survivor feels free to remember and the possibility of self-destructive behavior is eliminated or reduced. Number 2. Code Blue Induces freeze mechanism where a victim is essentially unable to move until another code is induced. Code Blue acts like a verbal stun gun. Number 3. Code Red Used to induce anger and rage and elicits cult-related murderous activity. Number four, code yellow, induces jealousy in combination with rage and an attitude of get even. Number five, code black, induces participation in rituals. In example, put on your black. Number six, code white, protective code indicating untouchability. I am not certain as to its use other than to keep law enforcement at bay when white cars are parked in the vicinity of cult-related activity. I have suspected this to be in use when I see persons heading for a ritual dressed in a big white shirt. Number 7. Code 911 Emergency Used to induce superhuman strength or behavior of a self-protective or emergency nature. When used, it induces trancing and then deliberate course of action minus any feelings. Sometimes used as a protection for cult members who, as they are survivors themselves, have a tendency to freeze or panic or otherwise are unable to act in self-protective manner in an emergency situation or when they need to cover for the group. This code carries with it a resistance to calling the real 911 number when a person is threatened or harassed. Number 8. Call Your Operator Code 911 Used on an answering machine when a survivor is screening calls or is otherwise unable to answer a telephone call. The answering machine automatically answers a phone call, at which time the following recording is played. If you would like to make a call, please hang up and try your call again. If you need assistance, please call your operator, code 911. This message is sometimes repeated several times, accompanied by the beep 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 sound of a phone left off the hook, and then by a dial tone. The survivor is pre-programmed to call a certain phone number, the operator, for further instructions. How Codes Are Introduced these codes are pre-programmed using the usual induction methods of torture, drug-induced trances, and accompanied by electroshock. The coding itself requires little time to induce in a person already dissociated, and may not even be seen as lost time in an ordinary day's activities. The codes call upon feeling states currently in place, although walled off, and usually are associated with one or two such feeling states per code. They are also sometimes paired with a cult altar with a name and a prescribed role attached to the name. In other words, sometimes it is only necessary for a particular name to be mentioned for the feelings to surface and the code-related behavior to be acted upon. Therapists frustrated with the task of getting at feelings can use these codes as an indirect approach to helping a survivor see how he or she is accessed, oftentimes currently, and then approach from a feeling level. Effects of Code Usage on Adult and Child Survivors I have seen a stepped-up approach to using these codes because of the occult's 1999. Some therapists report the date of a multiple of 666 times 3, which equals 1998, which, following occult numerology, would make the exact day June 6, 1998. Their frustration with so many survivors remembering and attempting to heal themselves so the coding is so often accompanied by a current-day harassment, reducing the survivor to a childlike state of fear and panic, making them open to further assaults by the group. It is a hideous way of reintroducing trauma into the life of a person struggling to regain control of his or her life. 
In my own life, I have been able, with the help of my therapist and my child, to uncover not only the original coded information, but to access memories where the codes have been used not only to access me, but to induce in my child the fear and helplessness necessary to control my child so as to give access to me. My child, who is not yet 18, was used to such a degree that we had to move into separate residences, therefore eliminating from my child's life the presence of a caring, nurturing individual ready and willing to share with my child the pain and suffering of that childhood. This divide-and-conquer mechanism seems to be a last-ditch effort on the part of occult groups to ensure animosity between survivors, who would otherwise be of great value in the nurturing, support, and validation essential to the healing process. Responsibility, a team effort. Understanding of the codes means knowledge that the behavior induced by the codes is subconscious versus conscious. This does not mean that the person induced to perform certain behaviors is not accountable for that behavior. What it does mean, I believe, is that it is incumbent upon each individual to uncover their own particular codes and to make an effort to dismantle them as quickly as possible. To do so does not mean just to know of their existence. It also requires a conscious effort to really see the feelings behind the coded material, to nurture the inner children and sometimes the inner adults, and to replace the coded behavior with conscious behavior aimed at reducing the code's effectiveness. To inculcate this conscious behavior requires repetition of replacement behavior, as the coded behavior does not miraculously disappear once the codes are made conscious. Until feelings are uncovered and dealt with, the codes retain some of their power. Note, the above would not be recommended by many therapists. Getting in touch with traumatic feelings can reinforce the trauma, Perhaps something along the lines of the six-step reframe, as explained in John Grinder and Richard Bandler's book, Reframing, would be more effective. Or a triple dissociation pattern, using the dissociated state to further dissociate from the trauma, and shifting submodalities to desensitize the survivor from it. Also, it is important to communicate a full understanding that survivors are not their behavior, that they can have choice in all future behaviors once they're free of their programming. This gifted survivor issues another stern warning. I would hope that therapists reading this would not dismiss this material out of hand simply because it is not the work of a trained therapist. I would hope that therapists would be open to the possibility that this coding exists in their clients, and they could work with survivors in uncovering previously unconscious coded programs and behavior. Working with the codes does require a certain amount of caution, as sometimes just saying a particular color will induce code-related feelings. Therapists should also be aware that these codes can also be introduced simply by wearing a garment in the code-related color. This is not to introduce an element of hysteria, but an element of caution and concern for the survivor and his or her particular triggers. This material can be managed and it is a truly exciting process to become aware of other directed control. It enables a survivor to regain a large amount of conscious control over situations and behaviors that would otherwise put them at risk for current day access. We adult survivors, this survivor concludes, need to be aware that much effort was used in our childhoods to program participation in cult activities. As we reach adulthood and uncover buried trauma, the cult has an even greater stake in helping us forget. We are lifelong members in their eyes, and every effort will be made to keep us in control and under control. We have a choice as to whether or not we allow this to continue. Remembering our own programs can help put us on our own road to recovery and safety. Note to survivors, we would like to collect the codes, cues, and triggers you have remembered so that we can map the evolution of this programming over the years in different situations and locations. Note to the lay reader, until you've seen a survivor of Project Monarch triggered, you may have no idea what this all means. Perhaps our video, Operation Mind Control, will give you some reality on the subject. Chapter 12, Thanks for the Memories I met Lois first in Palm Springs when I was the editor of Palm Springs Life. She was sitting, looking pretty, at one of the many events that bear Bob Hope's name, the Bob Hope Classic Golf Tournament or the Hope Center, which houses the Palm Desert Opera. Her real name was not Lois and I was not introduced to her, but when I saw her again, several years later, 
She had come along with a Project Monarch survivor just to watch the interview I was doing with their deprogrammer. I knew I'd seen her before, but at first couldn't remember where or when. When I saw her that first time, I knew nothing about her. She was just another of the many hostess types that you find working the parties in the Coachella Valley. I did not know she was a so-called monarch survivor. I didn't even know there was such a thing as Project Monarch, which took dissociative identity disordered children and made patriotic sex slaves out of them. Now I was looking at her again in an entirely different context than the one in which I'd met her. A friend who is a psychiatric registered nurse had come along to support me in the interview, and she spent a good deal of time talking with Lois while I interviewed the deprogrammer. It wasn't long before we learned that Lois was a case very similar to O's. When I learned that, I asked her if she'd grant me an interview. She gave me a novel she had written which was a fictional account of her story. Her deprogrammer said the novel was still full of her programming, and that Lois was not yet reintegrated or fused, and therefore still had fiction mixed up with fact in her mind. He suggested that we both wait for an interview until fusion was complete, after her functional personalities were working together, and after she had better recall of specific events, which were now occluded by amnesia from what amounts to classical trauma-based conditioning. After several months, I was contacted by Lois. She gave me an entirely new book, the truer story she had remembered and written down over the past several months of fusion therapy. It was a readable account which I've excerpted and edited for presentation here. Today, Lois is 43 years old and recovering from her dissociative disorder. She began to remember small, inconsequential things at first when she was 35. By 1988, six years before she finished her book, she thought she was simply a survivor of ritual abuse. Then, as she began to heal and remember more of her past, she realized that ritual abuse was merely a mind-control trauma base. Her pedophile father, among others, had used the condition for her future participation in what she says is the still active Central Intelligence Agency's white slavery operation, Project Monarch. From my earliest recollections, my father began the rigorous training and torture required to splinter my base personality with the intention of creating many separate and individual personalities for training and use by others as I grew older. She was physically, psychologically, and sexually abused continually by her father, his friends, and at a Baptist Sunday school at which the minister and church secretary oversaw a planned program of torture and ritual abuse. In addition to Christianity, Lois said the church secretary also practiced witchcraft in her darkened home, isolated and protected from outside intrusion by drape-covered windows. As a toddler, my father would get me up early on Saturday or Sunday mornings and take me and a carrot down the street to feed the horses. We always did feed the horses, but the actual purpose of these outings was to get me out of the house to go see Mrs. M for what they called my training. Lois was raised in the affluent area of the San Fernando Valley in Southern California. She was abused her entire childhood in many locations in and out of California, including U.S. military bases, where she was subjected to high-level use, abuse, and programming. The results of many years of trauma intentionally inflicted on her by her father and others created within her many separate personalities that were amnestic of each other. Over time, I became a totally programmed robotic slave that could not, due to electronic programming and abuse, think to tell anyone what happened to me. I was used frequently in child pornography and child prostitution, by the age of 16, Lois had many separate personalities, several specially trained to be the perfect sex slave. One was a presidential model with a photographic memory used to deliver cryptic messages, most often during sexual encounters with top government officials, entertainers, and other world leaders. From 1988 to 1991, she was in daily therapy in California. She began remembering a complex past that now has been validated in part through intelligence community and FBI contacts, active and retired, as well as through investigative journalists and knowledgeable mental health professionals. In her quest for understanding and self-knowledge, Lois also attended graduate school to obtain her master's degree in psychology. In April of 1991, she was forced to leave her home and family in California due to a threat on her life. I fled to Hawaii and began writing a book about my experiences. 
I began having vivid, detailed memories of being used as a sex slave and or human computer to some of our nation's highest level government officials in and out of the White House. Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, George Bush, and many others, including top entertainment professionals. Prominent among them was her owner, Bob Hope. My abusers made sure that I was instilled with very complex programming that would ensure my death should I begin to remember or tell. But, despite the programs for her to have an accident or self-mutilate or kill herself should she begin to remember, today she is healthy, in control of her own mind, and has no intentions of hurting herself in any manner. I am taking extreme precautions, she says. That's why I'm publicizing this message. I expect it to encumber these criminals who would stop me from recovering further memories and obtaining expert help. In conjunction with the traumas at church and school, my father reinforced my programming by the use of fairy tales. His favorites were from Disney themes and The Wizard of Oz. Sometimes in the middle of the night, my father would traumatize me in order to get me to dissociate, which created the perfect trance state for mind programming. In this state, he would tell me that over the rainbow was a bridge to the other world, and that I would walk over the rainbow bridge into the other world, and it would remain separate from my everyday world. He told me what happened over the rainbow would feel unreal, like a dream. Lois was conditioned to forget her most recent covert encounters when she heard the word home. The trigger phrase began with the phrase from The Wizard of Oz, There's no place like home and was associated with being back in bed, sleeping, after a night of being used in child pornography, or as a child prostitute and later after being prostituted to mobsters, celebrities, politicians, or anyone else her owner directed her to accommodate. These words functioned as a way to reorient me back into my everyday world, without carrying the reality of what had happened back with me. I was instructed to sleep and wake up at home in bed with the land of Oz so very far away. That place that felt like a fairy tale, that I must have made up, was only a dream, was now very far away. I was now on the other side of the rainbow, and I was conditioned to forget that those experiences ever happened. If I remembered them at all, I remembered them as merely a dream. Later, in my teen years, all it took was for my mother or father to say, You can sleep all the way home, and I was conditioned, like Pavlov's dog, to respond to the word home with total and complete amnesia of what had happened to me that evening. Lois now remembers that she was taken to military bases around the country for more sophisticated programming. She was hooked up to high-tech electronics that performed a variety of functions, interfacing mind and body responses. I was put in isolation chambers and left in isolation, sometimes spun with colored lights, always with one color at a time, I was placed in sophisticated chairs with electrodes attached to my head and shocked. Sophisticated audio equipment was used. I don't know what exactly they were accomplishing, but I felt tortured by it, Lois said. By the age of five, Lois was conditioned through torture and by the use of hypnotic techniques to hurt herself in many ways should she ever begin to remember her secret activities. Per programmed suggestion, she said, if I began to remember anything, I would stub my toe or burn myself on the stove, thus removing my focus from the remembered secret experience and diverting my attention to my wound. I was instructed in successful ways to cut my wrist in order to take my own life, should I begin to remember or tell. There were also accident programs instilled to ensure my death if I remembered. Many programs were installed early in my life that were available for use in suppressing the activities of my hidden personalities for years. Over years of torture, Lois remembered hearing her programmer say, If you remember, you will kill yourself. If you tell, people will think you're crazy and lock you up in a mental institution. If you don't obey us, we will kill your family and your dog and cat. If you tell, we will kill you. Lois had witnessed killings for years, therefore she believed they were not kidding. I was used in child pornography and child prostitution from the time I was two years old, maybe even before. My father, who was a welder, sold me as a prostitute to neighbors and business contacts. My father had a group of pedophile friends with daughters my own age. They traded us sexually and each independently participated in filming us pornographically, sometimes including bestiality. I had many personalities trained in both porn and prostitutions. At age seven, I was further trained by older women prostitutes. I was taught tricks of the trade, 
most of which I already knew from years of sexual abuse and training. The prostitution and pornography was an organized activity. There were times when I was a child that I was used to entice and kidnap other children off the street into a black car. The kidnapped children were initially kept in cages in back rooms and then used in pornography and usually killed, sometimes in snuff films. We were all shocked with cattle prods or stun guns for different offenses. I was locked in a room and sold as a prostitute to lots of men. The people in charge always left ropes, whips, and sex toys for use by the people who were paying for sex with me. Pornography was filmed with other children, women, men, and animals. They filmed me in many different secluded locations around Turlock Lake, California, the Colorado River, and places my family and family friends went for water skiing vacations. Lois tells of being filmed by friends of her father's. One man filmed her and his own daughter having sex. Another forced his daughter of the same age to have sex with Lois and animals while they filmed it. To all outward appearances, all of these families appeared like normal, upstanding citizens of the community. No one would have ever suspected that in secret, all of this abuse was occurring. The mothers kept clean children and clean houses, smiled and acted polite and caring in public, and the fathers acted charming and were considered responsible businessmen in the community. What went on behind closed doors that no one wanted to believe or hear about, not even my elementary school principal, was the physical, psychological, and emotional devastation of many, many children. By age ten and a half, I had gone through puberty and was fully developed. This was much sooner than any of the other girls in my class at school. Despite the abuse, I was a pretty good student, with many school personalities who helped me act like a normal kid. Lois displayed behavior problems in school, often acting out what was secretly going on at home, but her teachers merely passed off her joking and constant disruption as typical mischievous behavior. I had personalities who were totally amnestic of any of my abuse and able to function perfectly normal in the school setting. I did the things that normal kids do. I was a cheerleader, performed in the chorus, sang solos in junior high, and won awards for the most beautiful smile and for being the class clown. I was girls' league president and a member of the student council, and I received a number of awards of merits and my mother had the cleanest house in the neighborhood. I started menstruating. This heralded abuse in rituals involving getting raped and impregnated, sometimes twice a year. When the fetuses were two to three months old, they were aborted at rituals and ingested to fulfill the beliefs of the group that it made those participating more powerful. These were devastating, deeply traumatizing, and painful experiences that were repressed along with the other traumas. They served as mind-control reinforcement, to ensure amnesia of my use in pornography and prostitution. Lois was taken to her grandfather's house in another state. Her grandfather, a local politician, like her father, was a pedophile and a member of the same organization which practiced ritual abuse. Lois was impregnated several months before they arrived at her grandfather's house, where the first of several forced abortions were performed, Lois said, in a torturous fashion by a local doctor. Although I was raped and made pregnant at a ritual, I was humiliated and shamed for becoming pregnant. Everything was a double bind. I was blamed and shamed for everything that happened, none of which I ever had any control over. My baby, which was not yet old enough to be born alive, was nevertheless a perfectly formed fetus. My grandfather and my father had a ceremony behind my grandparents' house in which they convinced me that I had killed my own baby, which was obviously born dead, and they ate it and forced me to participate. During the rest of the time we were there, I was forced to entertain my grandfather's business and political friends. I danced naked on the table at meetings and performed sexual favors for many of his associates. To demonstrate my programmed abilities, my father prompted the men to use a cigarette to burn me in my vagina as I kneeled down in front of them. My father wanted to demonstrate that I would smile and show no signs of the burns due to reinforced dissociation, mind control. Lois attended junior high school, and in the eighth grade, age 14, she met a young man, Clark, about whom her mother said, he's the boy you will marry. About that time, President Kennedy was killed. Lois's programmers used the gruesome murder to reinforce her belief in their power over her. They told her, we are so powerful we can kill the president without anyone knowing, so don't think anyone will ever find out about you. 
Over the next several years, Clark and I were bonded to each other through cross-programming and shared trauma to ensure that Clark was under sufficient mind control to serve as my handler. A ritual at a Presbyterian church I attended regularly served to seal our bond, and soon other, more sophisticated means of programming were utilized. Large vans with men in suits picked us up at a location in Ventura, California. They had specialized equipment in briefcases and other large equipment in the van. They routinely beat Clark in front of me to show me what a weakling he really was and how powerful and in control of me they were. They would slap me around in front of him to show him how powerless he was to help me and how much in control they were. Electroshock was used on both of us, first by inserting and activating an electric prod in my vagina and then delivering the same attack to Clark on his penis. We each had to watch robotically as the other was tortured. The bond that was formed by shared trauma was powerful. It created feelings of being in this whole mess together and enforced the feelings that we would never be able to get out. After they had sufficiently worn us down, they would strap us into sophisticated chairs and hook us up to the electrodes. Tones were combined with the electroshock in order to create access cues that gave them quick and easy access to us both later on. Hypnotic suggestions and love songs were presented to us in order to facilitate our falling madly in love. All these conditioning experiences served to prepare Clark to deliver and hand me over to other men, then step aside while I serviced them sexually. It was always his job to make sure I was delivered to the right place at the right time to the right person, and for many years that is exactly what he did. Bob Hope was one of the first high-powered men Clark delivered me to. For my 16th birthday present, in 1967, Clark surprised me with a trip, by train, to the San Diego Zoo for the day. We boarded the train, and after a while, Clark delivered me to a private car where Bob Hope, U.S. Senator Alan Cranston, and a couple of other men were waiting. Clark left me with them and robotically went back to his seat. I had sex with each of them as the others watched. They were all old men, even in those days. Lois's pedophile father went to UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute in Westwood when she was 16 years of age for what everyone said was brain surgery. When he returned home, he kneeled on the floor next to his daughter's bed and wept. Lois describes her father saying, Honey, big things are happening. I've lost control over you. Lois says she didn't know how to react since her father never cried before. I couldn't think to question him, Lois said, or to wonder just what it was he was trying to tell me. So I let it go along with hundreds of other thoughts and questions that any normal, unprogrammed daughter would have thought to ask. So I let it go, along with hundreds of other thoughts and questions that any normal, unprogrammed daughter would have thought to ask. If Lois's recollections are correct, her father sold her to the famous British-born comedian Bob Hope, who promptly began setting his new prize up with the likes of Ronald Reagan. The story she tells about Hope makes you wonder about his connections with British intelligence in addition to the CIA. Lois says she met Reagan for the first time at the small theater that is the part of the Motion Picture County Hospital, MPCH, located in Calabasas, California. The hospital is owned and operated by the Screen Actors Guild. I was instructed to watch many movies that were for programming purposes to instill certain preferred attitudes within me. To name a few, my Fair Lady, The Unsinkable Molly Brown, and The Wizard of Oz. I was programmed to go to the MPCH to watch some of the movies that played in the small theater on the hospital grounds. At other times, seeing a movie was just a cover for privately meeting with Ronald Reagan. I was told beforehand that I would have an important guest and that I was to make a good impression on him to give him the full treatment. When Reagan and I were alone in the theater, the full treatment consisted of me singing and dancing on the small stage for him and ending with a striptease. After my seductive act, I walked out to where he was sitting alone and climbed, naked, into his lap to recite my program. Following my programmed instructions, I told him that I could satisfy every desire he could imagine, that I came complete with instructions, and was referred by his friend Bob Hope. He seemed embarrassed a reaction that would follow him over the years in relation to me, and a bit overwhelmed, but his response was, I'm sold. Tell Bob I'm sold. Having carefully recorded his exact response within my photographic memory as instructed, I slipped out of his lap, collected my clothes from the stage floor, and got dressed. I had several personalities that were specially created to please Reagan sexually. 
One was created for total devotion to him over the years. I was used extensively on and around 1968 by then-Governor Reagan and soon after with United States President Richard Milhouse Nixon. These top politicians were guaranteed by the Central Intelligence Agency that my training in Project Monarch ensured the highest level of security. The level of mind control I possessed guaranteed that I could be used with these leaders who were involved at the highest levels of national security without my own awareness. I overheard conversations where the President of the United States and other top politicians were offered the services of escorts, the CIA's latest technology, top-secret Project Monarch-trained sex slaves. They were encouraged to use them to satisfy their sexual and emotional needs instead of exposing themselves to outside individuals because these escorts were guaranteed safe, had passed many tests to ensure their security, and were able to provide guaranteed secrecy. The presidents and others were highly discouraged from seeking other avenues of sexual indiscretions for fear of public exposure. This fear of political incorrectness, of seeking outside sexual gratification, instilled in these top officials by the CIA, fear of adverse publicity, and other security risks created a heavy demand for the use of this latest human technology. According to Lois and other survivors, Project Monarch beta-trained sex slaves were called million-dollar babies, referring to the large amount of money each slave would bring in from a very early age. Lois said, My father had done his homework, ensuring that I had been MPD'd certifiably under complete mind control before I was ready for use by certain individuals in top political and entertainment positions. I was 16 years old. But what many of the CIA may or may not have been aware of was that a powerful group of men, whom I will call the Council, secretly ran the government. The Council was also able to access me and had programmed me to subversively influence top government officials in ways that benefited them. The CIA's latest technology was being used against our own government. Our family doctor had me taking a continuous supply of the antibiotic tetracycline to ensure I did not infect the government leaders with any social diseases. He also prescribed mood elevators and mild tranquilizers for me during the times when I was extremely depressed. These helped to keep me happy. During the times when I was being used by others, they accessed personalities that were cheerful and energetic, so my moods were never a problem. I was programmed, Lois said, to stay thin, tan and silly, a typical dumb blonde. Clark and I had been going steady since we were 14, and, except for a brief one-year breakup in high school, I did not date any other boys. I was unaware that secretly laced into my life was a whole array of discreetly hidden sexual rendezvous with men in influential positions. I was filmed pornographically in many locations, including Woodland Hills, Malibu, Hidden Hills, Bel Air, and other places in the San Fernando Valley. At this stage of my life, the level of pornographic filming was more professional. There were themes, costumes, music, professional makeup, and lighting. Personalities inside of me were taught how to work with the lighting to catch the best poses and how to move my body so the film crew could get the best shots. Upon completion of the filming, I would go home to my mother and father in Woodland Hills and later might even go out on a date with Clark, believing that I was an innocent, loyal, and loving girlfriend. Due to the mind control I was under, I had no way of knowing that I was leading anything other than a normal life as a normal teenager in a normal family in Woodland Hills. The extensive contact I had with Bob Hope as a teenager and in my early 20s showed me that Bob was much more than an entertainer. Entertainment was actually just a clever hobby of his. I witnessed his participation as a strategically placed, influential, and integrated part of an underworld group that secretly sought to control the world. He maintained direct ties to the White House. Through my affiliation with Bob Hope, I was to meet and interact with many powerful businessmen, politicians, and celebrities. I was often flown into a small airport in Palm Springs to be with Bob and his cronies. I was picked up by a silver limo and taken to his house. The men in suits would meet me and take me to Bob wherever he was, at home, on the golf course, or in town. They would provide me with clothes, shoes, and jewelry in which to dress. One day I accompanied Bob to the golf course in Palm Springs. He was dressed casually, in light blue slacks, pastel yellow shirt, white belt, and white canvas shoes. There were several other men golfing with him. I was there just to be with Bob. I was 17, thin, tan, 
blonde, and dressed in a tiny white dress, like a tennis outfit with spaghetti straps. I had on white sandals that came up from my toe and met at a strap around my ankle. I wore a gold heart anklet, a slave bracelet, on my left ankle. I was not invited to play the golf game, but was instructed to watch and smile. Bob enjoyed having people around. He would have parties attended by lots of famous people. Usually they were held at his home in Palm Springs. Sometimes I was given as a gift to one or more of his friends for the night, but was programmed to return to his room to sleep. Dolores, Hope, was usually not around. But when she was, it was strange to see Dolores at the parties, knowing that I was having sex with Bob and had accompanied him to different places with his friends and business associates. Dolores never appeared to know exactly what he did. Although my programming kept these activities hidden from my conscious mind, I would wake up late in the mornings in my own bed in Woodland Hills with red eyes, feeling totally exhausted after what I thought was a full night's sleep. I was not able to understand that the exhaustion was actually caused by food, water, and sleep deprivation, coupled with electroshock tortures, Lois said. Dolores was already well along in years when Bob was fooling around with me. She seemed not to like it when I was around, and unfortunately, Bob did not offer much of an excuse for my presence like Reagan did. He could not say I was his secretary or aide, but he did tell her he was needing to spend lots of time with me to groom me for some of the USO shows for the troops. I can remember hearing Dolores' voice nagging at him one morning after a party while I was still there. He lied and told her I was there with some man at the party. Not that I did not have sex frequently with many of his friends and business associates, but this time I had not. Bob referred to me in the earlier days, my teenage years, as his little bunny. Through his USO involvement, he was friends with Hugh Hefner, and he came to the parties sometimes. Mr. Hefner always brought at least two women with him, usually blondes. He never victimized me, and I believe he and perhaps others that met me may not have known I was a mind-controlled slave. Starlight was a name Bob gave me. Starlight was one of my alter personalities. She was to become his starlet. He told Starlight, and other people when I was on his arm, that he was giving me a leg up in the industry. At other times, he introduced me to people as his favorite niece. My instructions were that Starlight always wore her hair parted on the side, with it combed down over one eye to look sexy. She was to be very sexy. When Bob took me to parties, he would tell everyone he was showing me the ropes and that I had endless talent and great potential in the industry. Bob took me to several of Hugh Hefner's penthouse parties in Los Angeles. There were windows all around, and at night you could see all the twinkling lights of the city. Bob told me that when I was on his arm for the evening that he was mine, but at other times he was someone else's. Sometimes Bob prostituted me to Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, and others, while Frank Sinatra served as a handler. Hefner had bizarre, exotic entertainment at his parties. Naked women who were painted like zebras appeared to walk through the living room fireplace without being burned. Or he would have wild, tamed animals, like a lion that was whipped into shape by a playboy bunny. One time he even had a man dressed like Tarzan whipping a girl dressed like Jane. Everyone said the girl was not really being hurt, that it was just an illusion. I don't know if that was true. It was like that a lot a magic sex show. Bob Hope took Lois to Hefner's because he wanted her to be bunny-trained. He asked her to pay close attention to the way Playboy bunnies moved so that she could move that way when she entertained the troops, or Bob and his friends, privately. Lois had been programmed, much as David, O, Candy Jones, and the others, to carry secret messages locked behind post-hypnotic blocks. She said the council often programmed her to deliver a message to some entertainer, celebrity, or politician at a party that they knew she was going to attend. I don't think Bob even knew some of the messages I was delivering, she said. I would be told to hold the message until I had zeroed in on the targeted person. Then, when I had made eye contact and had their full attention, I was to carefully drop the message while maintaining eye contact. I was usually very quiet, and when I would deliver these messages, Bob was not aware I was going to speak. He would be caught off guard and would make a joke about loving to be with me because he never knew what would come out of my mouth from one minute to the next. He told people that I had natural wit, but I was really programmed by others to deliver cryptic messages, cleverly made for certain select individuals, Lois said. It was during these early years that I began being heavily accessed and programmed by the council for use with many influential men and women in positions of power. In addition to my use with Bob Hope, and Ronald Reagan, who was then governor of California, I began being used with President Richard Nixon as a sex slave, and Henry Kissinger utilized my computerized mind files. I never had sex with Henry Kissinger or George Bush. My use within government circles was seen as security proof. 
They felt my programming kept the information I carried from my own awareness and from access by others who did not know the keys to my system. But what those in government did not seem to know was that the Council also had the ability to access me, and that they were secretly slipping in their own psychologically tested and carefully researched messages for me to deliver to presidents, governors, senators, foreign leaders, entertainers, and many other people who were in positions of power or public influence. The Council studied people's psychological profiles and knew exactly what their likes and dislikes were, their sexual preferences, what perfumes they liked, and any other information that could be used to influence individuals in ways of which they were never even aware. The Council would pre-program me with instructions, all based on careful research of the targeted person, of what to wear, how to act, what type of sexual stance to take, specific words or phrases to say, and the best time to deliver them. The Council always worked up a complete strategy and never sent me to a person unprepared. In these ways, Lois said, they influenced government leaders to act in their own favor to pass or veto laws or bills that benefited their corporate holdings, to bring into office people who would be used as pawns, to influence judges and government agencies, and to control people in all walks of life. My experience was that the Council's membership was publicly nameless and unknown, and their true power and ability to manipulate the masses came from the fact that they were publicly unknown. From my perspective, these individuals acting in the shadows actually dictate the direction our government takes. They were connected to people like Bob Hope through a secret liaison with me, of which I was programmed not to even be aware. They felt that they had their identities and security locked up tight. Parties were given in New York at the Rockefeller Mansion around Christmas each year. My reliability had been tested for several years, and at 19 I seemed to graduate to a higher level of use. What could be higher than the President of the United States? In my experience, the Council and certain international individuals like the Rockefellers were a higher level, standing head and shoulders above the government and mere politicians. Lois would be flown to New York by commercial airline and met at the airport. She would be taken to get her hair and nails done, then brought back and dressed to be used to entertain top people from all over the world. At the parties, Lois was dressed formally in expensive evening gowns and often provided a diamond brooch or huge diamond necklace to wear. The evening would usually end in a sexual encounter with the targeted individuals. Nelson Rockefeller was connected to Bob Hope and many presidents, Nixon, Ford, Reagan, and Bush, otherwise known as the Republican Party. Yet it wasn't only the Republican Party. Democrats were not exempt from involvement. There were both Democrats or Republicans involved with the council. At these bipartisan parties, Lois observed a small group of men who usually met in the back room after the party to discuss world strategies and business. It was not unusual to see some of the guests spend the night from among the select few who were invited to the party. I watched the men who literally ran the world, men who decided when it was profitable and or strategically important and politically correct to start a war. They even had it planned who would begin the fighting and where. It always added up to big money, power, and control. People in America think they elect their presidents, but from what I witnessed, they do not. The process of putting someone into office is a controlled and corrupt one. The media is also so controlled that the American people do not get the full and accurate story. The presidents are selected long before they are voted into office. It is no accident that Ronald Reagan or Pete Wilson won by a large majority. It was all rigged through financial, business, and political connections from this group, right down to business and political factions, and then on down into the public, Lois said. They own the press. They own key television stations and famous anchormen. They have key members who own the newspaper companies. They buy magazine companies and own many corporations that allow them to have the leading edge on media exposure, thus allowing them to control the information people see on the news, read in the newspaper, or hear on the radio. They are funded by some of the richest men and corporations in the world who aid them in getting what they want, when they want it, by whatever means it takes to do so. They operate above the law, above the federal government. I witnessed and recorded in my photographic memory many of these encounters as I was bounced around the globe in the company of varied but influential people in the know. Lois's book chronicles all the details. In my late teens and early twenties, I was taken aboard U.S. Navy carriers when Bob was doing a show on his USO tours. I had several personalities who were specifically trained to sing and dance, and several who were expertly trained to dance and strip. Usually Bob and I would be flown into a base and then helicoptered the rest of the way to the ship. 
On tour with Bob, there were always large bands with lots of music and lights set up on the stage. Red, white, and blue banners decorated the stage where we performed. The shows were very festive, high-energy performances. Sailors would be standing, packed together to watch the show. If the media was there, Bob totally controlled what they captured on camera, what segments could be filmed, and when they had to leave. What the boys didn't know was that Bob knew how to engage their emotions with certain specific words and phrases and songs. He knew how to lighten them up, get them really emotional and worked up, and then he would slip them suggestions, keyed to conditioning, that helped them with certain unwanted attitudes. I overheard the council making jokes about the herds, or the troops, and how stupid and easily led they were. After shows, I was usually taken to the commanding officer's quarters to further entertain him in the privacy of his room. My perception was these officers had big egos and felt inflated about all their medals and ribbons. The council often slipped messages, embedded commands, to the officers through me, possibly without the officer's knowledge. After the show, some man would put a stun gun to my body and I would totally collapse into his arms. He would carry me over and lay me down until it was time to leave. The sensation inside was white hot, then very cold. This was my reaction to the electroshock. The man delivering the electricity also delivered programming to me. Before and after he zapped me, he said, You are fat and ugly and no man could ever be attracted to you. I never would have remembered I was attractive enough to perform on stage. I never would have believed I was attractive enough to perform on stage had I begun to remember it. I was often in poor condition when I was helicoptered away. I felt like I was on every naval base in the United States at some time or another to accompany Bob on some of his USO tours or for my own programming. The programming at the bases was torturous. As a child in the late 50s, I was taken to a base where I was put in total isolation. Bright lights were put in my eyes and bands were put around my wrists, ankles, and forehead and I was given electroshock coupled with food and sleep deprivation, and whatever other tortures programmers decided to use, including being hung upside down for extended periods of time. As I got older, programmers on military bases repeatedly drugged me and inflicted various physical, sexual, emotional, and or psychological tortures that assaulted all of my senses. I was put into a large cylindrical chamber, where I was tied by the wrists and ankles at the sides and left in isolation. There were red, yellow, or green lights flashing inside the chamber, but never two colors at once. Other times I was left alone in total darkness and stark silence for what felt like an eternity. Drugs, food, and sleep deprivation always accompanied the programming, and afterwards I felt extremely tired, achy, and nauseated, but mistakenly assumed I just contracted the flu. With people Bob really wanted to own or use, he would take pictures of a rape with hidden cameras. He knew just how to get these people— he would show the man a picture of the rape of a child and say, We sure don't want these pictures or any others like these to get into the wrong hands and ruin your career, do we? Then he would simply tell the man what he wanted. It usually had to do with getting another friend of his into a key position in the government, looking the other way when a case came down, or getting a bill passed or vetoed. He knew just how to control these men, and they usually complied. From 1988 to 1991, Lois was in therapy seven days a week during which time, she says, she uncovered pages of programming from inside. Then one day, she received a dollar bill in her wallet, and on top of it was written, April 12, 2042. Lois knew these were programming numbers, and since she had two serious accidents on April 12, 1985 and 1987, she was convinced April was to be her next programmed accident date. At her next session with her deprogrammer, the doctor told Lois she didn't think she was safe and had better leave Los Angeles. A friend came and offered me a place to stay in Hawaii, and I flew to her home on April 13, 1991. She introduced me to a man who helped me deprogram myself. I taught him what I knew, and he read some books on multiple personality disorder and ritual abuse and applied it to the knowledge he already had. I ceased all contact with my husband, Clark, staying on the island for five weeks. But then I came home when my attorney told me I would lose custody of my children if I didn't. Later, she said, I discovered that I had been at a containment center for mind-controlled slaves, and Lois would eventually learn that her original lawyer worked as a containment asset. I lost custody of my children anyway, and my financial support was very limited due to being a high-level model. My children visited me summers and Christmas on Hawaii, but even after I thought I was free, Lois said, I was still being prostituted. While now, for the first time in her life, Lois says, she is free. 
thanks to some unusual therapy with a deprogrammer who had the expertise to really help me. Sadly, Lois believes her children carry on the multi-generational custom so commonly found with Project Monarch. She believes they are programmed, carrying out their robotic intelligence functions under the control of their father and the watchful eyes of his council-appointed handlers. Chapter 13. Monarch Corroboration A number of friends and fellow researchers couldn't bring themselves to believe the stories of O, nor Lois. In the beginning, neither could I. Both dropped too many famous names. Both had witnessed too many important events in history. Both told hideous stories of abuse. How could our high government officials fall to such low perversions? Would they violate the human spirit just for lust? Greed? After a little thought, once one has processed the horror... One realizes that in each case, celebrities and high government officials were controlled by their vices which were fed by the cryptocracy using one of Project Monarch's programmed presidential models. In each case, it was the survivor's remarkable programmed gifts, which were the invisible reins of control the cryptocracy held over senators, presidents, and kings. In fact, it looks as if our executive branch of government is now controlled by new innovations in the usual Machiavellian options, bribery, blackmail, threat of death, and or ultimately assassination. Then again come the doubts. Here we are taking the word of a reintegrated person who suffered a lifetime of multiple personality disorder, which is a relatively new idea in itself. One doesn't want to believe this. Sure, we'd all seen the films Three Faces of Eve and Sybil, but NPD is new to psychoscience, and to confuse things more, it was renamed DID for Dissociative Identity Disorder in 1994. In 1980, there were only 200-plus cases of MPD reported to the American Psychiatric Association. In 1990, however, there were 24,000 cases. That doesn't mean they weren't there all the time. It only means that the mental health industry has just caught on how to diagnose it. Based on the testimony we've heard, trauma-based programming has existed for hundreds of years, which means there have been programmed people among us with multiple personalities for hundreds of years. While psychiatrists are still struggling with effective treatments, radical new techniques are emerging such as those adapted from neurolinguistics programming and Ericksonian hypnosis. These and similar techniques can affect quick and complete reintegration or fusion for people suffering from MPD. As the treatments become more effective, more MPD sufferers are remembering their core selves, and some are discovering that those core selves are stamped, made by the U.S. government. A woman whose story is remarkably similar to O's is Victoria Vulpes, another nom de plume. With the help of therapists in Florida, Texas, and Minnesota, Vulpes recovered a harrowing assortment of memories, the first of which was of incest with her father, which came out of a dream she had in 1989. Next, she remembered being abused by other relatives, dangled upside down over a cliff, taken to satanic rituals where a baby was killed and eaten, and subjected to mind control experiments by the military and CIA. The owner of an elegant clothing shop, Vulpes sued her uncle, her father was dead, based on the memories she recovered of incest she said occurred 34 years ago. The uncle vigorously denied the charges, and the case was put on hold until the Florida Supreme Court decided that the statute of limitations had expired on this delayed memory case, thus sidestepping a decision. In an interview with a local paper, Vulpes would not discuss the lawsuit or her uncle, but she spoke to a reporter for three hours about the other memories she'd recovered. She said she wanted the government to admit its wrongdoing and release the results of the Monarch Mind Control Project and compensate its victims. Vulpes said she wasn't interested in naming names or getting anyone in trouble. I'm looking for a negotiated peace settlement with the government. She said she only wanted to know the keys to my programming so that I may complete my therapy and healing process. According to the paper, a CIA spokesman said he wasn't familiar with the mind control experiment Vulpes described. Its existence isn't likely, he said. I wouldn't deny her her memory of her experience, but I would be very surprised to see the CIA involved in any way. The article also said Vulpes points to the fact that she has found three other women who have recovered similar memories. All three women are members of a support group run by a therapist who was a past president of a prominent society for the study of multiple personality and dissociative disorders. The therapist, the paper said, has diagnosed about 30 cases of multiple personality disorder and does not question the accuracy of the satanic abuse and military mind control memories. I don't think these folks are making it up, the therapist said. They're two together. Vulpes was separated from her husband and is the mother of two grown children. She built a thriving business and developed a busy social life, the article said. 
She has too much going on to be inventing this kind of fantasy, the therapist said. Besides, people worldwide describe the same things. It couldn't be a coincidence. It's not a coincidence, said FBI agent Kenneth Lanning, who studied allegations of ritual child abuse by satanic cults and others. He said in a phone interview to the paper that the Monarch Project was just kind of a myth or legend that's being spread by a small number of people at a variety of therapy conferences. Absurd urban legends about the corporate logos of Procter & Gamble and Liz Claiborne being satanic symbols persist in spite of all efforts to refute them with reality, Lanning told the paper. Just because individuals who never met each other tell the same story doesn't mean it's true. Another person who questions the accuracy of the memories was the attorney who represented Vulpus's 70-year-old uncle. It's extremely unlikely for this woman to have suppressed the extraordinary events she alleges occurred to her in her childhood and adolescence, the paper quoted the attorney saying. This is not just daddy sneaking into the bedroom. This is torture. Murder. According to the paper, the attorney blames therapists for creating, or at least perpetuating, mass hysteria through the current fad for repressed memory therapy. Volpes said her father was a Cuban-American who went into the U.S. military and was stationed in Panama, Germany, and several U.S. bases, including MacDill in Tampa. She was one of seven children. In 1959, the paper said, Volpes's father left the military and returned to Cuba for about a year. Then he was asked by the Cuban government to leave. Volpes regards this as evidence that he was a CIA agent. During that year in Cuba, her alleged abuse at the hands of her uncle occurred, according to her lawsuit. The accusations included rape, sodomy, and unusual sexual practices. Memories of the abuse by her uncle, as well as others, remained beyond her conscious mind until after her father's death in 1989, Volpus said. At an intensive four-day session of therapy in Minnesota, she got the idea she might have some kind of sexual abuse problem, but she had no memory of any. Then she had a dream in which her father was chasing her and laughing, saying, You can't get away from me. She said that when she awoke, she knew what the dream meant. It shocked her, she said, because this was certainly not the image I had of my father, nor that anyone else had of my father. Other memories came later through work Vulpus did with a number of therapists, and on her own working with pen and paper, letting her subconscious take over and instruct her what to write. Vulpus remembered her father taking her to a satanic ritual in Panama, where Indians killed a small baby and ate it. Her father took her to the ceremony purposely to traumatize her on instructions from his bosses in the CIA, Vulpus said. She said she split several times that night, depositing the painful memory with several alter personalities. I don't know how many parts of me there are, Volpus said. Memories of military mind control emerged during treatment at Charter Hospital in Dallas, where she was sent by Dr. Colin Ross, well-known expert in the field of multiple personality disorder. There she was given paper and told to draw. Her memories of programming sessions by her controls grew out of that time, the article said. She was only one of many children who were traumatized and programmed into total obedience, she said. I believe these were experiments to see how much you could control human beings, Volpus said. Dr. Ross confirmed that Volpus told him she was a military-programmed multiple personality, the article said. His take on it? It's a very complicated matter, difficult to figure out how much is real and how much is not real. It warrants serious study. Volpus told the paper, the Monarch Project experiments are still going on but she declined to discuss current activities because her controls might harm her. She offered a manuscript from a group called Ritual CIA Cult Incest or Abuse Exposed in Santa Rosa, California, that describes the project pretty much the way she did. The paper reported that FBI agent Lanning said it's important to note that people who describe memories of satanic abuse and military mind control often really believe they took place and aren't knowingly lying. It's possible that something abused them, not a satanic cult, not the CIA, but something, did happen to Vulpus while she was growing up. The trouble, though, Lanning told the paper, is that once she starts talking about her wilder memories, she loses credibility in the courtroom. That isn't lost on the attorney, the article reported. I don't know which of her personalities is suing, he said. Due process requires that the real abusee stand up. I'm looking forward to the cross-examination. Are you laughing? Mark Phillips isn't. Phillips has been dealing with the victims of Project Monarch for quite a while. Serial killings are on the increase 200-fold, Phillips said. When caught, some of the killers blamed Satan for their exploits and crimes. Others could not legitimately remember. I watched the FBI stand firm on their no-such-thing philosophy. Remind you of what the detective said on the Oprah Winfrey show? When I managed to get Vulpus on the phone, she talked freely. 
AIDS was known about in 1968 or earlier, she said. I know three different monarch survivors, people. We all got vaccinations, inoculations against autoimmune deficiency. We got it in 1968. AIDS didn't come out until the 1970s. I said then, I'm never going to talk about this. People would say that I'm crazy, so I never talked about it. Then when I did, in the group, three other people said, oh yeah, we were inoculated too. A 1953 artichoke document references the CIA's interest in a synthetic virus. You know how many people died because of AIDS? I won't sign an affidavit to that effect. They'd kill me. But didn't you ever wonder why the politicians in D.C. don't get AIDS? They had the cure for AIDS before they let it get out. Now they're going to release the cure because they hadn't anticipated that it was going to cost this much money. They've developed a whole line of racially specific viruses. They've got things so bad you can't imagine. We talked about psychic phenomenon as it is seen in patients diagnosed as having dissociated identity disorder, or MPD. Volpus told of her memories in the realm of the arcane. I remember a room full of men around a conference table. I was maybe five. They put the chair in the middle of the conference table and had me demonstrate my psychic and intuitive powers. They had me knock the glasses off of some man's nose without moving. I will deny I ever said this. I remember being in Area 51. I think that's where it was. They had a room full of men around a conference table. They got a chair and they were having me demonstrate my psychic and intuitive powers. They had me pinpoint the person who was the least loyal. Everybody went berserk. I had to tell them what I was doing. I had to get under the table psychically and touch his private parts so that he'd know he was going to be touched. He jumped when I touched him. They did a lot of psychic stuff. Yes, it was not unusual. I asked Vulpus if she'd taken part in any remote viewing experiments. I don't remember that. I remember being told by somebody way up in the government, very high, that I was better than Gene Dixon, an elected official who was not aware of the programming I'd had. I was told what to answer and not to answer. I was only a German girl. I was not allowed to be an American citizen. I performed all sorts of things, read his mind, found hidden objects in the room. It's one of the side effects of MPD, Vulpus said. Then we were trained to use it. The one other female I have the most in common with has also had a lot of training. She told me she saw the results of genetic experiments, a hybrid hermaphrodite. Somebody told her that was impossible. It has become clear that the cryptocracy developed aspects of the human mind of which the psychiatric community would not become aware for many years. In his book, The Osiris Complex, Case Studies in Multiple Personality Disorder, Dr. Ross writes, why should people who have been abused as children and who have complex dissociative disorders also be psychic? In one sense, it doesn't matter if the psychic experiences are real. Real or not, this is an important unanswered question in psychology. There is something about the human mind we don't understand, an aspect of experience which has been banished from mainstream psychology and psychiatry. Psychic and extrasensory experiences are so characteristic of people with MPD that they statistically differentiate MPD from other diagnostic groups, such as schizophrenia, panic disorder, eating disorders, and temporal lobe epilepsy. I have met many people with experiences similar to Martha's, the pseudonym of Ross's patient who describes paranormal phenomenon, and all of them have considered their experiences to be real. The ability to dissociate and the ability to have extrasensory experiences are closely linked. I mean psychologically, not genetically, although they could also be linked genetically. I think that the ability to have frequent complex dissociative experiences can be latent in the absence of serious child abuse, and that it often gets activated when there is childhood trauma. Being psychic is not so closely related to having been abused as a child, but this range of human experience is also prone to activation by trauma. The relationship between paranormal experience, dissociation, and child abuse is something psychologists and psychiatrists should study. A whole dimension of human experiences is simply left out of modern academic psychology, although it is universally present in religion, folklore, mythology, and literature. Martha and others like her have taught me to think clinically about the paranormal in a way which is not skewed by the ideological biases of 20th century psychiatry. We know that the CIA funded J.B. Ryan's famous telepathy experiments at Duke University and other explorations of the paranormal. We also can present evidence that the CIA supports public debunking of the paranormal on a full-time basis, adding the reports of the monarch victims and others to the 50-year-long body of reports found in ufology, activities of the men in black, etc. 
You might conclude that one of the cryptocracy's purposes is to disempower human potential through debunking anything that might be evidence of an evolutionary development of human psychic ability, on the one hand, while working in secret to develop that ability for its own dark purpose, on the other. Within the cryptocracy-controlled scientific community, Dr. Ross notes the pattern in a less sinister way. One of the key strategies of the mechanistic reductionist philosophy that dominates 20th century medicine is to define the reductionist model of medicine as the medical model. This is a clever, though unconscious, strategy because it implies that all other models of medicine are medical. Reductionism has claimed a monopoly in effect over medicine and has borrowed the prestige of science to cloak itself in an aura of power, sobriety, and rationality. Galileo was put under house arrest by the Catholic Church for saying that the earth went around the sun. In the late 20th century, the orthodox scientific establishment ostracizes anyone who considers the existence of demons, or extrasensory perception, to be a serious scientific problem, though it lacks the totalitarian control to implement house arrest. In both cases, what is going on is orthodox dogma suppressing free intellectual inquiry, Ross said. The deliberate suppression of the belief, both in the scientific and general public, in the innate human psychic ability by the cryptocracy could be the subject of an entire book. For some reason, recently the so-called monarch survivors are recovering their memories. Thousands of alter personalities are coming forth to tell on their handlers. Many are beginning to walk away from their handlers to drop out of the mind control system. We've heard professionals guesstimate that there could be millions of trauma-based individuals in the United States and probably an equal number or more in Europe. One day, a few years ago, I just started to walk, and I didn't know I was walking, Vulpus said. I figured I was just leading the same life I'd always been leading, but doing real good therapy. But meanwhile, in my memories, these guys are screaming at me, what are you doing? It's a very crazy story. I ended up getting together with someone who told me he was an ex-CIA agent. When they're a CIA agent, they want to be able to talk to someone. That's why he told me he was ex. We know that you can't stop working for the CIA. There's no ex. It's like working for the mafia, but that's what he told me. He ended up coming very close to me and giving me a little bit of grief. But it was interesting because I asked him, What did you do for the CIA? He said, my job was to go after CIA agents who went bad. It wasn't until a year later that I realized that was probably the reason he was hanging around me. They considered me an agent that went bad. And I'm saying, meanwhile, I don't even know what's going on around here. Now I'm getting the memories and now I know what they're talking about. But when I started to walk, I didn't know I was walking. So then there was a negotiating process. I think that more of us are involved with that than we are aware. You know, we all have reporters inside, don't you? And who do you report to? You think you have people from 20 years ago to report to? No. And we all report on each other, unless we've been deprogrammed. And personally, I haven't met anyone who's been completely deprogrammed. I think we still report to people. I asked her if she thought they were still programming people this way, and Volpus said, I don't think they do this anymore because it's not necessary. I hope we can be reintegrated. At some point, the codes, cues, and triggers have got to come out. I'm not going to be the one to do it. Let some of the other women do it. I want to live. But somebody's going to say it. Somebody on their deathbed. Somebody with a death wish. Vulpus had no sexual mutilations like O. Oh. Commenting on that, she said, It depends on where you were in the hierarchy. O was used mainly as a body and as a parrot, so this was acceptable. She may not have had the training a lot of us had. I remember that there were rules having to do with the handling of me and my body. There could not be any mutilation. I had to be clean, immaculate. You could not create any dent, any wrinkle, any breaking of bones, any breaking of the skin, nothing that could damage the goods. I asked if she'd experienced any bestiality like O had. That's satanic stuff. Everybody goes into that. I don't have any specific memories of that, but I wouldn't doubt it. I haven't done much of my satanic work. But I know, I remember when I was very young, those being the rules. And I told my therapist before I knew what was going on, when I just thought it was only my father abusing me. I said, these are the rules. I remember them. I wondered if she had any tattoos or scars or unusually shaped or placed moles, since stun gun shock points can bring the melanin to the surface and cause unusually shaped moles. I have a mole on my right cheek which I do not have in photographs of me as a child. I don't know when it came, she said. My service was all in the line of espionage. 
When I read The Control of Candy Jones, I almost collapsed. It was the same story as mine. People I've spoken to who've had training similar to mine, we can hypnotize people. That was one of the things we were trained to do. And it's interesting, I've always known, before I knew I was MPD, if I got into a certain mode I could get anything I wanted from anybody, even if they had just said no to somebody previously. Mark Phillips talks about people who've had the military programming, how they carry themselves erect. Well, that's the way I carry myself, and that's the way I speak. I don't look that way. I'm feminine. I'm not bad-looking, but I carry myself and handle myself in very much of a military fashion, though I'm not a winsome personality at all. But somebody else can be told, no, and I'll walk up with no charm and get what I want, and not through intimidation, though I know how to intimidate also. That was also a part of my training. I must have done good with the language of the unconscious. We do all understand that if we talk about these things, people won't believe it, so that's why we don't talk about these things. They also spend a good deal of time debunking ESP and things because they don't want people to believe in their own abilities. They don't want everybody to discover that they have strong psychic abilities which could, through remote viewing, make all their secrets public. This is not an integral part of the story, the psychic phenomena part, so if that part of the story is told later on down the line, that's okay. They're using us as workers, 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 she said. Didn't you volunteer? I asked facetiously. I was three years old, she said. Hello? I turned in my letter of resignation four years ago, she said. They have yet to accept it. Stating the obvious, I said, So this all happened to you without your consent? I never knew a thing. I never had any beliefs in my regular life. I asked a burning question. Are you telling your handler what you're telling me? My control has my phone tapped. Everything I've told you, they know, she said. I think they told me not to read your book. I have a mental block about reading your book, a photocopy of the 1978 edition. When I got it today, I just dove into it. I didn't think about it. I got the book and I read it. I have not been able to make myself read it. I have a mental block. Normally when I'm excited about something, I rush right through it. But I'm having trouble getting through it. I haven't got past three chapters. I can feel a wall. I know there's something preventing me and it's not me. Basically, I assume that everything I say gets back to them. I have an agreement with them. Whichever part of me still meets with them and deals with them... I don't say names, I don't say dates. I'm a real team player. I will never sell anybody down the river. I tell people where I'm coming from. I don't want anybody to die. I just got a life. I don't want to die. They already agreed on this two years ago that they would not get prosecuted. I couldn't believe my ears. You're telling me the handlers have been given a deal? A pardon of some kind? What are they trying to do, straighten you guys out and put you on your feet again? I think they're trying to keep it from being a royal mess and ending up in the court system across the land and destroying the country, Vulpus said. The settlement is not the issue. It's not what they did to us. It's what we did for them, for the country. They cannot afford to have it land in court. They can't afford to have it land in a mode of anger in the press. I think, I know they're ready to deal with us. They couldn't get any of us to lift our heads up. Everybody was too frightened. I know there's negotiating going on. I know the people who were in control and the people who could have gotten hurt have been told that they were, from what I understand, given a presidential pardon by George Bush before he left office. That's what I understand, but there's no proof. But it doesn't make sense any other way. When they started this in the beginning, they never thought it had come unraveled. They never thought they'd get caught. Never. They thought you could erase a person's mind forever. Now they know we come unraveled, but they could still fix it. I was given electroshock as recently as six months ago. They have a little travel kit that looks like electric rollers. That's the size of the thing. You plug it into a regular socket. The next time you see it, steal it so we can figure out the amps and volts, I said. Thinking that if one could spend time with one of those who were active, one might be able to stick in enough programming to gather a lot of information and begin to effectively empower these monarch survivors to uncover the whole system but it'll probably wait for someone who was a former programmer to begin the deprogramming. Inevitably, I believe, this is what will happen. The robots will turn on their masters. Vulpus continued talking about the shock equipment. Whenever I'm near one of those things, I'm never in a good position to do anything. I'm not negotiating when that thing is around. I'm totally a victim when that thing's around. But I have two memories within the last year and one half, and I know it's something everybody's not that familiar with. 
When it was used on me the first time, the person that I had been dealing with needed to bring someone else with that apparatus. There needs to be some knowledge behind it. Am I right? She asked me, as if I was an expert with shock techniques. Since this interview, I've learned a lot more about the process, but we all still have a lot to learn. All of us have so much missing time, we don't know what missing time is. When I was first diagnosed, they asked, do you miss time? I said no. It wasn't until a year later that I knew what they were talking about. I never understood what a normal person's concept of time was. I never had a normal person's memory. I never missed any time because I never had a continuous run. Volpus said some things about her background. She was part Cuban, part German, she said. Himmler's Liebensborn project came to mind. Was your dad your real father? I asked. He was my genetic father. I have six siblings who are half-brothers and sisters with the woman who raised me. I was the only one who was an illegitimate birth from a German woman, Volpus said. I was the only one who was not an American citizen. I got thrown out of Cuba on 24 hours' notice. All of a sudden, there was an emergency in 1960, and I had to leave the island at age 12. My dad was Cuban, but he was in the U.S. Air Force. The story was that he came to New York, got caught in communist activities, and got put on Ellis Island. And I always thought that's where he got recruited there. He ended up in Germany at the end of the Second World War in the Air Force, which was his cover for being in the OSS. Then I was born and got put in that program. There is no doubt but that I was in a program. One of the girls in my group and I talked because she had to go to the dentist. So we talked and compared notes and discovered that we had been sent to the dentist almost every week as kids. I think that was the time they did a lot of the training. My kids today have perfect teeth. We have good genes for teeth. I don't think they put us under. I don't remember drugs. I think they traumatized us there. But all we agreed upon was we had too many trips to the dentist, Volpus said. Another survivor of the Monarch program, another survivor of the Monarch program told me about her vivid memories of having her baby teeth removed so that she could transport secret information in the little tooth cavities one at a time. Some tooth fairy tale. My friend, this girl in my group I'm talking about, did not to her knowledge have military training or military service. She was programmed by her father in the basement, but because her programming is so similar to mine, I believe that her father was trained by the same people who trained the people who programmed me. Mine was done under military circumstances, even though my father had homework that was not done on the base. But these people's parents had nothing to do, apparently, with the military, but they were getting the same kind of training, Volpus said. One of the reasons we have not gone full steam ahead with my deprogramming is that I am still too tightly knit into this. If these guys want to talk to me, I think I want to talk to them. I don't want to make it so difficult that I end up getting run over. If I happen to get a little off track, I want to know. I hope they give me some warning, Volpus said. I'm totally aware that they have ways of dealing with me without my ever knowing about it. You may know a lot, but I lived it. You're doing a good job, and if you didn't remain once removed, you wouldn't be doing such a good job. You have things in this edition of the book that you talk about, some of the Air Force programming of David, that made me real uncomfortable when I read it. It triggered me. I have accepted the fact that they probably have a camera in every room I have ever been in, inside my head, inside my car. I have something in my car that buzzes. It's not from the car. It goes on for a minute or so. It used to come from the back. Now it comes from under the dash. They had my old car wired. I just can't believe they've wired my new car already. I wake up every night in the middle of the night. Do others tell you that they wake up at 2.30 in the morning? Why do they do that? Yes, I've heard that. People say 2.30 to 3 o'clock in the morning. Maybe they're turning on the brainwashing machine? I've heard people say that certain cities have signals that go on at night. People say there's an attempt to manipulate and program a large number of people. What content do the signals carry? I don't know. Work harder, longer, faster? I said. I was told it was going to go down quietly. Everybody knew what they were going to do. I heard that Dan Rostenkowski was one of the mind controllers and they're getting him. He since was defeated at the polls. I've noticed a lot of others whose names have come up from survivors are being driven from office, Volpus said. I think there were a lot of people who weren't into agreement with this mind control thing. I think there are a lot of people inside government who were, say, handlers that didn't know how big this thing got. They didn't know because many others were doing it, because of the compartmentalization, because of the need to know. The individuals didn't realize they were part of this insidious, all-pervading system of mind rape. I was a victim of the Cold War. I was victimized in the name of the Cold War. 
Now we know what a sham it was. There was no war. The communists had nothing. What's their excuse now? Do we have a constitution in the United States or don't we? I asked. We have a set of rules that we are supposed to follow, and then we have a separate group of people who are doing damned well what they please. I never had a Bill of Rights. I was a U.S. resident who was not a citizen of the U.S. My father was military personnel. I had every right to be a U.S. citizen. I was not allowed to be a citizen. Five years ago, I got to be a U.S. citizen, and I got the right to vote. But I still don't have the freedom to think for myself. So how the hell can I have free speech? The National Security Act, obviously, takes precedent over the Bill of Rights, Volpus said. Its main purpose today is to keep secret the criminal activities that first started taking place during the so-called Cold War. Now that they've cut the electorate out of the process, they've laid the foundation for the failure of this republic. But we're networking now. Things are going well. I'm talking to you, and tomorrow I can go to the beach and not get killed. A few years ago, I couldn't have said that. I have all the names filed away so that if anything happens to me, the names get released. I'm taking precautions to protect my life. I was once in real danger, but now they've settled and they've gotten a pardon. They were murdering, selling children, white slaving, drug smuggling, doing whatever the hell they wanted and hiding it all behind mind control. Everybody had their side deals going. None of their wives knew about this. Now they've all gotten a pardon. We found a lot of the sergeants, a lot of menial government employees involved in doing the trauma-based programming, I said. Yes, Vulpus said. There was a guy in Miami who was nobody. He had nothing to say. A post office guy. But behind the scenes he was a heavy hitter. He wasn't happy that I began to remember what he'd done. Nothing he did would have been tolerated by his social group. If it was exposed he would have lost his social standing. He would have lost his intelligence capability because he was working under deep cover, and half of the politicians in Miami would have killed him. Everybody was playing both sides of the street. They were all double agents, selling to both sides, any sides, people who were on no side, people just feeding their own habits, doing deals with a declared enemy, and everybody up the line knows it and doesn't care because they're getting theirs. They all knew what they were doing. The stupid people were the American public. A lot of their stuff is still going on extracurricularly. People who were in the Monarch Project and were supposed to be eliminated and weren't, I think, are now being accessed by the former handlers who have retired from government service and are still doing what they were doing when they were in government service. They're no longer smuggling drugs for the CIA's Black Ops Fund. They're smuggling drugs for their own fund and selling sex slaves and trauma programming children so that they can have little MPDs to sell as sex slaves to pedophiles and so on. It happened across the board. That's how this king and that king was controlled, how this senator and that congressman was controlled, how Prince Charles was controlled and interfered with and manipulated so that he'll never be king of England. It was done with so-called presidential models. Now they're getting their comeuppance, I think. There's momentum here. Now, we have to remember we're talking with a person suffering from MPD or DID here. And while they believe what they're saying, is it all accurate and true? Perhaps we should look at what's known about this disorder. In his landmark book, Multiple Personality Disorder, Diagnosis, Clinical Features, and Treatment, Colin Ross tells us, Multiple Personality Disorder is a little girl imagining that the abuse is happening to someone else. The imagining is so intense and subjectively compelling, and is reinforced so many times by the ongoing trauma, that the created identities seem to take on a life of their own, though they are all parts of one person. Two basic psychological maneuvers form the foundation of multiple personality disorder. First, the little girl who is being repeatedly sexually abused has an out-of-body experience. Detached from her body and what is going on, she may float up to the ceiling and imagine that she is watching another little girl being abused. Since that unfortunate little girl on the bed below may have a different name and a different physical appearance, the abuse is not so terrifying and overwhelming because it is happening to someone else and the child is buffered from the direct impact of the trauma. Second, an amnesia barrier is erected between the original child and the newly created identity. Now not only is the abuse not happening to the original little girl, she doesn't even remember it. This process is reinforced over and over as the abuse continues. Various identities may be created to deal with different aspects of the trauma, resulting in an eventual total of 10, 20, or more altered personalities. Once the mind is in the habit of creating new identities in this way, altered personalities may be generated to cope with many non-trauma events, tasks, or functions in life. 
including going to school and dealing with peers. Adult patients with MPD experience a number of core symptoms that should be inquired about in psychiatric assessments. These include voices in the head and ongoing blank spells or periods of missing time. The voices are the different personalities talking to each other and to the main, presenting part of the person who first comes for treatment. The periods of missing time occur when different personalities take turns being in control of the bodies and are attributable to the memory barriers between the personalities. MPD patients also experience numerous other symptoms such as those associated with depression, anxiety, eating disorders, substance abuse, sleep disorders, sexual dysfunctions, and psychosomatic disorders, and symptoms that mimic those of schizophrenia. The assessment and treatment of multiple personality disorder must take this large array of trauma-related symptoms and problems into account. The complexity of the patient's symptoms often results in misdiagnosis and the institution of treatments that are not effective. In fact, in two different published research studies, MPD patients were found to spend an average of just under seven years in the mental health system before being correctly diagnosed. Putnam, 1989, Ross, 1989. During this time, they received many different diagnoses and treatments, none of which took the trauma into account. Although MPD patients are, by definition, diagnosed as having more than one personality, they in fact don't. The different personalities are fragmented components of a single personality that are abnormally personified, dissociated from each other, and amnesic for each other. We call these fragmented components personalities by historical convention. Much of the skepticism about MPD is based on the erroneous assumption that such patients have more than one personality, which is in fact impossible. The programmed MPDs, such as Vulpus, are a different thing than MPDs who have dissociated from less systematic occurring traumas than those imposed during the trauma-based programming. The education of the mental health profession has just begun. Within the year, they will have the tools they need to begin the adventure of deprogramming the survivors of Operation Mind Control. Chapter 14. Himmler's Guinea Kids Heinrich Himmler's Liebensborn program may have been the grandparent of Project Monarch. Monarch sought to create junior Manchurian candidates with multiple personalities, each trained to perform a specific specialty. The kids were programmed to respond to codes, mnemonic cues, and audio-reversed triggers and tones. They were trained in killing techniques and the rapid assembly and deassembly of exotic weapons. They were educated about poisons, explosives, languages, and computers, then programmed to forget it all or remember only selected areas upon command. Monarch produced a cadre of child spies who were directed to prey upon high-placed military, government, and high-society pedophiles, sometimes hauling them into blackmail situations. As in the Nazi Liebensborn program, there is evidence of selected breeding, adoption of the children, and a peculiarly large number of twins among them. There is mounting evidence that the directors of Project Monarch were former Nazis, and that like Nazism, the Monarch program was interlaced with Satanism. Did this pet project of Heinrich Himmler rear its head fifty years after the demise of the Third Reich in the cornfields of Nebraska? While the last gavel has yet to fall in the ongoing litigation, and the major vein of the criminal conspiracy has yet to be opened in court, it appears that Himmler's dream came home to roost on the Great Plains in the good old USA. John DeCamp was a Nebraska state senator for 16 years, during which time he was one of the most effective legislators in Nebraska history. A highly decorated Vietnam War veteran, a practicing lawyer, he's taken time from his demanding practice to write a book, self-publish it, and sell it at lectures around the country. The Franklin cover-up, child abuse, Satanism, and murder in Nebraska is a no-holds-barred exegesis of Omaha, Nebraska's Franklin Community Federal Credit Union, which was raided by federal agents in November 1988. The raid sent shockwaves all the way to Washington, D.C., when it was learned that $40 million was missing. The credit union's manager was Republican Party activist Lawrence E. Larry King, Jr. Behind him stood George Bush and other powerful figures in local politics and business and in the nation's capital. DeCamp used public records to tell the story. In the face of opposition from local and state law enforcement, from the FBI and powerful Omaha World Herald newspaper, a special Franklin committee of the Nebraska legislature launched its own probe. What at first looked like just another savings and loan swindle soon exploded into a tale of drugs, Iran-Contra money laundering, a nationwide child abuse ring, and ritual murder, DeCamp said. The Franklin cover-up followed the ugly precedent of the Warren Commission. 
On June 21, 1991, 21-year-old Alicia Jane Owen was pronounced guilty by a jury in Douglas County, Nebraska, on eight counts of felony perjury. On August 8, 1991, she was sentenced to serve 9 to 27 years in prison, begins DeCamp's book. Owen was indicted for telling a grand jury, before which she testified in 1990, that she was sexually abused as a juvenile by a Nebraska District Court judge, by the chief of police of the city of Omaha, by the manager of the Franklin Community Federal Credit Union, and others. Alicia Owen also witnessed, she said, the abuse of other children by figures in Nebraska's political and financial establishment, whom she named, among them the publisher of the state's largest newspaper, the Omaha World Herald. She testified that she was in a group of Nebraska children who functioned for years as illegal drug couriers, traveling nationwide for some of Nebraska's wealthiest, most powerful, and prominent businessmen. If King was involved with CIA money laundering, DeCamp wrote, that jibes with a report from a member of Concerned Parents. I heard from two different black people in North Omaha that King used to send limousines down to Ofut Air Force Base, home of the Strategic Air Command, to pick up CIA personnel for parties. The sometimes expansive Larry King used to talk fondly about his friends. In a September 7, 1988 interview with the Metropolitan, King said, I know some of the people I admire aren't very popular. Ed Meese, the late Bill Casey of the CIA, and I love former Chief Justice Berger. Those are the people I really like to talk to. Bill Casey? I just thought so very highly of him. Larry King adored Bill Casey, DeCamp said. But what about one of Casey's predecessors at Central Intelligence, George Bush? Ever since July 23, 1989, when the lead editorial in the World Herald said that one child is said to believe that she saw George Bush at one of King's parties. King's connection with Bush has been a frequently asked question about the Franklin case. Anxiety on this account has run especially high in Omaha's black community, where in December 1990, one young lady stood up at the public meeting and proclaimed, I think George Bush is involved in this child abuse case, and that is why all these people have been dying. Inside investigators of Franklin and the Webb case before it know that Bush's name came up at the very beginning, and it came up more than once. The July 1989 World Herald column, in an attempt to discredit this and other victim witness testimony, attributed the mention of Bush to a person under psychiatric care, meaning Loretta Smith. In reality, the report was from Nellie Patterson Webb. Nellie first brought up Bush in 1986, DeCamp said, when she told Julie Waters about the sex parties she was flown to in Washington and Chicago. She saw Bush at two of these parties, she said, one in each city. Bush's name surfaced again in Lowe's May 1989 review of reports by Thomas Vlahoulis from the state attorney general's office. Sorensen told Vlahoulis that both Kimberly and Nellie brought up the name of George Bush and indicated that they had both met him. On June 10, 1989, Lowe received a letter from a citizen. There is a psychologist in Omaha who used to work for the CIA. In response to a direct question by an Omaha psychiatrist regarding George Bush's private life, this psychologist reported hearing rumors when Bush was head of the CIA that correspond directly with one of the inferences made by Nellie Webb. And in August 1990, DeCamp said, to head the Agency for International Development, AID. Roskins had been fired the previous year as Chancellor of the University of Nebraska, where Larry King was a member of his Chancellor's Advisory Committee. Gary Caridori's daily notes from February 19, 1989 record, I was informed that Roskins was terminated by the state because of sexual activities reported to the regents and verified by them. Mr. Roskins was reported to have had young men at his residence for sexual encounters. As part of the separation from the state, he had to move out of the state-owned house because of the liability to the state if some of this sexual behavior was illegal. Upon Roskins vacating the house, he was provided a house by Joe Sechrist of the Lincoln Journal Star. The leadership of AID is the kind of sensitive job AID assignments have been used as a cover for CIA agents, for instance, for which appointees undergo a background check that would have to turn up what Caridori also heard. Nevertheless, George Bush appointed Roskins. What do Ronald Reagan, President George Bush, former CIA Director William E. Colby, Democratic presidential candidate Bob Carey, billionaire and second richest man in America and now head of Solomon Brothers Warren Buffett, and Ronald Roskins, the current 93 administrator of the Agency for International Development, all have in common, I asked my close friend and advisor, William Colby. DeCamp wrote, I give up, former head of the Central Intelligence Agency, Colby said. What could that group have in common? Three things, I replied. 
all of them a burden at times for those who have to carry them. The three things are me, John DeCamp, a case called Franklin, and a man named Larry King. Are you serious? Colby asked. Dead serious, I responded, and I hope that word dead does not turn out to be a prophetic pronouncement, as it has for at least fifteen other Franklin-related personalities. My statement to Bill Colby was not made lightly, DeCamp said. Colby and his wife, Sally Shelton Colby, a United States ambassador under President Jimmy Carter, were at that very moment warning me to get away from the Franklin child abuse investigation. Larry King and anybody else linked with Franklin as quickly as possible for the sake of my own life and safety. Sally and Bill had never talked to me like this before. They sat me down, made it clear that this was not one of our routine discussions about life and health and happiness, and emphasized to me the serious nature of what and whom I was dealing with. What you have to understand, John, is that sometimes there are forces and events too big, too powerful, with so much at stake for other people or institutions, that you cannot do anything about them, no matter how evil or wrong they are, and no matter how dedicated or sincere you are, or how much evidence you have. That is simply one of the hard facts of life you have to face. You have done your part. You have tried to expose the evil and wrongdoing. It has hurt you terribly, but it has not killed you to this point. I am telling you, get out of this before it does. Sometimes things are just too big for us to deal with, and we have to step aside and let history take its course. For you, John, this is one of those times, Bill warned, with Sally nodding her head in affirmation. When a caution of this nature comes from someone of the stature and experience of Bill or Sally Colby, you have to take it seriously, even if you do not want to. That unless I backed off from the Franklin situation, I might be looking at life from a pine box six feet underground. John DeCamp couldn't see how he could just lay the issue down and walk away from it. He couldn't see how anybody would want to live in a country where children were being sexually abused and killed by the nation's most respected citizens and business leaders, who were also involved in drug dealing and official corruption. Every bone in my body tells me that evil is triumphing, and everybody who is anybody is scared beanless to do something about it for fear of one thing or another, DeCamp said. If I or someone like me do not keep pursuing this, then who will? And if we quit now, then when, if ever, will the truth come out and something be done about this evil and this corruption? So DeCamp kept on keeping on. He is a capable attorney and a fearless man who was largely instrumental in bringing the eyes of the world to focus on Larry King and the Lincoln S&L cabal. He gathered the evidence that brought the criminal conspiracy before two grand juries. Without knowing it, he stepped right into the middle of a Project Monarch operation. Happily, he's still with us. Here's what happened in his own words. Two grand juries, one local and one federal, had a mandate to consider these and other charges of child abuse connected with the Franklin Credit Union. They indicted the victims and witnesses for perjury instead. This is unprecedented, probably in the history of the United States, commented Dr. Judy Ann Denson Gerber, a lawyer, psychiatrist, and nationally prominent specialist on child abuse. Denson Gerber is an M.D. who is thought to be a CIA asset. Her husband was on the Warren Commission. During her visit to Nebraska in December 1990, she said, If the children are not telling the truth, particularly if they have been abused, they need help, medical attention. You don't throw them in jail. Both grand juries, DeCamp continued, admitted that Alicia Owen and Paul Bonacci, whose testimony extensively corroborated Owens, had been badly abused. But this was done, they concluded, by persons other than those the young people named. Bonacci, too, was indicted for perjury. Two other victim witnesses, whose stories buttressed those of Owen and Bonacci, recanted under immense pressure. Alicia Owen and Paul Bonacci refused to recant. This was the first time the tip of the monarch iceberg surfaced in public. It is a story which matched with others in all its lurid details. Perverted sexuality, bestiality, ritual abuse, trauma, and mind control. In late 1993, a key Franklin Savings and Loan witness, Troy Boner, admitted that the Federal Bureau of Investigation terrorized and forced him to lie for the protection of criminal perpetrators. Boner's coerced testimony was used to discredit the case against the powerful political figures and to falsely convict for perjury Alicia Owen. Attorney John DeCamp filed for a new trial for Miss Owen. He also pressed an explosive civil rights suit on behalf of Paul Bonacci, who continued to give evidence against armed forces and intelligence community personnel and political leaders, including former President George Bush. 
The existence of Troy Boner's sworn statement and the application for a new trial for Alicia Owen were covered in a small, detail poor article October 30, 1993, in the Omaha World Herald, a newspaper which is a central party in the Franklin case. Otherwise, aside from a November 1, 1993 Omaha radio interview with Boner and his attorney DeCamp, the new evidence was subjected to a tight press blackout. After the Nebraska Senate Investigating Committee found that over 100 children could testify to an international child abuse ring related to black Republican Party activist Larry King, Franklin's chief executive, the FBI, Nebraska officials, and the news media attacked the legislative committee and its witnesses in an atmosphere of rising violence and intimidation. In the course of this terror, the committee's chief investigator, Gary Caradori, was killed when his airplane unexplainably disintegrated. Troy Boner's brother was found shot to death at Ophit Air Force Base. Alicia Owen's brother was found hanged in jail. In a separate October 27, 1993 affidavit, Troy Boner's mother said, Troy promised me right after Gary Caradori was killed that he was going to quit lying for the FBI and attorney Mark Delman. He did go and see Senator Schmidt. Sometime after that, my son, Troy's brother, Sean, was killed and I am quite certain was executed as a message to Troy that he had better stick with his lies at the upcoming Alicia Owen trial or else. In his affidavit, Troy Boner said that after Caridori's death, he spoke to Caridori's widow, Sandy, and told her, and that what I told Gary Caridori was the truth, and that I only lied out of fear that the FBI and others would hurt me or my family. In a November 1, 1993 KKAR radio interview, Troy Boner claimed that he had also met with Omaha World Herald reporter Gabriella Stern out of fear for his life. He had sought the reporter's protection so he could do what was right by Caridori, to whom he had told the truth. He said he had asked her to get the story out, but not to use his name. He was then 23 years old. The World Herald, in fact, had carried an article on July 12, 1990, by Robert Dorr and Gabriella Stern, headlined, Caridori's Airplane Broke Up in Flight. The article quoted State Senator Lauren Schmidt saying the people who wanted to see Caridori dead got their wish, and that Schmidt told AP that Caridori recently had been trying to obtain pictures that some alleged victims said were taken of them during the time they were abused. The article further included the following three paragraphs. A 23-year-old man, who last November gave Caridori a videotaped statement saying he had been sexually abused, but later recanted part of his account, said the investigator's death frightens him. He said Caridori had warned him that people involved in the Franklin investigation could be in danger. The 23-year-old man, who hasn't been publicly identified, said he fears someone might try to harm him. The 23-year-old, who said he had flown with Caridori several times during the investigation, said the investigator was meticulous about checking the plane before taking off. DeCamp filed suit in the United States court in Nebraska on behalf of Paul Bonacci, the courageous survivor of nearly two decades of torture. The suit asked damages from the Catholic Archdiocese of Omaha, relating inclusively to sex abuse at the Boys Town Orphanage, Lawrence King, Peter Citron, Alan Baer, Harold Anderson, and Robert Wadman for sex crimes, slavery, beatings, and burnings. Omaha police officers for harassment in an attempt to prevent Bonacci from testifying, and the corrupt Douglas County Grand Jury, its foreman Michael Flanagan, and its special prosecutor Samuel Van Pelt. During raids on Peter Citron's home, police seized a large number of videotapes, on which were recorded the degraded criminal acts committed by many elite citizens against Paul Bonacci, Alicia Owen, Troy Boner, and other children. These tapes were prized by the perpetrators as pornography and had great value as well for blackmail. Paul Bonacci filed an affidavit detailing the individuals and the crimes on the tapes and asking for release of the tapes to his attorney, John DeCamp. Although former World Herald Society columnist Peter Citron had been classified as a mentally disordered sex offender, Citron's attorney Lionel Keenig opposed the release of the tapes to the young man his client victimized because of the likelihood of injury to otherwise innocent people. There will be people in this state whose lives will be in a hopeless shambles as a result of these disclosures. Since the 1992 publication of DeCamp's book, Paul Bonacci has filed new affidavits and has given extensive interviews to investigators including reporters for Executive Intelligence Review and The New Federalist. Bonacci's disclosures correlated with evidence supplied by authorities in law enforcement, psychiatry, and the intelligence community. The results go a long way to explain the high stakes involved and the frantic nature of the Franklin cover-up. The tight little circle of Nebraska corporate and financial interests 
wrote Ancon Chaitkin, intertwined with the Franklin Credit Union defines the first level of national power that is threatened with exposure in the case. A clique of Freemasons, the chief executives of Union Pacific Railroad, ConAgra, Peter Kewitt and Sons, Mutual of Omaha, and the Omaha World Herald served on Franklin's advisory board and conduited funds from their own firms and from the Boys Town Orphanage into Franklin's accounts. Union Pacific boss Michael Welsh, for example, was chairman of finance for Boys Town. The Union Pacific headquarters office in Omaha is reportedly completely gripped by homosexuality at the executive level. Chaikin pointed out that the foreman of the grand jury which indicted the sex crime victims, Michael Flanagan, was himself employed in the legal department of Union Pacific, a company deeply involved in the Franklin case. The Bonacci suit charged that Flanagan violated his grand jury duties by sharing grand jury information with lawyers and others he met with on a regular basis almost every day following grand jury proceedings at Union Pacific headquarters, receiving advice and guidance from them on how to proceed in the grand jury proceedings and provided them information on the supposedly secret grand jury proceedings themselves. Flanagan had, Chaikin wrote, not long prior to the grand jury sessions, himself been accused of homosexual pandering directed at a young Union Pacific employee, and the company on his behalf had reached a settlement to silence the complaining young man. In his October 28, 1993 affidavit, Paul Bonacci stated, The real activity I and Alicia and on occasion Troy Boner were engaged in was functioning as drug couriers and recruiters of children for Alan Bear and Larry King. They were buying and selling large quantities of cocaine into the Midwest and using us as mules, or drug couriers, to obtain the goods from the various airports and get the drugs delivered back to Omaha. Other prominent and wealthy Omaha citizens were also involved in this. The sex activities we did and were paid so well for were just tools to blackmail or compromise or pay off some judge or businessman or policeman or politicians generally. Here in Omaha or at Larry King's place in Washington or other places we went. Now imprisoned, Franklin Credit Union manager Larry King became infamous as the host of child sex parties held in the seats of power, such as at Republican national conventions. DeCamp's book placed King in the middle of a national and international organized crime syndicate engaged in pedophilia, pornography, Satanism, drugs, and money laundering. Chaikin wrote, The use of these crimes to blackmail or compromise or pay off powerful men leads to extremely serious questions of national security. Larry King's prime Nebraska sponsor and accused sex crime associate, former World Herald publisher Harold Anderson, was a chairman of the World Press Freedom Committee, which Chaitkin called a front for the Oliver North Project Democracy faction of the intelligence services, managing political power relations within Eastern Europe. Harold Anderson's reported best friend in Washington, D.C., was Nebraskan Robert Keith Gray, a shadowy power broker at the Hill and Knowlton political management firm. Over many years, Gray and his associates in the intelligence community are said to have managed homosexual compromising operations to keep congressmen, judges, military officers, diplomats, and foreign leaders in line, Chaikin said. The Franklin Credit Union was, from all the evidence, among the savings institutions used for money laundering by the CIA and others for Iran-Contra adventures. This precisely defines where, Chaikin said, Omaha's Larry King showed up in Washington, D.C., in the bizarre homosexual wing of the Republican Party, which managed financing and public relations for the Iran-Contra guns-for-drugs trading games. Paul Bonacci described in detail being dragged to Washington for use as a sex toy for Larry King's clients. Bonacci told investigators he was in one of the private White House tours for young male prostitutes conducted by lobbyist Craig Spence, a close political associate of Larry King in the cloak-and-dagger Contras enterprise. Spence turned up dead in a Boston hotel room in 1989, soon after his and King's compromising business was exposed in a Washington Times June 29, 1989 story headlined, Homosexual Prostitution Inquiry Ensnares VIPs with Reagan and Bush. In one instance detailed in the Franklin cover-up, Paul was taken by Larry King and others to a wooded area in California, identified after publication as the Bohemian Grove. There, Paul and another boy were forced to perform unusual sex acts with and to consume parts of a child with whom they had watched being murdered by the cultists. The body was to be disposed of by the men with the hoods. A snuff pornography film was made of these events. It was directed by a man the party had picked up in Las Vegas, whom Paul identified as Hunter Thompson, the same name as a well-known author. 
at Ofit and later on other military installations, Bonacci said this ring programmed him through torture, heavy drugging, and sexual degradation, instructing him in military arts of assassination. Bonacci's personal knowledge in these realms, Chaikin said, can scarcely be accounted for other than by crediting the indictments he has made. Larry King, FBI agent Jerry Wall, Alan Baer, Harold Anderson, and former Omaha police chief Robert Wadman have all been reported as collaborators with this satanic military-based ring. King reportedly told Paul's captors at Ophit, he's young, but you trained him good. A member of Nebraska's Concerned Parents Group reported hearing from two North Omaha witnesses that King used to send limousines down to Ophit Air Force Base to pick up CIA agents for parties. Psychiatrists who have treated a growing number of MPD cases, victims of satanic ritual abuse, report an alarming pattern of findings in many of their child patients, Chaitkin wrote. There is a structure to the personalities conforming to what is evidently a deliberate breaking and reshaping of the mind. This phenomenon was identified to Paul Bonacci by his tormentors and to other victims and witnesses as the Monarch Project. At Offutt Air Force Base, Bonacci was told that what he and other children were being subjected to was in the interests of national security. The use of mind-altering drugs, sensory deprivation, and other brainwashing techniques on U.S. citizens as subjects was the admitted practice of the CIA, certain military arms and private institutions joined in the MK Ultra, Artichoke, and Bluebird projects beginning in the early 1950s. A national security pretext often cited was the need to keep up with the Soviets in the race to develop a workable Manchurian candidate human robot, Chaikin wrote. With the Monarch Project, the idea is extended to the production of a horde of children in whom the soul is crushed, who would spy, whore, kill, and commit suicide. Professionals probing the child victims of Monarch say there are clearly two responsible elements at work, the government-slash-military and cooperating satanic, or more exactly pagan, cults. These are multi-generation groups where parents donate their own children, who are proudly called bloodline or simply blood cultists, to be smashed with drugs and electric shock and shaped, Chaikin wrote. Other children are kidnapped and sold into this hell or are brought in gradually through daycare situations. Paul Bonacci and other child victims have given evidence in great depth on the central role of Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino in this depravity, Chaikin wrote. Aquino, alleged to have recently retired from an active military role, was long the leader of an army psychological warfare section which drew on his expertise and personal practices in brainwashing, Satanism, Nazism, homosexual pedophilia, and murder. A former director of the CIA, one assumes this was William Colby, was asked directly, what about Monarch? He replied angrily and ambiguously, we stopped that between the late 1960s and the early 1970s. If a statement of fact, this would presumably relate to official participation of the CIA, Chaikin said. The disclosures of Paul Bonacci, which jibe with reports of MPD professionals in other cases, point to several peculiar artificially induced memories common to many monarch victimized children. Chaikin said that a number of the victims were recovering memories of tormentors dressed as space aliens or Mickey Mouse or in Wizard of Oz costumes. There are said to be such other personality levels as Master Programmer, Black Master, and different mental levels of backup programs, Chaikin said. There are reported to be personnel who have large numbers of child victims' assignments and triggers neatly filed in their little computers. Paul Bonacci reported the following Monarch-related activities, often involving his commander at Ophit Air Force Base, Bill Plemons, and Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. Picking up cash in exchange for drugs at various Tennessee locations, identifying several country music personalities as his contacts. Trips on behalf of the North American Man-Boy Love Association, or NAMBLA, the pedophile group now given semi-official status by the United Nations, Bonacci cited travel to Netherlands and Germany carrying child pornography for subsequent import to the USA to avoid prosecution. In Amsterdam, he named Charles Hester and the British Tommy Carter, who had on computer a global list of child pornography users. Nambla was also cited for organizing auctions of children. Travel to Hawaii, New York, Washington, in connection with Craig Spence, to compromise public figures by performing homosexual pedophile sex with them. The trip to California, where the boy was ritually murdered, accompanied by Monarch contact Mark Johnson of Denver, Colorado. 
travel to Mexico for the transportation of drugs, guns, and children, Paul was accompanied by the gangster figure Emilio, who otherwise directed the kidnapping of Johnny Gosh of Des Moines, Iowa. Johnny Gosh's parents recommend Paul Bonacci as an accurate witness relative to that crime. Training under Captain Foster, survival skills, at Fort Riley, Kansas, under Lieutenant Dave Bannister, intelligence, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, under Colonel Harris Livick at Fort Defiance, Virginia, who is said to run a military school and to have housed monarch boys. Colonel Bill Reicher of Bamberg, South Carolina, is said to have supplied children for Michael Aquino. Travel to Dresden in communist East Germany, where weapons were inspected. There and in the Federal Republic of Germany, the monarch personnel were frequently neo-Nazis. This area, Bonacci said, was a special project of Lieutenant Colonel Aquino, who was a West European advisor to the U.S. Chiefs of Staff. Bonacci had extensive experience in the Aryan Nation and other white supremacist cults. Bonacci told the story of the teenaged concentration camp inmate allegedly named Greenbaum, who had participated with the Nazis to save himself, came to the United States under Project Paperclip, the secret and illegal importation of Nazi war criminals by the U.S. intelligence agencies. Known later as Dr. Green, Bonacci said he became a high-level mind controller and, according to Bonacci, is widely represented today in mind control programs which have a distinctive magic theme. Precise details of all these horrors lie deeply buried in national security archives, perhaps. But this history, as told to psychiatrists, dovetails what is definitively known about Anglo-American intelligence operations and the German Nazis. The killers in the Nazi camps were themselves trained and organized by psychiatrists and eugenicists, operating from the T4 Bureau. These psychiatrists had long been the pets of white supremacist British and American financier networks. At least some of these Nazi doctors were spirited out of Germany under the supervision of former Bank of England Governor Montague Norman and Tavistock Institute Director John R. Rees on behalf of the British government, Chaikin wrote. Norman had been chief of a pre-war pro-Nazi faction within England, and Rees organized post-war propaganda and continuing psychological warfare activities, and created Orwellian groupings within U.S. psychiatry and mental health fields. Much of this criminal history comes together in the person of Robert A. Lovett, born in 1895 and died in 1986. Robert Lovett and his closest associates have run the state of Nebraska during much of this century. Lovett was the chief executive of the Harriman-owned and Omaha-based Union Pacific Railroad, as his father had been. Robert Lovett was a partner in the Brown Brothers Harriman International Banking Firm, with Avril Harriman and Prescott Bush, father of President George Bush. Chaikin wrote, Montague Norman arranged many of the intrigues on behalf of Hitler and the Nazi Party through the Harriman Lovett Bush firm, in which Norman himself had been a hereditary partner. Under President Truman, Robert Lovett chaired the Lovett Committee, which made the decision that the U.S. should have a central intelligence agency modeled on the British Intelligence Service. Lovett was Secretary of Defense in 1951 through 1953. His attorney, Alan Dulles, then took over the CIA. Lovett, Harriman, the Bush family, and a very select group of their associates, owners of drug and defense multinationals, many from Yale's Skull and Bone Society, maintained homes on Jupiter Island, off Hobie Sound, north of Palm Beach, Florida. Jupiter Island is the headquarters for the so-called utopian faction in military strategy, the heavy Anglophiles, as opposed to the traditionalists typified by Douglas MacArthur, Chaitkin wrote. Troy Boner, a witness in the Franklin Credit Union case, swore out a new affidavit on October 27, 1993. In that affidavit, Boner said, I, my mother and family, are exhausted from living in fear of death or injury as a result of the Franklin matters. I lied at the grand jury hearings, and I lied at the Alicia Owen trial. I lied because I truly believed, and still do believe, that it was a situation where I must either lie or die and at the insistence primarily of the Federal Bureau of Investigation officials, Mr. Mickey Mott and Mr. Rick Culver. What I told Gary Caradori in the original taped interviews, in my first contact with the FBI, they made it clear to me they were only interested in disproving everything I had told them. They took the position that, if you will tell us you are lying, then we will let you off the hook. But if you insist on sticking with the story you told Caradori, then we will stick you in prison for 20 years each on a lot of different charges of perjury. If you insist on sticking with your story, 
you will go down. The FBI, in conjunction with my new attorney, Mark Delman, made me say that the truth was a lie and the lies they wanted to tell me were the truth. I told the grand jury what the FBI and Delman wanted me to tell the grand jury, which is that the story of Gary Caridori was a hoax, but as stated, the exact opposite is true. Then Gary Caridori was killed. I have no proof, but I believed he was deliberately killed. As a part of a cover-up and as a result of my lies to the grand jury, I immediately called his home and spoke to his wife Sandy. I told her that what I told Gary was the truth and that I only lied to the grand jury out of fear that the FBI and others would hurt me or my family and had promised me they would put me in jail if I did not say what they wanted me to say. I also met Senator Bernice Labids at the Caridori funeral and agreed I would meet her and Senator Schmidt for lunch immediately following the funeral to go over my alleged recantation and tell her and the committee all the facts. At the funeral, however, the FBI agents made it clear to me through their actions that they knew what I was up to and gave me the clear impression that I was in great danger if I went ahead and met with the legislative committee and tried to tell them the truth. So I told my mother that I was going to stick with my lies to the grand jury. Later, Mark Delman and Mickey Mott saw Senator Schmidt say on TV that I had been in his, Schmidt's, office and my recantation had been false. Even though Mark Delman knew I had been at Schmidt's and that what Schmidt was saying was the truth, he asked me whether the conversation had been taped or whether there was any other record of my having been in Schmidt's office to talk to Schmidt. I told Delman there was no tape or any other record. On Delman's instructions, I publicly lied and denied any meeting or discussion with Senator Schmidt, and Delman did too. Delman's exact words to me were, It's your word against his, as long as there are no tapes. Mickey Mott, the FBI man, then said something I interpreted to have been a direct and personal threat that later came to pass. When I told the FBI people that Alan Baer and others could not afford to do anything to hurt me now because too much publicity was focused on me, Mott told me that they probably would not do anything directly to me, that instead they will do something to a family member. And that is what happened shortly thereafter, when the FBI said, and Bear and others thought I might break away from them. When the FBI and Bear and others thought I might break away from them. I am completely certain that my brother Sean was killed as a message to me not to tell the truth at the Alicia Owen trial. After Sean got killed, I had no doubt at all that they would do anything and kill anybody to keep the truth contained and to keep me lying for them, and I complied with their every request. Before the Alicia Owen trial, I was carefully rehearsed by the FBI as to what I would say. The FBI had actual pictures in their possession including Alan Baer, 1983 picture of him and me at age 15 or 16 in very pornographic sexual acts, as well as checks from Alan Baer to me. So they had to absolutely know I had a relationship with him and that they were forcing me to lie when I denied such relationships in court. The FBI had seized photos and tapes involving, among others, myself and Larry King. I know from having seen tapes at Peter Citron's house that the FBI had access to tapes which clearly documented what I and the other kids had identified. I know the FBI and others will say in reply, You can't believe Troy Boner now. If he lied once, he will lie again. He's a drug addict. He's a sex pervert. Besides, these kids were using the drugs and selling their bodies and getting paid well for it, and they did it all voluntarily. Yes, we kids from early age sold our bodies. We became drug addicts. We got lots and lots of money from these people. But today we are ruined because of that, and we were turned into sex perverts and drug addicts by these people. Alan Baer was the one who first taught me to mainline and who first injected heroin directly into my veins same as he did to a lot of other boys. He made me a prisoner of drug addiction to completely control me and use me to deliver drugs or deliver sex or anything else. Alan Bear first injected me with a speedball, a heroin and cocaine mix that zips you up but brings you down mellow. Mark Delman claimed that I had not met with Senator Schmidt to tell the truth and I followed his instructions in denying it. This can be checked out. There were people who saw me with Schmidt and with Senator Labitz. I saw the picture the FBI had of me and Alan Bear. Some official sure ought to be able to get this picture to prove who is lying, me or the FBI. Lots of kids knew about Alan Bear, Larry King, and the major drug dealing activity they and other prominent people were involved in. But as long as they are scared for their lives because of what happened to Alicia and me, they are not going to say anything. An honest prosecutor should step in and offer immunity and protection to these kids. 
ask me or any of the other kids to take lie detector tests side by side on the same questions with the people we are accusing of these things. Researcher, writer, producer Andy Baum interviewed Paul Bonacci with DeCamp's assistant Denise Meyer in 1993. He corroborates the stories of the other Project Monarch victims. Please note that Baum, as well as Chaitkin, questioned whether Monarch is the true code name of the project. Paul Bonacci encountered Michael Aquino at Ofit Air Force Base several times wearing an Army uniform. Mainly it was on his trips to, I think it was St. Louis, Bonacci said, and because he came here for a couple of different satanic holidays. Bonacci said Aquino and other members of the Temple of Set dedicated a part of the old market in downtown St. Louis to Satan, walking around the area in street clothes performing the ritual. I encountered a lot of things that were with Monarch that were somewhere else, Bonacci said. We went to different military bases. I went to Fort Riley, Kansas. I went to the Presidio out in California for some training, a base in Colorado which is where they did a lot of the alien training. What they would do is have a couple of ships that would look like alien ships, and they would drug you up. Because I remember doing this to other kids. And they'd use some of the other kids, and they would put them in uniforms, and they would use LSD, which would make you feel like you were already out of it anyway. They would be wearing uniforms, and they would do little experiments. They would actually take little metal, they looked like implants, and they would let you see what they were doing. Some people would implant them and then take them out later on. I know some of them were locators because they wanted to know where the person was at all times. I mean, they had this little thing. It was on the satellite and they could find that person. The reason they were doing that, I overheard some of them talking about it, this sounds weird, as they had soldiers in action or something in different countries, that they would know where all their men were and they would know what the status of them was, whether they were living or dead, and they would be able, if they were dead, to find their body. So that's why they were testing them. But on the kids, they were using it to make sure they knew where they were. Bomb to Bonacci. So aside from Aquino, did you see some, wherever you were with these monarch activities, did you see some of those people who were at the satanic activities too? Some of them, yes, Bonacci said. The adults were wearing military uniforms when they were training us, and so were, they kept everything at the base, but during most of the training we wore regular street clothes. When we went through the alien programming, we wore street clothes. The reason that anybody could come out of Monarch Alive was because they would all be talking about little green men. Giving some insight into the difficulties all Monarch victims have, Bonacci said, I remember when I first started talking, everything was so jumbled up and that was their programming because people would try and get information out of me and the codes that they would use to scramble everything was the very same thing people were asking me. They were asking me a question, but what they were doing is getting everything scrambled up. When Baum asked Bonacci where he got the name Monarch, the young man said, I got the name Monarch because Monarch was the name that was part of a code that was supposed to destroy all my memories of the Monarch activities. Another more fully recovered Monarch victim says that she doubts if Bonacci ever heard the word Monarch. Bonacci explained that when the word monarch was heard, it almost started to erase everything I knew. But that must not have been the entire code, just the name, because it would trigger enough of his multiple personalities so they'd start coming out in random order, telling everything. They thought this was deprogramming time, they thought this was deprogramming time, so it's time to start telling everything. But then, Bonacci said, the programmers weren't there to pull them, the personalities, out one at a time. So it's like each one of them came out, as you know, in different orders. Bonacci said that there were two groups of Project Monarch slaves. Some were put into society, Bonacci said. They were the ones that went into entertainment, and a lot of them were used for transporting drugs, which is the way they paid for the programming. They used the entertainment industry because they could input their messages for the future. If they wanted to start a revolution, Bonacci said, they'd put it right in the music and it would go out over the airwaves. It was not easy for Paul Bonacci to remember certain things. At the time of Baum's interview with him, he was still in intensive therapy and had not completely reintegrated his multiple personalities. Baum asked how they went about planting things in his mind, things which he said would make him sound absurd if he told anyone about them. They would play things, show things on a screen, Bonacci said. They would have that person sitting there and saying something, but you couldn't really tell what he was saying. Yet you'd hear the words real plain, but it might not have been his voice. Like, he was talking, you could see that he was talking, but the words and the mouth didn't match. But you would put it together like an actor speaking in a poorly dubbed foreign film. Bonacci said one part of the training was trying to get him to read other people's minds. 
Everybody says I basically read their mind. They'd ask and I'd answer it for them before they got it out. The ones they used for that, extrasensory perception, were the ones they trained in Satanism. They trained them as magicians because, this is going to sound even crazier, when they trained us we could actually do it, because there are spiritual forces and they do teach you to control. How to get demons to do stuff for you. I can't say control because those demons are going to turn on you someday, but having your own demons that would do it, they would be the ones that would do it. So, Baum said, you were instructed in that sort of context, not that it was a physical force from, uh, yourself, Bonnie said. But it's actually like a little spiritual, Baum said. It's spiritual rather than scientific. Yes. Was it always on the negative side? Baum asked. Was it a demon rather than God or an angel or fairy? It was always on the demonic side, Bonacci said, because that's the only ones that you could work with. And if somebody asked you, you never told them about the demonic stuff. It was always, you're in control, you can do it. Bonacci went on describing what sounded like a bad acid trip. I was able to do a lot of things, such as, at the time, which I can't do now because I don't have demons under my control, I don't want them, but turning on TVs, turning off lights, blowing things up like light bulbs or something. We could make tires go flat on people's cars, and we could make them so they couldn't start. This is stuff that I did after I was away from them. So far, it sounds like there's an army of zombies being trained from a very early age in Satanism, magic, and certain skills of psychoscience. That was surprising enough, but it was infuriating to hear that at a very early age, Bonacci was trained to hate black people. They trained me to hate black people, Bonacci said. The Aryan nations did? Baum asked. No, the government program. That's why I didn't like Larry King at all. I mean, it was kind of like, to me, I hated him from the time I met him. Andy Baum said, Paul says a lot of outlandish things, but despite initial doubts, I now believe that everything he told me is either true or he sincerely believes it to be true. I've seen people like former FBI bigwig Ted Gunderson try to lead him into lying and to try to test his tales with uncaptioned photos. Paul never comes out having uttered an intentional falsehood. CBS lambasted him for having said that years earlier he had seen now Omaha Mayor P.J. Morgan engaging in sex with little boys. Or more accurately, he said they were told he was P.J. Morgan. The mayor heatedly denied this in a CBS special about innocent folks wrongly accused of child abuse, Baum said. Had CBS bothered to look more deeply into the case, they'd have noted that Mayor P.J. Morgan used to have a son named P.J. Morgan Jr. I say used to have a son because Morgan Jr., a well-known Omaha pederast, killed himself the day after the kitty sex aspects of the Franklin scandal became public. Right name, right family, wrong guy, or maybe not. Some say the mayor himself has some unusual appetites. Bonacci said his monarch programming started when he was five and continued until he was 22. Most of the people that they trained were probably fairly young, probably four or five, up until the time they were out of high school because as soon as you're out of high school, their plan is for you to go into the military. One is advised to take Bonacci's testimony as that of a non-integrated MPD. Much of Bonacci's state of confusion might be an example of the adverse effects of Christian counseling. The guilt trip laid on survivors by a belief system that places the blame for a mind control victim's behavior on themselves is not helpful. One should not be asked to identify with one's own behavior unless one has made a free choice of that behavior. Apparently, the U.S. legal system would not agree. Such is the legal and judicial ignorance of the capability of mind control. Such is the legal and judicial ignorance of the capability of mind control. Truth or damage the people.